there is more information in the Madhu Netcha than all the ancient languages in the world put together and multiplied by a hundred. So that's Sanskrit, cuneiform, that's all of that. That's how much information is left in the Madhu Netcha. And about 85% has been translated by our former enslavers, the enemy of African culture, a non-spiritual people translating a spiritual work. So you know what the results is. And many of, some of their inventions and stuff comes from their work, but they don't tell you where they're getting this from. A uh, Tesla committed that his concept of creating electricity came from studying ancient Kemet. When Einstein got his Nobel Peace Prize on his desk with the next room. In fact, nobody in the European world could be somebody unless they had studied ancient Kemet. So you need to understand that. If you go down who's who in the ancient Kemetic world, and George G.M. James made it clear there's no such thing as Greek philosophy. That's stolen African philosophy. So we need to understand that. And um, Dr. Sinjetti, Dr. Clark, and them used to talk about, we don't have philosophy, just a love. We have what we call deep thought. Deep thought. You see, the whole universe is consciousness. Consciousness is the energy that propels everything. And that one consciousness is the creator. We call it nature where the, like, the word nature comes from. Nature. That's the one. Do not keep translate nature as God. It does not translate as God, a, get, a gothic word. It does not. When we talk about nature, you see, nature is your heartbeat. Nature is the water. It's the air. Nature is the beat in between the heart. The nature is the tree. It's the insects. We don't consider God that. God's not no insect. God's not the tree. You might say this God propelled it, but it is not that. The nature is that. The nature is you. So sometimes people will interview me and they say, Infodisi, do you believe in God? I say, no. I don't believe in God. I know the nature because I am part of that divine being. Intelligent. There is nothing we can't do. Think of it, think of it, think of it. What we can do as a people is unlimited if you think that way. A poem it's the naked advice of the heart. Malcolm was a poem. Two Sun was a poem. Zinger was a poem. Garvey was a poem. Two Tuck Armin was a poem. And all of you are poems of only you would think. Intelligent. There is nothing you can't do. Think of living and think of living and think of living and think of living. What we can do as a people is unlimited as we think that way. You see, we have discussed that this life is trying to this life and the life is trying to exist. We've been trying to survive in the money world where money is irrelevant. Your infinite flow of cash is your consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As long as your consciousness is vibrating on a high level, you will never be economically deprived. And we are afraid to destroy our oppressor because we have become so much like our oppressor, we are afraid to destroy ourselves. Even Stevie one day and Great Charles can see that all the ancestors were trying to tell us was what? Think. Intelligent. There is nothing you can't do. But the sister, you heard the expression, the writing is on the wall, well, it's still there. And we're going to explore it today. Ancestors left down a formula for us, and they said, any organization, any group, any nation has to have these councils. They have to have a council of elders. Excuse me, no, start out first. No, a council of esteemed ancestors. That's the first council. The, a council of esteemed ancestors. Those ancestors who've laid the foundation, brilliant work in which you are following. You need to put them and make sure they're on everybody reading this. Everybody knows who they are, what they look like, and what they represent. So you have your council of esteemed ancestors. So it is clear on what you are trying to do. Now you have a council of esteemed elders who are following in the footsteps of those esteemed ancestors. Not creating their own thing, a continuation. And then you have a council of experts. 
experts in all of the fields that enhance the life of a human being. That is your language. That is your educational system. That is your defense force. You see, when we talk about Rosewood and all of them, they never had a defense force. To develop something and not be able to have it is like not having it at all. You're waiting for an aggressive people, a thief, to come and steal. You have to be able to protect it. And at the center of your system is a spiritual system. And your spiritual system not only helps you survive, but it helps you flourish. It puts you, you see, we are divine beings. I'm always, whenever I used to sign a book, I say we are divine spiritual beings having a divine human experience. Most of us used to leave the word divine out. You see, we were able to do these miraculous things because the divinity of the one creator exists inside of us. And when you tap in, you do that. You see, so every spiritual service should have meditation, should have some form of meditation, because meditation is when you're listening to the creator. Some of us confuse prayer with better. God, I need a new car. God, I need a man. God, I need a woman. God, I need some money. No, the nature doesn't do that. The nature gives you the information so that you can get those things yourself. So it's important, so don't confuse that. That's not prayer. Okay. Prayer is when you're communing with the divine within you. On how do I raise my personal vibration? so that my light can glow even in the darkness. And that's what other people see in divine people. They see their light and they're attracted by that light. Yeah. And hopefully your light will shine some progress or some uh, divine path that will lead them towards righteousness and a higher level of spiritual consciousness. And so after you have all, then you have the masses of the people. The masses of the people are following the experts and following the divine, what? Elders. And the elders are in the footsteps of the divine ancestors. So I make sure that that philosophy, see we got young people today who are skipping over the elders. The elders don't know what they do. No, we ain't following the garden, you know, ancestors, they dead. No, they're still alive. Their DNA is inside of each one of us. You see, when we pray to the ancestors, we're not praying to some dead spirit, we're not playing to, to the cemetery. Within your DNA, there's a link all the way back to the very first human. <laughs> you see, we don't know how divine you are. We have no clue on just how divine we are. They're still inside of you. And, and these sacred ancestors want to help you. They're there like, excellent, come on, excellent. I know that. But you got, no, I got this. So you, you, you commune with your ignorant self, your ego. And that's most of our problem. Most of us are communing with the ego. As opposed to that divine spiritual ancestor self, there's their way. You see, there's a veil between you, the ego, and the divine spirit. And when you reach higher consciousness, you remove the veil. So that you're not being checked just by the people. So that's important for us, you know. Um, all of this we want to see is written down in the do next one. This is like a uh, committee council of elders. Almost everybody on here you know or have seen. These are great elders that are following in the footsteps of our great esteemed ancestors. I'm not going to spend much time here. We've had a whole lot of dynamic speakers that talked about Africa as the origins of all people. We are the original people on all six of the continents. There's no seven continents. Europe is not a continent. Europe is Western Asia. So you need to understand that. You see, whoever controls the situation defines it. So I know some people are going to be angry with me tonight, but I'm here just to tell the truth. It's not a popularity. Six continents. Okay, and we are the original inhabitants on all six of the continents. So we need to get over there. Right. Right. Harun M. Akhet, an ancient Kelly, who some people call the Sphinx. Sphinx is a Greek word, mythological word of a creature that will kill you if you don't know the real. Has nothing to do with ancient Africa. Nothing to do. Harun M. Akhet. Harun, the lion's body. Master the animal domain. 
rise to your highest spiritual consciousness. So it has the head of the high priest. It had the beard and all of that, just like that, okay? So that was it. So no sphinx, Haru in Akechi. I will be going over this over and, and, and over as we go through. Uh, you'll see the orientation of Africa. No, it's not upside down. Most of us have been upside down, inside out and backwards our whole life. We have to almost rethink and reorganize everything that we have been taught. Can you imagine if the wolf is educating the rabbits? <laughs> Do you know? And then it gave certain rabbits Nobel Peace Prizes. What would that rabbit have to have done? Probably delivered a lot of rabbits to the wolf, and he wants to acknowledge that. So I need you to think about six Africans who got Nobel Peace Prize and there's no peace. <laughs> what did you think about it? Each one of them, if we really examine it, have done a great job of delivering the rabbits to the wolf. The Hopi Valley. Hopi is the ancient name for the Nile. This is a close-up of the Hopi Valley. This is the orientation of Africa, the way our ancestors looked at it. The Nile River, the longest river in the world, flows down north. Not up south, it flows down north from up south. No water runs uphill unless it's got a pump behind it. Okay? So it starts, there are three mountains of the moon, and you see that Dr. Ben talk about the mountain of the moon. The tallest mountain of the moon is Kilimanjaro, over 19,650 feet high. It's in present day Tanzania today. The second mountain of the moon is Mount Onzor in Uganda, over 16,650 feet high. The third mountain of the moon is Mount Choka, with an antenna in its hub, in Ethiopia. So you have Tanzania, Uganda, and Ethiopia. The ancients say we come from the foothills of the mountains of the moon. So it's letting you know we're not coming from one place. And later we find out that they also come from Western Africa. So we see Africans migrating from the Sahara, Africans coming down the Nile, and Africans coming across. And so we clearly understand those three mountains of the moon. Now, what makes this important is that there are six cataracts in the Nile. A cataract is a natural obstruction in the flow of energy. So that's why if there's a film of your eyes, a cataract. It's a natural structure of the flow of energy. So anything that's stopping the water from flowing where boats cannot navigate and you can't go past that, that's called a cataract. There's six cataracts. They're all backwards. If you look at any book right now, you go home, you check me out. It's going to tell you that in Aswan, that's the first cataract. But technically, that's the sixth cataract. The water's flowing this way. But the Europeans came into Africa backwards. So they encountered the last cataract and named it the first. Now, after we straighten them out, you would think, David, if you know better, you're supposed to do better. No. Control. Remember, whoever controls the situation defines it. It's about control. It's not about the truth. So that's what I need you to understand. So in Aswan, that's the sixth cataract. And inside of the Sudan, there are five other cataracts. The white cloud coming out of Uganda, the Blue Nile comes out of Ethiopia and they meet in Khartoum. And from Khartoum, they flow as the Nile River all the way to the Wedgie Word. The Wedgie Word is the ancient name of the Mediterranean. The Wedgie Word means the Great Green. The Wedgie Word. And so this is the way I, this is the way we look at the rest of the world. Europe was below us in the cold, desolate land. Asia was where the sun rose, to the left. And our orientation, you understand, we, we are the, when you look at the Madhu Nature, Su, or Rashi and Su means south, but it's the same word for up. Mahent means north, but it's the same word for down. Ament, like a menta, is west, but it's the same word for right. And Yabit 
means east and it's the same word for left. So in order for your bit to be to your left and a mint to be to your right, you have to be orientated this way, the way you read the compass, the north is down and south is out. So I just want you to take you back to we're all of our directions we get from ancient chemistry. And then somebody else upside down, inside out, and turn everything around. Even the Asians used to use their map the same way. Only really after around 1492 did the world get turned around. This is a, a picture of ancient Hopi, Hopi of the north and Hopi of the south. Now, what's important here, this says Iwinet. And this is a column, wooden columns. These early cities, all of them had Iwin in them. Those cities were actually built by the Twa. The Anu, the short people, they are the builders of the first temples in ancient Kemet. And the first Haru is Haru Bes. So I need you to understand, there was no Kemet that did not have a Twa in it. They said they were the only people who knew the dance of the Met. They sent expeditions to the south to make sure they brought back. They said, don't touch a hair on their head. Make sure they have everything they need. So I just need to be able to just point that out. This interconnection of Africa. And if you see how we, of the south here, you see this duck, and you see the throne. And so I'm just trying to show you in the clips. to a mighty advanced African civilization in the Hopi interior of Nile Valley. They were clearly the most advanced material culture of antiquity, thousands of years ahead of others, Greece and Rome, were 3,000 years behind ancient African people. What was the process used to blot out the achievements of African population from the annals of history? But more importantly, how and under what circumstances did Africans among the very first people to invent writing, architecture, national building, urban planning, construction, engineering, lose their arts and sciences almost completely. All of the books written about Africans by the conquerors reflect only the conquerors' viewpoint or supporting views. So we are concerned with African civilization alone before the departures of this civilized culture of Africans then, what did Africans achieve? either before the Europeans or the Western Asians, in short, an indigenous, independent African hour school. Number four, even today, books, curricula, teaching materials, and educational institutions are all founded on white, capitalist, male, greco roman Christian, Aryan, rule modern models of human history. There have been minor reforms, but overall, white supremacy models systematically dominates every intellectual and cognitive rule of educational procedure from metaphysics to physics, idealism to materialism, religion to science, African people are misused and misrepresented in every way. So people, even when we have an African studies department, that's a band-aid where you need a major operation. You need to defund, you see, in 1865, General Howard had mulatto children after the war, and he didn't want to put them with educated with his white children. Ah, okay. Let's take it off. I'll read it. Thank you. Okay, General Howard wanted to educate his black mulatto children, so he is the one that discovered and created the edu public education in America. And the idea was to enslave them. Now, he also felt that he belonged to an elite class. He didn't want whites getting this education either. And so he put everybody in this public educational system to dumb them down to make them servants. And so people, one of our major problems 
is that we are still using this formula that was set up by General Howard, by what Howard University is heading back to this period. So you just, I'm just taking the link there. No disrespect to my Howard graduates, okay? I went to go off from State University. All right. All right, so this is up. So now we are still using this paradigm that General Howard set up to dump everybody down to make them servants. So the first thing we have to do is ask African people, we ask, well, what is our solution? We need to scrap that whole thing. Ancient Kenneth left a curriculum down on how we can educate, how we do math, how we do science, how we do metaphysics, how we do, do metaphysics, how we connect with nature. You see, everybody, I hope you understand this is a five-point formula. Number one, we have to have mastery of the mineral domain. You see, the planet is a mineral. The sun is a mineral. The stars are minerals. Minerals are throughout the whole galaxy, the Milky Way. Your blood is made with crystal. You are part of this mineral domain. And we are ignorant of minerals. People come by my table, and you see, why you got all these rocks on the table? Have no clue. <laughs> the second domain is the plant domain. That's understanding herbology, understanding medicinal plants, edible plants, plants that will help us survive. Listen, an ancient chemist, we didn't have a word called a weed. A weed is a plant that you don't understand its origin or what it does. So you just throw it in the weed category. If a weed can bust through concrete, through black paper, bust through the wall and still come out, you need to be juicing that. <laughs> so after you understand the, the plant domain, then you go to the animal domain. The animal domain, I know, respect my suppose, was not here to be your slave, your pet, or to be your queen. Uh -oh. When you take the animals out of their ecosystem, out of their domain, you offset the whole ecosystem of the planet. You understand that? The whole ecosystem of the planet. And so you need to be able to liberate animals. You need to be able to help them survive in their own, and flourish in their own domain. And then we have the human domain. The human domain, we are natural-like because we can create outside of our survival. We are the only creatures that can do that. As dynamic as the fountain is, he can only create with inside of his survival mode. As dynamic as some of the creatures are, as the grizzly bear, he can only create within his domain. Humans are the only one. We can do some crazy stuff. We can act like anything and still survive. But that's only with the invention of civilization, so-called open civilization. In ancient time, if you were not connected to the whole human domain, you cease to exist. So if you did some stupid stuff, no, we left you there for the line. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we protect the stupid people. Okay. And so now, stupid people have kids, and then we got a whole generation of stupid people. Stupid people marry some smart people. Everybody got a little stupid in there. That's what we had. But in ancient times, there was a clear line between people who knew what they were supposed to do and people who did not. And for millions of years, if you didn't know, you were out of here quickly. So I need to know, I'll let you know, civilization has a double edged sword. But well, number one, it cultivates the best that you have, but number two, it survives and takes care of the needy, the knuckleheads, and the crazies. And allows them to create outside of their domain that's going to help us flourish. So we do it. We have something called Ma'at. I have down here the 42 oracles of Ma'at. Before there was a Moses, there was Ma'at. Right. And Ma'at is depicted by a beautiful African woman with an ostrich feather. <laughs> Over here I have a sculpture, this is what how we depicted Ma'at. Now, the double edge here is that it's a feminine, universal feminine energy, but the feather is of the male ostrich. So we use the male ostrich feather inside of the universal feminine domain. So it's still balanced. 
Okay, so there's this harmonious balance within the universe. Universal magic versus universal faith. Okay. Truth, justice, righteous, harmonious balance, reciprocity. All of that is part of my eye. You see, and as we develop after slavery, these new um, communities, we need no reciprocity, no defense force. My eye don't need to turn the other cheek. My eye said, oh, uh oh, uh oh, 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 do that again. Well, there's consequences. The whole universe acts with consequences. There's, you know, I need you just to be clear about that. How do we honor and praise our great ancestors? So, uh, some people have heard me talk about this before. There's four specific ways that we honor our ancestors. Number one, we speak their name. That's why when you pour libation, you speak the names of the ancestors. You speak the name the way they were supposed to be spoken. The way they spoke. So you don't go King Tut. His name was Tut Anna, Mary and Maha. So you say his name the way he said it. Dr. Yosef Ben Yahweh. You say their name, Dr. John Henry Clark. You say their names the way they said it. Number two, you compete and use their competing works. And that's what we're doing now. When we look at the, the engineering, the architecture, the structure of our mind, being able to take care of your own, being sovereign. That's what our ancestors gave us. We're supposed to be using that. Number three, to complete their incomplete works. And that's what this lecture series is about. Some of us have gone astray, some of us never knew. So we gotta complete this work. And that is to educate everybody, child, man, woman, everybody. I don't care if you're 92, you can still learn this legacy and pass it on to the grandchildren. If you don't have no kids, snatch some kids from next door and teach them. Okay. <laughs> Number four, you leave edifice and images behind so that we know what our ancestors used to look like. Don't understand that, because you know they will co opt your stuff. JC went from an afro to blue eyes and blonde hair. Clear images behind. And the ones that were there got erased, so we need to make sure your children know what your great grandfather looked like. They know what your great great grandmother looked like. They know what our heroes and sheroes look like. You have to leave images and edifice, statues, carvings behind. Now the Europeans have taken our form. Every park you go to, you see some European on a horse or something. Right? Every place you go, there's so many places named Washington that is silly. Okay? And he was a slaver. And even when he died, he made the free the slaves. But Europeans look up to this image. So they took our formula and they're using it. Now somebody actually, I was doing the interview with somebody says, I'm from DC. Uh, we got brothers and sisters now with tattoos, arcs, wings all over them. But it's not empowering them. He says, but the Illuminati's in them, they're using our stuff and they're empowered. What's going on? I said, well, this is the time for me to teach systematic thought versus symbolic thought. Symptomatic for me, intrinsically, I know what it is because I am it, I feel it, it is part of my memory. No one needs to tell me that's the truth. I've witnessed it my whole life, I know the type of tree, I've tasted it, I know what it's fruit, I know it's leaves, I know what an oak tree is. Don't talk to me the oak tree is the kawaii. No, it's an oak tree. Symbolic thought is how the whole world is being educated by me. The whole world, all religion is based upon symbolic thought. I show you a symbol, and then I tell you what it means, but you intrinsically don't know. So if I give you some bad information, you're just gonna pass that on and on and on and on, because symptomatically, you don't even really know. You only know symbolically. You see, an ancient chemist, if the key is represented by a falcon, Everybody in the society, intrinsically, symptomatically, knew a falcon. They knew that it had no rivalry in the sky. It can hover in the sky a mile and spot a mouse under the leaf. It has the sharpest eyesight of any creature that you can't hide. It can move, the pelican falcon can travel 285 miles per hour. Woo. Any other one been in a car going 100? 285, if it swoops down on its prey, some fucking falcons can travel 30 meters under the water to get his fish. And when he comes up out of the water with the fish in his timeline, that means he calculated the speed of the fish 
the speed of the bend of light and then calculated his descent. Whoa, all that's done symptomatically in his head, right? And when he comes out of the water, brothers and sisters, I know you think the man was dynamite, but he's drowned. Symbolic. He's drowned. Some of y'all look at that anymore. So when the king put the double crown and said, I'm a mighty falcon, you was like, yeah. Because symptomatically you knew what this meant. Now other people just say, yeah, yeah, I'm a falcon, and have no clue. That's symbolic thought. Now, Egyptology teaches ancient Egypt through symbolic thought. So that's why you can read all these books on ancient Egypt and still be clueless of the spirit of the people. Because you're only learning symbolic thought, not symptomatic thought. And so every one of these lectures you read, all these principles are based upon a symptomatic thought. You having such a relationship with nature that you internalize it. You see, this gets deeper than you think it is. Every creature, when there's a storm, seeks shelter. Except for the falcon, the hawk, and the eagle. It flies over the storm. And so our ancestors wanted to tell you, when we're up against opposition, we don't hide. We fly over it and then swoop down on it. Some of us have missed it because we've been only learning symbolically, so that never came across your head. People used to argue that cuneiform was older than ancient Egypt. Now they're showing that the Madhu Netcher is at least four or five hundred years, maybe a thousand years older than cuneiform. But my argument is we created cuneiform too. So it's still one group of black people and another. It's like this brother's my cousin, and he goes over here and starts a new. But we still both African people. The ancient Sumer, set up by the blackheads, were Africans from ancient Kush, just like ancient Kemet is the child of Kush. So I just want to put that to rest. Yes, we do next is over, but African people created cuneiform, and then later, as the Asians came in, they took it over. But the difference is, as the Madhu Netchim is symbolic of nature, cuneiform is abstract. Abstract. If you don't know the culture, you will have no clue of what's going on. Somebody from that culture has to learn, as opposed to you just knowing nature. For example, let me just give you an example. The word sat and sa is a duck. It represents some doing. Symptomatically, the ancient Africans studied the pintail duck. When the pintail duck had these little ducklings, the little ducklings were 100% obedient. No matter, I don't care if the big duck fell in the hole, each one of the little ones fall in the hole. Wherever the duck goes, the little ones follow. They don't deviate. That is total obedience, right? And so, when we wrote our language and we wanted to talk about our son, we put a little duck down here, right? Because we want him to be taught and sucked for total obedience to the way until you become an adult and now you lead the way. So if you wonder why your kids went astray, <laughs> I don't think I need to feel the picture. Okay, all right. Total obedience of following their parents. So again, Symptomatically, we know why we use this pintail duck. Not just about you just memorize it. Oh, that's sock. That's sock. And you just memorize this stuff now. You have no concept. That's not how you learn in the dimension. You see, the reason why I said this is our classical language is the only language that can change our paradigm. If you learn, I know Swahili, I know Kikuyu, I know these languages. If we speak those languages, we used to be crazy speaking Swahili. We used to be crazy speaking Yoruba. We used to be crazy. <laughs> it doesn't change your paradigm of nature. When you're learning the Madhu Netcher and you're learning symptomatic thought, it changes your connection with nature. You look at water differently. It's against the law to defile water. How many people here pray over their water before they drink? About three of us. You pray over your food, how can you have prayed over your water? The most essential things that you need. Water has more memory than any compound molecule on the planet Earth. It holds memory. So when you pray into your water, your water absorbs that energy, and now it helps vitalize the body. 
There's people who pray over polluted water, held hands, and then when they measured the water again, it was less polluted. Wow. That's the power that we have. And when you speak to your water, your body is about 70 to 75 percent water. The planet is 75 to 75 percent water. Again, water holds more memory than any compound molecule. So when you speak to yourself, be careful on how you speak to yourself. Don't ever talk nasty about yourself. Oh, this is a bad hair day. Oh, you stumble and go, oh, I'm so clumsy. And then in the back of your mind, it says, wait till you get to the steps. <laughs> Only speak positive. You stumble, you go, oh, I got to get myself together. My moves are sweet, and that won't happen again. You talk positive about yourself. My naps is beautiful. I don't care what nobody else thinks. You know, you have to be able to speak. We call it positive self-talk. Positive self-talk. Extremely important. In ancient China, everyone knew this. It's written on the walls. We only show perfection. You'll see future people plowing, right? The brother's plowing. He got a white pleated suit on with no dirt on. His wife is sowing seeds. She got a long safari outfit. No dirt. Now you know they got to get dirty they're out there, but the ancient connect school wanted to show excellence because they wanted to leave an image of excellence behind. Nobody had their pants down. Nobody. Okay. The idea was to have excellence. And so young people, when they looked at the walls, only saw examples of excellence to emulate, to imitate. We have to begin to do that again. The Badu Lecture can be written right to left, left to right, top down. So they can be taught the, the Asians, the Chinese, and stuff like that, so they can write very simple. They ark, we ra jet. Give life, like ra for eternity. Each of the rulers talked about this because this is their job to give life just like the sun gives life. Let me just talk about this word here. This is jet, it means eternity. This is why the Egyptologists don't really want you to learn these languages. This is the determinative. This is ta, it means land. That's a loaf of bread, it represents nourishment. This is a cobra, it represents your kundalini, your energy as it travels up your body. As long as there is land, there will be nourishment and you will have energy. That's the determinative. <laughs> So now you're just not learning symbolically, oh, that word means eternity, J. No, you understand why it means eternity. There's another word, Nehef. I don't have it up here, but Nehef has twisted flat with Jerah in it. And it says, as long as the stars exist, any star, there will be energy. As long as there is energy, there will be life. So that's forever and forever. So I'm just trying to show you symptomatically why the Madhu Lecture is so important. It's not just learning and memorizing some symbols. We can't take our enemies' word for what our name said. Like here. They know the rules just like now. We have some Africans, our sister the Kaya Ma, my teacher, uh, Dr. Mario B. We have some people whose book, our grammar is absolutely excellent. We know the grammar like the ancient Kemet to knew the grammar. So I know some people saying, no, you can't, we can't we speak it. Yes, some of the sound very, is very ancient because as we left the Nile Valley, sounds change as you move into different cultures, and so we're still trying to capture some of the exact sound. But we know, basically, what a lot of this says, we can read it verbatim. I can read it to do next, I can read the Amsterdam Moon. Now, look at here. This says, Neb Ma'at Ra. Now, they know it says that. Look, they put Neb Ma'at Ra. Over here, it says, Ochef Imam. But they put Imam Ochef, so they switch the rules on it. If it has the name of the high nature, who was one of them, the super the nature rule, it's written first but spoken last. Over here, they, Amen is in front, but here they go, Tet Am Amen. So they, they, they follow the rule here, Tet Am Amen. Here they didn't follow the rule. So we cannot trust them to do our stuff. 
here, it has two names, it only gave you one. Hatshepsu. But this says, Hatshepsu Haman. Hatshepsu believed she was born from back in the conception that her father was Amin. And so all of her temples was dedicated to Amin, her father. And now when we say her name, we leave Amin out. What did we say the first way of honoring our ancestors was? Speak their names the way they spoke. If she went through all the trouble to etch in stone how her name should be. In fact, the tallest tablet that still exists right now in Egypt was created by her. And it had to be etched in the stone. And so we say, Hatsetsu Amon, not Hatsetsu. Again, they gave out the names there, Ramses the second. It doesn't say none of that here. It says, here it says, there's still my hot rod, Satekhet rod. Means the powerful one who is powerful, the powerful strength of my eye, of the legacy of Ra, and he was chosen by Ra. Over here it says, Mehdi Amon, Mesu Ra. So beloved of Amon, born of the energy of Ra. And we're saying Ramses II. He wouldn't even know who you're talking about today. Uh, we're going to introduce Ramses II. And he'd be like, we're around. And when they going to introduce me? You know, fine. So we need to speak their name. You better learn them to do metric because obviously you can't take Europeans' words on what our ancestors said their names were. Come on. Now some of y'all go to Egypt and, and now you got the Arabs there and they make something like this and they call it a kotush. So you come back, oh, I got my name in the cartouche. Cartouche is French. Whoa. It means a cartridge bullet. Whoa. Because when Napoleon came there in 1799 and they saw all these circles, he says, oh, I look like a cartridge. So now you run around talking about it's a bullet. Get off your head, people. Remember, we are upside down, inside out, and backwards. Everything you think you know needs to be relearned. Relearned. I will move through this kind of quickly. There's 14 steps. I line it out in my book, Spiritual Warriors or Healers, on how to have a great mastery of the Madhu Nation. Number one, you learn the alphabet, monosyllable. Number two, Sanu. You learn symbolic signs, that's bilingual and trilingual. Three, compliments. Four, determinatives. Five, numerical principles, numbers, and adjectives. Six, grammar rules. And this is where we lose most of our people. They want to follow the symbols and just do symbolic. When it comes time to do some grammar, we lost it. Grammar rules, verbs, sentence structure. Those who speak, people who speak ebonics, is actually speaking the way we spoke in the Nile Valley. Except that they just substituted English words. You see, some of our ancient ancestors didn't go to no school to speak English. They just heard the words that their slave masters spoke, and they used those words the way they would think. So they'd be saying, like, I'll be out of here. Go, no, you don't say that. He said, no, I'm gone. <laughs> you know, he was speaking like the African using English words. And then they beat that out of you now. So now you only are upside down, inside out, and backwards. English is the most backward, twisted language in the world. Do you all hear what I say? English, like, for example, somebody say, I'm trying to do that. Try only exists in the English language. Nobody else has it. Because you're either doing it or you're not doing it. If you try it, I don't even know what that is. Okay? Number seven, nouns, everyday working vocabulary. Eight, study nature, the earth, in its life forms, and how it relates to human beings. Most of us have not done that. You haven't done it in school because your teachers haven't done it. So people who are destroying the planet are teaching you how to destroy the planet. And we have the ability to outdo everybody so we can destroy the planet better than they can. Nine, the study of African culture, ethnic groups of the Hopi Valley, uh, period, Kush, all the way to South Africa and across the Great Sahara. You got to be an Africologist. That's how I started out. Not just as a chemistologist. I started out as an Africologist. I wanted to study all the indigenous cultures. I went and stayed for a month with the Chua people. They don't even know what it is to spend a child. That's unheard of. The child is the most precious gift they have. 
So in the morning they work on board. The click, I couldn't get the click anymore. But it means on the children well. That's the first thing you ask them. Because children are the most important thing. And they look at themselves as an extension of the creator. Okay, so we gotta understand different cultures. Number 10, study the indigenous African spiritual systems. Dr. John Henry Clark said they laughed at our name and we changed it. They laughed at our clothes and we changed it. They laughed at our spiritual system and our nature and we changed them. They laughed at our culture and we changed them. They laughed at the way that we look at the world and we changed it. Mm -hmm. So we know how we got jacked up. We have to go back and redo that. We got to take their clothes off of our back. We got to leave their language alone. We understand we, when we're communicating here, but we're learning. Just imagine if everybody here was learning the dimension. And we all were, I'm in Ra, I'm a suit, they can't, I'm in Ra, I'm in Ra. They knew I'm Poo Johnson. They would be upset. Their police would be in here. Okay? <laughs> Study in depth chemical festivals. Celebrations and holidays. It shows you how we had several calendars. We had at least three calendars going. We had a, uh, a calendar dealing with the sun year, calendar dealing with the lunar year, and we had a calendar dealing with the equinox. Okay, so we had three calendars going on simultaneously. We understood that time is an illusion. That you are only understanding your relationship to each other within this illusion. You know that that be fine. <laughs> Real quick, upside down, inside out, and backwards. Everything you think you know has to be relearned. Or you're looking at the world through your culture eye. Uh, Amos Wilson, I used to go to his office once a week, right? I used to teach uh, in Harlem. And I would spend an hour sitting down with Amos Wilson. He was so clear, so sharp on the position that we were in. I just sit in his feet, and his ancestors are probably watching over us right now. But, we have to rethink everything we do. No Egypt, ancient Kemet. We have three words for Kemet. Tameri, the beloved land. Simatawi, the united two lands. And Kemet, the black community. You see, when Egyptologists knew we were starting to learn this, they said, okay, y'all know that Kemet means black. The cat's out of the bed, okay. But it means black land. Black land. Not black people, black land. So I'm looking at the determinative in this guy. A child, a man, and a woman. That's black people. So they say it's called the black land because the Nile overflows and leaves a black silk over everything. So I said, did the Nile overflow on the people too? <laughs> you know, Kim. If you look it up in the dictionary, they'll say Kim is a crocodile's back. No, Kim is burning charcoal. Black. So that's why you could not depend on Egyptologists to learn your legacy. No word for Pharaoh. Pharaoh comes from the word per ah, the great house. When President Barack Obama comes to town, you don't say the White House is coming down. You say President Barack Obama is coming down, the president. In ancient Kemet, he was called the Masut Bit. That's ruler of upper and lower Kemet. Or the son of Ra, the son of Ra. It's coming to town. Do you understand that? Or he would have a Haru man. Every king had a Haru man. Because they understood symptomatically what Haru meant. All the rules in ancient Kemet were Shinsu Haru. Every king, you'll see some list, and it'll start out Shinsu Haru. That means followers of Haru. And the ancient Haru were the blacksmiths coming with iron, smelting iron. This is that other word I talked about with these eternities. This is like your DNA. That's wave of energy and that's rock. So there'll be, your DNA will exist as long as there's energy, as long as there is a sun, a star. So you have two forms of forever and ever. No cartoonists are already involved in that. That word is a shin. No hieroglyphics. That word should be Madhu Nature. Madhu Nature. It's divine words of an elder. So they use a walking stick that an elder would use. So it's not just any old words, 
is divine words of the elder in relationship to the creator, nature. No sphinx, I already went over that, the root in the ketchup. That's not a sphinx, that's the root in the ketchup. Imagine if your son is dead, I'm going to be a sphinx. You got a son, I don't know. But if he said, I want to be Haru in Maket so I can protect you and mom from sunrise to sunset, you'd be like, okay, son, I, I'm down with that. Yeah. Right? So you see how powerful language is. You can't use somebody else's culture to define yourself. No now, happy. No mummy. That comes from the word mamiya, which is Arabic, which means cool, a cool. You see what happens when you're using somebody else's language? Well, our word was sahu, the sahu, and that means preparing the body for eternity. No pyramid, a mirror, and the particular type of mirror is a mirror coup that emanates fire, fire energy, fire atoms, negative atoms that uh, bring humans, human beings into a harmonious state. So if you look up the word pyramid power, you see that every pyramid, no matter what it's made of, creates negative ions, fire atoms all around it that can purify water. That's why every pyramid is pure water. None of the pyramids ever found ancient chemicals was tools. And that's what they tell you it was, a tool. Then they got a picture of somebody dragging a stone up the mountain that weighed 20 tons. You never saw that picture in any tomb in ancient chemicals. That's all Egyptology messing with your mind. We must learn to read the Hebrew letter ourselves. In ancient Kemet Kash, the Kemet believed in one creator, the spiritual consciousness in all things. The one creator, divine principle, and laws were called Nechabru. And the worship of the natural room was part of the everyday life. As with all civilizations, the spiritual system was linked to mythology and spiritual relationship. But remember, our mythology was connected to symptomatic form, not symbolic form. Like when they got Jesus walking on water. There's a couple of preachers that drown because they wanted to show you they were like Jesus, trying to walk on water and not their ancestors, okay? Because they took something symptomatically it means symbolically, without understanding symptomatically what it meant, and trying to turn it to reality. And God doing the same thing. Symbolic thought, understand. The commended spiritual practice will lead to celestial movements, constellations, the sun Ra, the moon Ea, and the planets which turn and guided their mythology in every way of life. The ancient convention were the first people to can find out when you were born, and they knew what the seven heavenly bodies gave you as a gift that would contribute to your personality. We are not separate from the whole. Nature, nature is the whole. You are one with nature, the creator of the cosmos. Jehuti, the voice of nature, the natural root. You are one with the galaxy, my eye, harmonious balance of water. You are one with the solar system, you chestnut, boundless space and moisture. You are one with Ra, our sun. You are one with Ea, our moon. You are one with Yet and Nut, our planet and its livable atmosphere. You don't have a life. Huh? You are life. You have a body. You don't have a soul. You are a soul and you have a body. Do y'all understand it? Spirituality is not religion. Being spiritual just means you are in touch with your divine self. Spirituality is a personal relationship with the divine. Religion is crowd control. Ooh. In ancient Kemet, there were no churches. In most of Africa, there were no churches. Your home was your divine abode. And so listen, you have five temples. I need you to tap into you. you have five temples. This is what they tell us in the ancient Kemet. Your first temple is your divine consciousness, which is part of the nature. Your second temple is your heart, which permeates the energy that complicates through this body. 
The idea is to have your heart consciousness synchronized with your spiritual consciousness. Then you are moving towards the fifth, fourth, and fifth dimension. Then your body is your third dimension. So you treat your body like a sacred temple. You take care of it. You treat it correctly. Then the next temple is your home. Your home is your temple. So you have your altar, your shrine, your ancestors, your art. It, your culture. If I walk into your house and I don't know who lived there, that's a problem. As soon as I walk in the door, I go, oh, African lived here. Oh, man, this is specific African. He's a conscious African. I, think that I should know that as soon as I walk into your living room. If I'm, in, if I'm searching and I'm still, I don't know who's in here. I don't know who lives here. That's the problem. That's upside down, inside out, and backwards. Well, you got to put just some flowers on the wall. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with flowers, but put it in an African base. <laughs> I have my eye. I rose from the justice of the universe, of Kush, and spread my wings across the land of Africa. And when I clap them, civilization was established. I am the balance and harmony of the universe. I am truth itself. I am Kushite, kinetic spiritual science, from the metaphysics perfection of order, the creator created creations. I am the mathematical balance of the order of both material and immaterial universe. I am the law of nature. I am the law of physics. I am the law of harmony. I am the law of the supreme being. I am the mother and daughter of Amin Ra. I am his substance. I am Baha'i. That exists inside of you. So you have to know who you are. That your spiritual system is based upon that. Baha'i. Breathe in gratitude, breathe out love. Reflect kindness to all. You see, even your enemy, you have to give your enemy respect in order to be able to deal with your problem. If you're upset and angry, you get it for granted and you're going to miss some final details. Each fighter, before they have a really good fight, they study their enemy. They know his ins and outs, his strong punch, his kick, his wheel. They know all about it. They can watch the 100 tape. It's just like if they don't play football. The week before, we watch the tape to that team. You play basketball, you watch the guy, you watch your opponent, so you know his move before it happens. Brothers and sisters, Africans in America know the European better than any Africans on the planet. Our Africans on the continent still don't know the Europeans. They still believe Europeans. They still believe Asians. They still believe the Chinese. No matter how much they show us that they speak with a fork tongue and they don't like us, they still believe it. Africa is giving away land in Africa to, yes, to the Asians and Europeans. Yes, Africa is for sale. Yes, the only people that can come together, the Africans in the diaspora, and specifically Africans from America who have the most money, the most material gifts, the most education. We need, but we're also the most backwards. We, we gotta get off our heads, begin to re-educate ourselves, and we are the ones that can go back to Africa and make it a United States of Africa. How did the revenge, how did the Africans see themselves? So we don't want to talk about Europeans. You notice every movie they got, they make themselves the ancient Egyptians. I do spiritual counseling. Every white woman that I've ever done counseling for said, I was an ancient Egyptian goddess in another world. And I want to say, no, you weren't. You were in a cave in another world. <laughs> this is the royal court of Minchu Hotel. Look, that's the royal court of Minchu Hotel, the founder of the second golden age. Dancing women, these are braids and locks. That's Tupac Ahmed with his long head, and he wasn't an alien. This is, uh, in pool, and the suit. Turn on arm and receive his arm. This is a this is the old period. These are all old period the first, so we're showing you all the little period. This is how we looked at ourselves. This is how we depicted ourselves again. You can see the graves. This is that the, uh, the high priestess, the temple of Kanu. Um, this is the daughter of Khufu, the builder of the great pyramid. But look how we look at ourselves. Look at this brother, this is the suit from the 12th dynasty, the Afro. Mm. Mm. This is that color, that DNA we were talking about. As long as there's energy, Europeans don't know what the black hole. The black hole is the nation. 
Returning, everything comes from practice and returns to practice. Ain't no mystery. The Kabeki Ubu knew about this. Ain't no, they got a parallel universe in Europe, the sci fi. They just made up some stuff. And now you follow and you follow it. On the other side of that black hole, the big black face, the creator looking at it. That's the same. The natural room is all nature. All of our images of our natural room, our principles and deities, we're African. We're African. Anytime your divinity doesn't look like you, then you're in trouble. I need to say that again. Any divine spiritual concepts you're following does not look like you, you're in trouble. Uh, I'm taking people to Boston on Saturday, and we're going to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and we're going to see something like this instant bowl of burning here. This instant burning is from a place called Nubia Castillo, which is in present day Sudan. And this was this incense burner was about four or five hundred years older than the first dynasty of ancient Kemet. And everything that we see in ancient Kemet was already set up in ancient Kush. Here's the room wearing the white crown. Here's her room on top of the Sebet, the White House. And that's why when the French burnt down the President's Palace in 1800, they had enslaved Africans rebuild the new one. They call it the White House because it would be like ancient Kemet. Here we see uh, the Karun Nek Akhetra. Here we see the facade, the palace. You don't have a facade of something that doesn't exist. And so even before Imhotep, we were building in stone and, and great monuments. This is again four or five hundred years older than Rome. What I want to show you here is the difference between culture and civilization. Civilization number one has written documents to record what they are doing, where they come from, and who they are, and what they're about. A civilization has that. Number two, a sophisticated plan architectural structures. So engineers, people who understand astronomy, astrology, things of that nature. Plan cities, not just a bunch of huts and villages around in a circle. Plan, organized city. A functional calendar, an organization of time and space so that you can record things, you can repeat things over and over again. And an organized economy with planned agriculture and animal domestication. Um, and number six there would be a military to be able to protect whatever you develop. Those are the signs of civilization. We confuse somebody's culture with civilization. Everybody got culture. Uh, gorillas got culture. Cavemen got culture. A bunch of deer got culture. Every human thing on the planet, fish got culture. Every living entity has a culture, but civilization is something totally different. Civilization is the creation of African people. Whenever you're teaching, you need a timeline. If you're teaching little ones, they need a timeline. You need to see when things were happening. So if we talk about the, the step pyramids, the Mirku of the Zosa, we can look and say, okay, that was like 3600 BCE. Was there a Greece yet, the first European nation? No. The Japanese came down to the seven islands of Japan yet. There were no Chinese yet. In fact, can you name another nation at 36,000, 3600 BCE? No. So it lets you know what's going on. When we look at this black man, Minshu Hotel, uh, around 2000 BCE, we know there was an ancient Persia at this time, the Sumer, there was other, some other great civilizations that was happening who had a similar culture. We can look. In the Americas, the Omic has had to come in there. So we can begin to look around the planet and see what other things are happening. You need to have a timeline when you're teaching your children. So that they have, and you have to understand that the timeline is not linear, it's circular cyclical. It's cyclical. You need to understand. African Kemetic Greeks, wearing the white, 
Now we wear black to see who's supposed to be imitating the imitators. The Greeks saw Enki who was black and all his hopes had black on because they were preparing the body. But the priests were white. So they didn't go that far. They just got to Enki. See, he's black, so we wear black to see because he's preparing the body. So now everybody running around wearing black. We imitating them. But we should be wearing white to see who's symbolic of the ancestors. I show this because if you go to any museum in the world, for example, when I take people to the Metropolitan, it's the largest museum in America. As soon as you come into the right, they got a map, and it says ancient Kenya, pre-dynastic, pre-dynastic. And every name is in Greek and Arabic. There was no Greek and no Arabic. So what I did here was give you the correct name. There was no Giza, no Cairo, it was Ibrahim, no Giza, it was Akhet and Khufu. In fact, Khufu's, the builder of the Great Pyramid, his name is Kanun Khufu, which means the protector of Khufu, the mole, the one who built all humans on the pirate's uh, No Memphis, in their head, that's the white wall, Het Ka Ptah, the house of the spirit of Ptah, Sakara. Men never. Abigotes, Abigail, Dendrons, the Wayne, Karnapples, the Foot, the Surf, Luxor, Wasset, the Foot, Rasu, Valley of the Kings, can affect her in never. Yes. Del Elbani, Esma, Tassano, Edfu, Baget, Kumbo, Nivet, Aswan, Abu, Fila, Her in Aset, Abu Simba, the Jew in Pot. We need to know the names of our people, so it needs to be clear. And again, we extra on the wall so that we can be real clear. I know Clemson's getting ready to flash how much time I got, so I'm going to speed up. The next room, the principles and laws, so I need to make sure that I get this. There were no gods and goddesses in ancient Egypt. I know they got all these books, the gods, the gods. That's because they use somebody else's paradigm to superimpose over your culture. We had the lecture room. Those are principles and laws. My sister, gravity. Is gravity care whether you believe it or not? Is gravity care whether you're black or white, male or female? It affects all of us proportionally. That's the way the lecture room are. They are principles and laws, and they don't care that you don't care. <laughs> They're still doing their job. My mind is my mind, whether you're getting it or not. Jehuti. Jehuti is particular thought, speech, and writing. It's not a God. Jehuti exists in everybody's mind when you're thinking on a high level. If you're talking about going to Smith's now after this being cold, that's not Jehuti. Jehuti is articulation of higher culture, higher thought, and it exists in everybody. Some of us is lying doing it, but it's great. When they talk about Jehuti, it says, it's the tongue of the top. It's the voice of Amun. It's the mind of Brahma. So it exists inside of you. Second man, the daughter of Ra, the fierceness of the lioness. It shows you the double nature of women. Also, it shows you that the Nasu, his greatest protector was his daughter. Sometimes it wasn't his son, and somebody won his title. So he had to look out for his son sometimes, okay? But the daughter is gonna take care of that. So Sekhmet is the daughter of Ra. He sent Sekhmet down to get rid of all the trifle people. And Sekhmet found out that everybody was trifle, so I'm killing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so the next room was like, Ra, you had to do something about your daughter, she's killing everybody. She just shrinking blood. The next room said, no, I ain't messing with that shit. You go get your hootie. So Jehuti, the articulate thought, outsmarted her. He obsessed the situation to see that she got infatuated with blood. He changed the Nile River into red and told her, you don't have to kill the body, there's all the blood. Seth man jumped in the Nile, but it was really red wine. She had trouble. <laughs> and then he pulled the shore and worked his magic on it and turned her into a beautiful black cat. She became Barset, adorned beauty and nature. <laughs> so man, Brothers, this is for you. You got a choice. You can have a beautiful black cat that's adoring you, beauty, or you can have a that sucking your blood. <laughs> uh, 
So you see why symptomatic is so important? <laughs> symptomatic thought is so important. You need to know symptomatically what it is, what you're dealing with. Now the natural room are broken into celestial natural room, that's the heavenly natural room. It created the heavenly ball. You have trinestral natural room, that's the natural room that's dealing here on earth. And then you have the duality. The natural room is dealing with transformation. Okay? And so here you see some of the natural room uh, in the duality. You see Asar, who is the father of the duality. You see him on his throne. You see him? He's on his square. So this is where uh, you see them. This is the judgment scene that happens in the duality. And this is where you see, this is the deceased person's soul coming before the, the, cow, I mean the uh, scales of my heart. This is how I'm at. He is a devourer of evil souls. So let me say this. I know in some religions you can be bad at 80, 80 years, repent on your fine bed and go to heaven. That's not my option. If you've been bad at 80, 80 years, we know where we go. <laughs> you can't recycle again. I don't, I don't care if you repent. I don't care if you take the blood of Jesus or whatever. You are coming back here. Okay. <laughs> The ancient prophetic rule were clear about reciprocity. They understood that when you do good works, your reward is good. So the reward for my eye is to receive my eye. Now, when you come before the scale, you have the judges up here. And they ask you questions like, have you stolen before? And you say, I have not stolen. Now, Jerusalem didn't record it your whole life. So Jerusalem, no, you can't buy it, Jerusalem. Jerusalem said, in the fifth grade, brother, you stole your grandmother's cookies. <laughs> And you've been all right, all right. But listen, when my grandmother was old and she had no teeth, I chewed her food. When she could not walk, I carried her on my back. And so Jerusha said, that's your surprise. I'm really satisfied. So you understand? Here, and some sound and some pictures, there's another scene here. A room takes you to his father, who art in heaven. How be thy name, thy kingdom come. That will be as a hurry president in heaven. That comes from here. He kneels before his father. Harun takes him. That's why in the book it says, the only way to my father is through the sun. <laughs> so from right here. The thing is missing is that his hair turns white when he sees the song. So if you saw such a big the bills of the Ten Commandments, Moses' hair turns white when he sees God. Here, this is Harun, and now he makes judgment. He looks at your four organs, your four major organs. See, you already heard you speak. You know you did reciprocity, but now you claim to be righteous, so I'm gonna look at your colon. If your colon is all backed up and shriveled up, you can make it I look at your living display, it's all black and purple. Oh, okay, no, no. You need to try this all over again. And so that's why those organs are at the end. Those are the sons of Harun. And they represent, remember I said your body is the third temple? Yeah. Have you taken care of that temple? This is Sapheth, the enemy of Ra. And here it shows in the book of Gates, 12 hours of night and 12 hours a day, how do we become victorious in overcoming a pet, your enemies? See, the next group, they wanted to make sure they knew that you had obstacles to overcome. There was lessons that you needed to learn. And you repeat those lessons until you learn them. And so in order to resurrect, as a resurrected soul, you had overcome uh, a pet, the enemy, enemy of God. These are terrestrial vegetables. This is Massar, the great black father. Look, there's no depiction of who he is. You're not wondering, is he of African descent? The crook and the fair, the crook and the fair, the riding staff that come from me, that comes from here. This is called a heka, and this is called an enkaka. The heka is just a shepherd's staff, it means that I can guide you and lead you. The enkaka is a crash of brain, I can feed you. But just like the new jump in ancient China, I can also spend that tail to get out of line. And you can see all the rulers carry us. Rather, this is Hatshepsut Amman down here. So even the women rule, anybody who was ruling carried those symbols. 
So maybe that's why they said that God and that staff come from This is a picture of Norman. Remember, we need to see. He is the founder of Upper and Lower Kemi, Simba Tower. This African, both pictures. This is, he comes from the South. So I need to be real clear about this. And this is what the suit 50 looks like. That's the ruler from the south and the ruler from the north. The ruler from the land of the bee. We are the first to cultivate honey. The ancient community will talk about over 100 remedies for honey. Honey is the greatest antibiotic in the world. Uh, most amputees would not be, have to be amputated if you could just wash the wound and put honey on it. Science has proven that the pyramids and other monuments of Kemet, ancient Egypt, were not built by the Hebrews, farmers, nor slaves. They were built by paid citizens during the farming off-season. Since many of you mentally challenged Negro kids, only listen to your pods. Here are two of the best books of your pods, archaeologists, documenting that the Bible is not a history, but a book that the, uh, and the Kemetic the ancient Egyptians, paid their own citizens to build their own monuments, including the pyramids. So the pyramid builders of ancient Kemet by Roger David, and the tomb builders of the Pharaoh by Horace Green. And these are documents, there's documents of just, just like we saw in the receipts of the Africans who built the White House, we got documents of the people who actually built the pyramids. People actually carved their name on a few stones. And we have records that when they're telling us how the pyramids were built, was definitely not the way it was done. And so no slave, no 400 years of slave by the Hebrews, that's a made up story. It's an allegory. These are some books that you should read and you want to try to get the glyphs. We have the Miracle Savior, that's the pyramid text. The pyramid text is written inside of five different pyramids. And uh, this is an example of what it looks like inside. It's on the walls, and every place you see is the right. And see, see, when we talk about our ancient text, it ain't no mythological stuff. Like people can't find it. No, you can go tomorrow and see the pyramid text just the way it is. It's from writings that exist 3,000 years even before Kemet came into existence. The Karas said, yeah, that's the coffin text. On many of the Karas, the coffins, they wrote sacred prayers from the pyramid text and stuff that will help you resurrect, relive, and your soul become immortal. Then the Per and Haru, which they they called the Book of the Dead. But it was actually the Book of Life, the Book of Coming Forth by Day. The Sadiat text, that's the Shabbat stone, and some of the texts of Shabbat are redoing during the fourth golden age. And the Yebu stone, uh, the Yebu stone is here. Um, it talks about Imhotep, it talks about where the state of the story of Joseph coming to Egypt and all of that. They just got it straight from a text that was already written there in ancient Kenya. So those are some texts you want to learn how to read yourself in the glyphs. Second Golden Age, this big black brother here is the founder of the Second Golden Age of ancient Kenya. That's the so-called 11th dynasty. This is his wives, two of his wives here. This is what our military looked like. Now, there is no European. We had pink paint, y'all. So if there were some pink people in here, we would have put them. This is in the tomb of the king. So he had the greatest artist in the world. So this is what we look like. These are Magi warriors. That's an Inchu Hotel. That's his wives. These are the ancient Kushites doing the same time. That's the Kushite army. Look at that. This is, before there was Kung Fu, before there was Jiu Jitsu, Karate, we had the Minshu Combat. This was recorded 2000 BCE, before the Japanese got to Japan or the first Shang Dynasty in China. See, it's not a feudal thing, it's not us just trying to make believe. Uh, we're trying to make everything happen. Look at all of these rules. Third Golden Age. I'm going to go through this kind of quick so we can have some questions and answers here. This is Akhenaten, the Aten, and almost many of the stuff that you see in the modern Bible, like Solomon, the writings of Solomon, and all that, 
comes from Akhenaten. He is the one that wrote most of this, the prayers. Uh, he is the author. This is his family and our mom. These are not your ancestors. is a clear rendition of what, how we understood this mineral domain. This is Telhakana's body. His body is used with red jasper. Red jasper represents your root chakra, uh, your spiritual, your reproductive energy. He didn't wear blue wigs. It's not blue hair. Blue is done because that's lapis lazuli stone, representing wisdom. That's the wisdom stone, lapis lazuli. We see turquoise because it puts you in touch with your native ancestors, your indigenous people. It gives you a voice. Connect with them. You see, silver metabolizes the body, gold intensifies. Carnelian. Carnelian deals with intuition. Your intuition, so that you can have a direct hotline with the Creator. Everybody has the same access to the Creator. So we see the stones. We see that all the monuments. Look at this lapis lazuli and Kepler coming into being. The turquoise, the carnelian. We see the same combination of stones. And so we are the most. There have been mines in Africa that's over 100,000 years old. Monkeys don't mine semi-precious stones. <laughs> this is an ancient chemist that we know that we didn't have to even leave chemist. The philosphere, elephants, copper, melachite, gold, granite, natron, carnelian, jasper, alabaster, limestone, basalt, quartzite. All this was in chemist and Kush. Crystals for pain and relief. Rose quartz soothes pain and cuts, scrapes, and bruises. And loving energy also common, which also is helpful, especially for kids. Melachite is wonderful for all general pain relief. Hold these stones, rub them, and they will help vibrate on your energy to help dissipate those mount, uh, mount, uh, incorrectly. A color spectrum, people. Learn colorology. Ancient Kelly stresses that. Each color is a different vibration. Red increases physical energy. Violet stimulates the intuition, imagination. That's the highest octave. Blue and in indigo increases calmness, peace. Green supports balance and harmony. Yellow increases fun, harmony, lightness, power, energy. Orange stimulates creativity, productivity, pleasure, optimism, enthusiasm. You wear these colors and they help lead the way before you even get there. But you don't want them in the extreme form. You always want soft colors of them, the pastel. And too much orange will send you nuts. Too much red will have you bouncing off the wall. I think y'all have heard this before, but the fresh crowd is going to take the African warriors who kick the hype shows out. So anytime after the third, after the second golden age, only in the third golden age this crown came into existence. So whenever you see a king wearing this crown, he's imitating the hairstyle of the Africans from the South who kicked the hypsos out. They wanted to commemorate. Remember I said how we deify our ancestors? So this was the ancient convention who was showing respect to the Africans from the South. This is Kahala. This tomb was found in the Valley of the Kings. This is the first record of Ma'at. 42 oracles of Ma'at was found inside of his tomb. See, this is why we got to read our stuff. Ma'atha was a magi from the Kush, from Sudan. This is the first of Ma'at, Ma'at tomb, showing you the ancient collectible identified with the other Africans from the south. If you don't use your own symbols, somebody else will. There's the song, there's the tower, there's Oscar in them. And they're going, who's Oscar? <laughs> this is given to the best actor and best actress. <laughs> you can see them using our symbol, the American seal. 52 of the 55 people who signed the Declaration of Independence were all Freemasons. They were all studying ancient Kenya. These are tokens all over the world, the male phallic symbol. Resurrection, rebirth, renewal. 
And so they're all over the place that Mr. Europeans was trying to feed you Kim. Know your story through your classical language and connection. Africa is our center of gravity, our culture, and spiritual mother, father, our beating heart, no matter where we live on the face of the planet. Quote by Dr. John Henry Park. I am the ancestor. They live through me. They live through me. I'm going to end by saying surround yourself with those on the same mission you're on. You are the soul awakening, a heart opening, a light shining. You are the divine essence. African consciousness means that you assume nothing, you question everything, you open your eyes, and you challenge the opposition, and you start to think. That's why I open up the mind. Books that you should read. And people, I like to end by saying, people say that this is a nice motivating speech, but you know, it's going to be gone after tomorrow. I said, no, then you need to be motivated tomorrow, and you need to be motivated the next day, and the next day, you need to listen to tapes over and over. It's like washing your baby. You don't wash one time and say, oh, I did that this week. You need to wash your baby every day. You need motivation from your ancestors. That's why our prayer is every morning and every night. And if you get a chance to do it, the day. And the greatest form of love is gratitude. Woo! If I take anything of value, use it in your life. Study the with your nature. I have some flyers over to the side. I can hopefully answer some questions. Hopefully I can go some lines, some questions. I brought some extra room and some tapes over here, so hopefully we will get you there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, Sister Celeste, 
Can you give me a sign? I always give sisters some best for you. <laughs> so that um, Sister Celeste is going to pass these out, and they are front and back. They give you the time and the place for the next two lectures uh, in which we're, we're, we're dealing with. Now, we actually fill out a review of these lecture series, and that's very critical because the church will review them and they will make a decision of whether they will continue these lectures. So we want you to write a good review. We want you to be truthful, but we want you to write a good review. And uh, make sure that uh, Sister Celeste gets those reviews. And we need to get, if you completed eight of the next, of the 10 lectures, we need to get your name uh, printed, first name, last name, so that we can make out these certificates for you. Give us your email uh, uh, and and, uh, and phone number so we can have those ready. I, at this particular time, I'd like for the uh, board of directors of the Mahat University, if you'll know, just come forward. Uh, Dr. Uh, Esau, where's Dr. Esau? I saw him a minute ago. A big boy? Oh, you had to catch your flight. No, he's back here. He's back here. Dr. Isa, come up, please. Come up. Come up, please. All right. He has done a marvelous and magnificent job of moderating most of these sessions. Let me give him a hand. He's a great brother. We appreciate all the work that he has done. Uh, Brother Jahi, you have a word to say? Well, we just um, appreciate everybody taking their time.
in order to show the influence of Greece and Rome, I need to show you the foundation of where they're getting all their information from. So I'm, towards the end, I'm going to introduce the Greeks, and then next week, I do the Greeks and then the Romans and how the Roman Empire fell. But I need you to bear with me because I need to take you quickly through the four golden ages of ancient Kemet. So you see the foundation of where Greece and Rome come in. And as I'm going through, I'm always going to show you when I'm at a specific time in a timeline, where are the Greeks? Where are the Romans? In fact, where are the Eurasians, period? I'm going to show you because I think our people have no clue on just who they are. We have no clue on how great we are. I had a guy come to my table this morning and he had read my book, Minchu Hotel. He said, this has changed my whole life. I had no idea we, we had this type of skills that was it that I talk about in this book. How many people here just off the cuff know anything about the Magi? All right, not even half. Three people raised their hand, okay. And if you Google Magi right now on Google, it'll have one paragraph. And it'll say the elite warriors of the kings of Egypt. And they were the ju judges and magistrates because of their uh, honest and pure heart. So now I wanna ask you a question. If you got the most powerful person in the world who has at his disposal armies, military, people from all over the world, and he only wants the Magi to be the personal bodyguard and the bodyguard of the royal family, and that they are the judges of my eye. Then who are these people? How come nobody's telling you where they're from? Where are their background? Where are they getting this deep science, this deep knowledge that even the most powerful person in the world sits before their feet? So that's what's happening in my book, The Spirit of the Magi. I only brought five with me today. I'll bring more next week. I came by the train, so I just grabbed a, a few and threw them in. Um, so I'm gonna take you on this journey. Like I said, I'm gonna take you through ancient Kemet so that you begin to see what is that, the all four golden ages. And then we will introduce the Macedonians. The Macedonians conquered the Greeks. Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia, who conquered the Greeks and annexed that empire. So most of us don't even know Macedonia, okay? But that's, that's where uh, Alexander was from. So after he conquered India, conquered Syria and Persia, then he came back to Kemet. But I want you to understand that when Alexander came to Kemet, there was no war. He didn't defeat the ancient Kemetu. They had a celebration. They, they welcomed him in. Because the tyranny of the Persians was so great that they looked at the Greeks as their saviors. So I just want you to, you know, to have a clue. There was no battle, no war. Alexander didn't come in kicking butt, you know, nothing like that. He marched in at, to a welcoming party. That, you know, that it was changing, that this was going to be like a savior. It's the same thing when Islam came to northern Africa. The tyranny of the Romans was so great that people couldn't wait for Islam because they thought it was going to be something different from the Roman tyranny. But what happened, we had Trinity D versus Trinity D. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to get into this. Uh, if I back up, the first thing I want to say here also is that I put, we must learn to read the Madunetra. Now, I'm a, a component of this. The rabbit would not go to fox school to understand the nature of a rabbit. Do y'all understand that? I make that just as clear as possible. We are going to fox school to learn about ourselves. And if the rabbit does that, he's probably going to be rabbit stupid. And the better the stew and the more abundance of the rabbit, they might even give that rabbit a Nobel Peace Prize. The foxes will. So when we have Africans in America and Africans around the world where there's no peace, we're at the bottom of the total pole economically and spiritually right now. 
And we get Nobel Peace Prizes, what did we get it for? The same reason the rabbit for delivery to the fox. All that he can eat. So that's where we're at right now. When we are uh, giving these peace prizes where there is no priest. I want to make it real clear. One of my teachers, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, when I was 14 years old, I sat before Malcolm and an organization of Afro-American Uni uh, Afro Unity. And uh, he stood before us, he says, three things we're going to do right away. Self-respect, self-determination, self-defense. Everybody's taking martial arts. You've got to know how to defend yourself. Self-respect, clean yourself up. And then self-determination, you have to know your history and know your story. And you're not deep unless you can break it down so that a five-year-old can understand it. So some of us use prodigious words to try to make you look, your dominion to mind look like it's off the scale, but that's just mental masturbation. So what I've learned is to take the most complex situation and break it down so that the five-year-old understands the molecular structure of the universe and how it works. I had an eight-year-old in my class and we explained consciousness. And I explained that Jehuti was your divine higher consciousness. And that you have a ego, which is in your lower outer consciousness, that wants to control you and keep you attached to 3D material world. But when you take the veil of the ego from in front of you, the divine consciousness and the creator is waiting there inside of you. You don't need to go to church, the synagogue, the temple. Wherever you are, you are in the house of the creator. And the creator rests inside of your mind. But you got to go deeper, deeper. And so I explained this consciousness, and I said, once you get a glimpse of consciousness, you realize that we are all one, and that we have a job to do, and we have a responsibility, and that you need focus and discipline in order to do that. And no one has to teach you that once you see that. So the next week, the elder in the class came in with no homework, and nothing like that. <laughs> So I'm trying to go over, and the eight-year-old said, Infidisi, just move on. Obviously, he's not conscious. <laughs> now, his PhD father was totally embarrassed, you know, but the boy clearly understood what consciousness meant and what it meant to tap into Jehuti. He said, when he has consciousness, he'll know that we are all responsible for each other, and he'll have his work. This is the eight-year-old, so, you know, I just want to give you an introduction. So the Madhu Netcha, what it does, it allows you to be able to do first-hand research. So I'm not just a regular historian, I'm a research historian. I want to research, but I look at a book, the first thing I want to see is their bibliography. Now you got a book with no bibliography, I just close that and move on. Because no one is an idol, no one taught themselves, no one is born a genius. No one is born knowing everything. It's inside of you, but you need a teacher, you need somebody to help bring it out. So when I look at your bibliography, I want to read what you read. I want to double check where you said you got your resources from. So now, if we want to learn about ancient Kemet, if we want to know the beginning of science and technology on this planet, then you need to be able to read the language of the people who wrote it. Why would you rather go to the fox to find out his origins? So I need to go right back there. So we need to be able to read the Madhu Netcher because when you read the Madhu Netcher, you, you eliminate the middleman. You go directly to the source. And it's like you are talking to the ancestors personally. Because the ancestors are not someplace in the grave. They're not the spirit, you know, roaming around. The ancestors are in your blood. They're in your DNA. Through your DNA, I can trace you all the way back to the first. That means that all of them are inside of you. So when you speak to the ancestors, you are speaking to a power inside of yourself. Okay, so I need you to be, be real clear about that. So that's why I teach the Madhu Netcher, because I don't even want my students to say, well, in from she said, no, we read it in the text. And I'm going to explain in here some of the main texts that you need to go to to be able to get some of the information I'm going to talk about. There's four agreements that we have to be on. They are one, be impeccable with your word. You see, this higher knowledge is supposed to give you character, good character. If every other word come out your mouth is a low vibration word and you cuss it all over the place, then I already know something about your character. Number two, 
Don't take anything personal. You understand that you're here and you're part of the collective. So you're not trying to take anything personal. Number three, don't make assumptions. If you don't know, ask. Seek the answer. Look, research. And number four, always do your best. Some days are high, some days are low. But if you do your best, then you are satisfied at the end of each day. When somebody comes up to me, Info DC, how you doing? Excellent. I'm doing excellent. I'm in a divine state. They start feeling better. All right, because we are the captains of our own ship. And we have to be clear about that. Now, Africa is not upside down here. Most of us have been upside down our whole life. That's a proper spatial perspective. And what I tried to show here is other African nations. See, when I talk about ancient Kemet, I'm not talking about just this one little space here on the, on the Hopi River. Kemet is the mouthpiece of the continent. And so what you saw or what you see in ancient Kemet, the Hopi Valley here, ancient Kemet and Kosh, is a reflection of the, what was happening in the Western Desert, what was happening in Central Africa, what was happening in South Africa, what was happening in East Africa, and Kemet became the curator of all of this information. So I don't want you to think that just some magical people alone now and Scotty beamed down some information and they were the only ones that had it. No. They got their information from all parts of Africa. It just so happened if you're in a tropical rainforest and you write something down or you try to keep records of something, two or three years later, because of the humidity in the water, it's going to evaporate or be deteriorated. Great. But the ancient Kometra in the dry area wrote on stone. Okay, so they were able to preserve the information from the interior of Africa. So again, you just see just little pieces of culture of all over the African continent, and it was preserved in ancient Kenya. Now, I also need to say, well, Infodisi was this information from all around the planet. Uh, no, let me just explain. When ancient Kenya was at its zenith, there was no civilization in Asia. There was no civilization in what we call Europe today, which is just Western Asia. There was no recorded civilization in North America or South America, and I'm going to show you a timeline. So I'm talking approximately 6,000 years ago. So if we go back 6,000 years ago, ancient Kemet was already full-blown. Full-blown. That means mathematics, science, astronomy, astrology. They knew the circumference of the planet. Okay, They knew the speed of light already recorded 6,000 years ago. The martial combat science of the Menchu art, already at a very sophisticated stage 6,000 years ago. That's before the Japanese got to Japan, before the first emperor, shook the first two dynasties in China is the Shang dynasty, which was also black, the Kushites coming, okay? It's the same people we talk about these magi. I just want to uh, make sure that you're clear about this. Um, North America, the mound builders haven't started building mounds yet. All right, so I just need you to just have an idea of the time period that we're talking about. The Hopi Valley, this is the same orientation. And the Hopi River, which you know is the Nile River, the longest river in the world, over 4,160 miles long, flows down north from up south. Dr. Ben Thomas is the mountain of the, we come from the foothills of the mountain of the moon. What are the mountains of the moon? There's three of them. So remember when I said Kemet was the mouthpiece? You had Kilimanjaro in present-day Tanzania. In ancient times, it was called ta -Netche. Netche is the word for divinity. The land of divinity. That's what our ancestors looked at, the interior of Africa. That's what they called it, ta -Netche. So Kilimanjaro is in ta -Netche, which is present-day also Mount Wenzori is in present-day Uganda, still part of Tanecha. Then the Hopi River is the White. The White Nile comes to Khartoum. The third mountain of the moon is Mount Choka, where they tend to rest inside of the equator, and that gives forth the Blue Nile. It meets at Khartoum, and then here, it runs all the way down to the Wedgie Word, which today we call the Mediterranean Sea. Wedgie Word meant the Great Green, the Great Green. Ocean. But 
now, one thing, the reason why I'm spending some time on this, I, when I said we're upside down, inside out, and backwards, I want you to be clear. The Asiatics came into Africa this way, backwards. The Nile's flowing this way, so you're going against the current. The first cataract they encountered, they said, okay, that that's, must be the first cataract. Now, if there's other ones behind that, obviously this can't be the first if it's emptying out that way. There are six cataracts. They call the 6-1 the first one. And brothers and sisters, to show you that the Western world is not, in, not trying to educate you today. Go check me out. Go look in your encyclopedia. Go where it's got all the cataracts still backwards, even though we know we're going against the grain. But the first cataract got to be up south. So the first cataract is up here, the second, third, fourth, fifth. Only one cataract is in Kemet, the sixth cataract. What is a cataract? Just to make sure everybody understands. A cataract is the natural obstruction in the flow of energy. Uh -huh. So if you have something over your eyes, obstructing your vision, that's called a cataract. And it can remove it. A cataract in a water, in a river, is a natural obstruction. Rocks jetting up out of the ground. A waterfall. A boat cannot navigate through there. So that's a cataract. So there are six cataracts where you can't just take your boat from beginning to end. You'd have to get out, get another boat, or carry your boat across land, past the waterfall, or whatever, then recontinue your journey. So there are six. And right now, all six are still backwards in all your books. I'm talking about the universities. I'm a professor at the university. Still there. So the same thing they bamboozled you with in third grade, <laughs> when you're getting your master's degree, you just get it deeper and higher. Mm. And more of it. Okay? Mm. They don't correct it. They just give it to you with a little bit more statistics behind it, but it's the same backwards. So I just I'm clear about that. Now if you notice, go to your map, check me out. Your map is upside down, and it's what it's gonna say. The upside down part is gonna say lower Egypt. Now how lower Egypt is gonna be up? And the bottom part. It's going to say Upper Egypt. How Upper Egypt going to be down? Because you got to turn it around. So they know this, but we're still going to bamboozle you. All the maps up until 1400 were done by them. So I just need you to know. 1400s, the Europeans began, they were coming out of the Dark Ages as a result of being in contact with the Moors, who have conquered all, all of uh, Southern Europe there, France. Spain, all of that area. They went to the universities in Barcelona and in Greece, and then they were interchanging ideas, and Europe came out of the Dark Ages when they came back in contact with African people. So let me say this. The Dark Ages of Europe is when the Roman Empire collapsed, and they had no connection with people of color. So Europe was isolated all by themselves, and because they didn't start any of this knowledge, when those teachers died out or whatever, it was not passed, they didn't have any universities. The first universities in Europe were created by the Moors. Right, so you just need to understand. In fact, the first several dozen. And then Oxford and Cambridge, those people who studied with the Moors, went back to Europe and opened up those first universities in Europe today. And now they make it sound like, oh, you went to Oxford. Like that's the ultimate. You, you got here from Cambridge? Uh, you're a Cambridge? Like that's the ultimate. Okay, so I just need you to understand where they're coming from. When the greatest universities at the time was in Timbuktu, doing their time. Okay, there's parallel to that. Mental slavery in place today. What happened to the highly advanced African civilization in the Hapi Ijiru Valley region? They were clearly the most advanced material culture and antiquity, thousands of years ahead of the Greece, the Greeks, and the Romans. They were 3,000 years behind us. What was the process to block out our achievements of the African population from the annals of history? But more importantly, how and under what circumstances did Africans among the very first people to invent writing, architecture, nation building, urban planning, and constructional engineering lose their arts and sciences almost completely? All of the books written about Africans by the conquerors reflect only the conqueror's viewpoint or supporting views. You have to understand, see, colonization was a genius in terms of deception. Yeah. 
I tell you, you have to speak my language in order to go to school. Now, the textbooks are written in my language, so they were printed where? In my country. So this is an economic stimulus to my country. They tell you today, France would collapse without the money they get from West African empires that they colonize. Okay, so you speak my language, you get books from my, listen, I was in Egypt this year, and we were on a little uh, uh, bus ride, and there were three Nigerians in there, and one Nigerian lady was a teacher, she was a professor, she had a master's degree, she told us that the Nigerians didn't have education to the Greeks came, I mean to the, uh, the British came, <laughs> and she's a teacher in Nigeria. So I'm just trying to let you know how deep this is. So they impose their language. Listen, the only country in all of Africa that teaches language, that teaches math, that teaches science, that teaches literature in an African language is Tanzania. There are 54 countries in Africa. So 53 countries is using their oppressor's language to teach. Wow. Now, let me just take Ghana. Ghana. Egypt, I mean, English is the official language. Mm -hmm. Only about 20% of the Ghanaians can read fluently English. So that means they can only, and they don't learn any school in their own language. So they know how to speak tree, God, Fonte, all, but they can't read and write it. Because mm -hmm. all school is in English. So you don't even learn your own, you don't even learn the science of the world today in your language. So you know what that does? That colonizes your mind. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand, the Greeks and the Romans are the first to do this. So a modern day Europeans is just veggie backing off of the Greeks and the Romans teaching. Shove your language down and make their language even inferior. You erase their history. When the Portuguese came to Mexico, the first thing they did was burn all the books. They said the fire lasted for a month. So what they do is erase your history. So now, after your generation, you don't even know what y'all did. You now only go by what your oppressor shows you. I'm trying to show you how deep this is. Mm. And why we're in a situation like this. And then for you to glorify your oppressor's material is the ultimate insanity. That's not only crazy, that's the ultimate of insanity. I'm perpetuating the very instrument that was used to oppress and liberate and to distinguish my own people. So they don't even have to be around. If your slave master sleeps good, it means that you are totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so even today, books, curricula, teaching materials, and educational institutions are founded on white capitalist, male, Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian, Aryan rule models of human history. There have been minor reforms, but overall, white supremacy models systematically dominate every intellectual and cognitive rule of education produced, from metaphysics to physics, to idealism, to materialism, to religious science, and of African people are misused, misrepresented in every aspect. So brothers and sisters, as I talk to you, I don't care where you go in the world. If you go to Japan, the Japanese feel is superior, but their system is based upon European system. Go to China, they've had a culture revolution, but their system is still based upon a European model. Mm -hmm. And then every place else you go in the world, it's a European model. Yes. So we oblivion who you are, what your culture is. When I take people, take people to the museum, a museum is a trophy case of white male domination. Did anybody ever tell you that? Mm -hmm. You thought your museum was a place for education, right? So the same stuff I crushed you with in first grade, now when you go to the museum, I have to reinforce that. See, you don't have no culture. Look, this is what you used to look like. Now, you look like us. This is the language you used to speak. Now you speak our language. This is the culture you used to have. Now, this is the God you used to worship. Now you got JC. You know, or you got Muhammad, or you got Buddha. Buddha was black, but that's all right. We got black crazy folks running around. Because you black don't make you sane. Okay? And don't, because you white don't make you totally evil. That's all right. I got to be, you know, 
true about what's going on. How do we honor and praise our great ancestors? Four ways. We speak their name. And we speak their name the way they spoke their name. Y'all understand that? So if your name was Ursa Ma'at Ra, Satepid Ra, Medi in Ma'at, you don't go Ramses the second. He wouldn't even know who you were talking about. <laughs> All right? You speak their names the way they, and they etched it in stone, my sister. So it's not like we don't see it. And they will make up a name in a second. We know our ancestors through Toby names. How many people here saw Roots? Everybody almost, okay? Do y'all remember? He was Kunta Kinte in Africa. When he got here, what's your name, boy? Kunta Kinte? No, your name Toby. So now we give it each other Toby names. 400 years later, we still give it each other Toby names. And then not only that, not only are we giving each other Toby, we go back and name our ancestors, but give them Toby, Toby names. That's uh, Chihuti was the 14th or the third. No two rulers in ancient Kemet in 4,000 years had the same two names. You have a, watch this, every ruler has five names. You have a Haru name, because we are Shimsu Haru, followers of the great God. Then we had a golden Haru name. That means that my legacy will live forever and won't turn us like gold. Then you have a Neptune name. I'm protector, protector of the two ladies. So you see how we embrace the feminine energy. I embrace the two ladies because our nation is a lady. All because a nation, a, a, a nation nurtures you, takes care of you, feeds you, and helps you grow independently. So Kemet ends with a T because it's a feminine energy. Okay, so we protect the feminine quality. And then number four, only two names are inside of a shin. You don't see what a shin is. Today, we call it the cartouche. Here we go again. Colleges using French. And cartouche is short for cartridge, which is a bullet. When they came to heaven and they saw the names inside of these elliptical orbits, they said, oh, that looks like a cartridge. So today, Egyptology, who's supposed to be giving, are still calling a shin a cartridge bullet. You see what happens when somebody else takes control of your information? Okay. So now only two names are in the shin. The Sa-Ra name, which is your birth name. And Sa-Ra, you would have a, the, fifth, the women would have a Sat-Ra. Sat-Ra. You are the daughter of the creator. The males would have a side right now. That's your birth name. Because you are born divine. You are not born in sin. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. You, you belittle this human intelligence and the power of a human being. That's right. You were born divine. <laughs> the, the next name is called the Nasut Bitti name. And that means ruler of upper and lower Kemet. So when you put those two names together, no king, no female ruler in 4,000 years had the same name. So there's no need. They got Ramses the 11th, Ramses the 12th, Ramses the 13th. They wouldn't even know who that is. Okay? Because European concepts, starting with the Greeks and the Romans, have superimposed their culture on ours. Like they got, what, Pope John the 59th. Pope for 108. What are they, ran out of names? <laughs> What's going on? So they took that concept and superimposed it on ancient Kemet. So I'm just trying to just give you some clarity in the thought. So that's number one, you speak their name. Number two, we complete their great works. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm talking about the great works of our ancestors, right? And, and, and that's got to be in your head because you can say, we did it once, we can do it again, and we can do it even better. And that's what they don't want young people to understand. Look what we did with basketball. Mm -hmm. The European who created basketball had no idea the game was gonna happen like this. And even to 1950, they didn't let blacks in. The NBA was all white. And then the Harlem Globetrotters said, well, we're better than y'all. And they said, how you gonna beat the world champions? The Harlem Globetrotters, 1949, spanked the world champions, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> 
they were making movies on the Globetrotters and the world champions was having problems of people attending. So the next year, 1950, they challenged them again. We're gonna challenge, we're gonna beat these Negroes. Globetrotters spanked them again for the second time. Sell out crowd. All of New York was there, the whole West Coast, East Coast. Now they said, okay, we gotta accept these blacks. And so the first blacks in the NBA were blacks from actually the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. And then we began to dominate. Today, you would think there's racism in basketball. You would think you gotta be black to play this game. In the 1940s, the superstars were European Jews. That was their way out of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The Jews were the stars of basketball. It was an inner city game. They were the stars of basketball until they let us in. Then we changed all of that. They let Oscar in and a couple of other people. And everybody who came in, we changed the game. Yep. They let Bill Russell in. He blocked so many shots. They said, okay, look, you can't, if the shot is, you can't stop it no more. Then Will Chamberlain came in. Oh, no, you can't stand in the middle. No more three, that's three seconds. You can only be in three seconds. Oscar was hooking the ball. Oh, no, that's, that's, something's wrong with that. That's got to be a carry. You can't do that no more. Every time we came in, we changed the game. So that's what we would do in the corporate office. That's what we would do in the real estate office. That's what we would do every place we go so they have to make sure they keep us out. Number three, we complete their incomplete works. And that's what we're doing now. The incomplete works was to rise our spiritual consciousness. Not to get you hooked on a religion, but to free you so that you understand that you are metalock. You are a divine being. So that's the incomplete, that's the work we gotta do now. And then number four was to leave images and edifices behind, sculptures, paintings, artifacts, so that we can see what our ancestors look like. That's important, so that's what we have to do. Real quick, when I say we were upside down, inside out, and backwards, everything you think you know has to be relearned. Are you looking at the world through your own cultural eyes? A good friend of mine, He's a spiritual ancestor now, uh, Brother Amos Wilson. We used to sit down and talk, and Amos Wilson said, we see each other through European eyes. And they have colonized even what, our, what we classify as success. Think of that. If your enemy classifies what success is, then your so-called success is going to benefit them more than it benefits you. If you look at our millionaires, their money is invested not in Africa, not in African people, but in the very people who were their colonizers. So you're just giving that money right back. Think of new folks whose minds is colonized. What they say 90% of the people who hit the lottery 10 years later are broke. Not only are they broke, they're in more debt than they were before they hit the lottery. Because they never changed their thinking. They got new money, so they got five Cadillacs outside. Or say the things. Rolls Royce. Picking them up, right, from the projects. Okay. <laughs> they got a house, or they'll get a house that costs $10 million. Not understanding, they got to pay taxes on that. So three years later, you can't pay the taxes on your house, and it's already depreciated 500%. So you can't even get a million dollars from your $10 million house, okay, all right? You see what happens? Because the wrong thinking. So what I'm trying to teach you is symptomatic thought. How do we change our thinking? And brothers and sisters, no matter what I do, and no matter what you hear other people say, if we don't change how we think, we are doomed. That's it. Mythology and superstition has to change. I, I say, if a black cat crosses through here right now, sister, what are you thinking? Yeah. It's beautiful. Good luck. You think it's good luck? Some people think it's bad luck. Yeah. Some people don't know. No, it means the cat going somewhere. <laughs> Symptomatic thought. That's all. The cat going somewhere. He might be going home. All that other stuff. Oh man, super bad luck. Good. That's superstition. That's African people, or actually all people, but specifically us right now. That's why Africans can't do business with each other right now because of the superstition. We in Harlem used to have the ice man. He would come through the neighborhood. Ah, oh, come get your ice, your ice. And it was a and the European Jews said, wait a minute, they making money doing this. So he started making ice and undercut the black ice man. He put the black ice man out of business because the black community had been trained by the Jews that Jewish ice was colder than black ice. Not knowing that all ice freezes at 32 degrees. 32 degrees. Okay? So you see, it's how we think, brothers and sisters. How we think.
So, quickly, let me run through these words. We have to change how we think. No Egypt. Ancient Egypt is an oxymoron. It does not exist. It's ancient Kemet. And there's the word here, Kemet. See, and the Europeans used to tell us that meant black land. But this is the determinative for community or city. So you're saying the black community. No pharaoh. That comes from the word per ah was introduced by the Greeks, the head of the great the White House. No, the word was Nasut Biti. Nasut Biti, ruler of upper and lower Kemet, as life. No cartridge, I told you that's French for a bullet. It was a shin. This is elliptical, it was a shin. No hieroglyphics, that's Greek again. The word is Madu Netcher, right here. Madu Netcher, written from right to left. No sphinx. How many people y'all see this thing and the first thing goes, oh, that's the sphinx? I mean, the sphinx don't even, it, the, 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 wouldn't even know you're talking about it. A sphinx is a mythological creature that has wings that will kill you if you don't know the riddle. Has nothing to do with Africa or that, that statue. It's Haru M. Akepti, the Nebhu. Haru M. Akepti, Haru of the rising and setting sun. That means it has a lion's body because lion is the king of the animal domain, but a high priest head, meaning that you control your animal nature. Don't get rid, don't get rid of your animal nature because you might need it one day, but rise to your higher spiritual nature so that you don't have to use that. Fighting is the last level and it drops you to the, to the level of the animal. So if you're gonna be an animal, at least be the best animal. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. We're talking this intellectual stuff. Right now, the average teenage boy at 19 got a closet full of sneakers. Mm -hmm. The average teenage white boy got a closet full of guns. Mm -hmm. Now, if something break out, you can't run in all them sneakers. You got to grab one pair, maybe another pair, and get up out of there. Meanwhile, he's shooting to the left and right. They're training to deal with you. And you are training to get whooped. Mm. And you're training to run. Mm -hmm. And how far can you run? No Nile is the hockey. No mummy. Mummy is a black glue, a sack. <laughs> From the word mumia, we call it a sahu. Sahu means a spiritual wrapping and cleansing to prepare the body for eternity. And we run around and talk about the mummy. No pyramid, that's Greek again. The word is mir, mir kut. No many gods, this is where they really got you. Oh man, they got all the gods in Egypt. No, it's the nature rule, principles and laws. Principles and laws. And the principles and laws work. They don't care if you believe it or not. Gravity. Is gravity a God? Does gravity care if you're black or white? Short, fat, tall, skinny, atheist? Does gravity care that you care? It still operates. All the principles and laws. Air don't care that you don't believe in it. <laughs> Ra don't care. They all work. But guess what? If you get up on this roof, Talking about you born again and you don't believe in gravity, you in for a rude awakening. So if you know how to use the principles and laws, they can benefit you on your journey. So you see how clear that is? No gods and goddesses, that's to spook you out. So I don't want you to believe, watch this here. If I take three elements that you know you need, if I take food, water, and air, that you know to sustain the body, you need all three. Is that correct? You can go three months without food and the body can still sustain itself. You can go 30 days without water. How long can you go, sister, without air? Well, three minutes. Three minutes is really good. I bet you half of us can't last one minute. So now that you understand that phenomenon, which one do you know the least about? Yeah. Air. You know the least about your breath because that's the major one that you need to know. 
So I'm trying to show you what this educational system does. It's upside down, inside out. In fact, you should be learning to breathe anxiety. I took a test when I was going through my initiation where they lay you inside of a sarcophagus and there's like 30 minutes worth of air, but they're going to leave you in there for 45 minutes. You know, you realize if you fail this test, you don't take it over. <laughs> <laughs> so, what the priest showed us that they don't let you take the test unless they think you can pass it. Okay. A bear hibernates. Are you as intelligent as a bear? Once we understand what the bear does, he closes down his system, he lowers his heartbeat through his breath, through his breathing. And then he can sleep with the food he ate two months ago, digesting in his body. Humans do the same thing. And we are more intelligent than the bear. <laughs> so if the bear can do it, you can do it. So you set your state through your breathing through a, a suspended animation. You slow everything down. So instead of taking a dozen breaths per minute, you take three. Ten seconds on the inhale. Ten seconds on the exhale. You minimize that. Okay. You didn't say I passed the test with fly colors. Okay. Or I wouldn't be here telling you about it. Excuse me. Uh, so no, no gods, principles, and laws. And this is how they trick you because if you belong to Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of them, there isn't but one God. So therefore, if you got many gods, they're getting away from you fast as you can without you even trying to understand what they were talking about. You need to understand the principle of war, the principle of air, the principle of fire. You need to understand these principles so that you can use them to your advantage. In ancient Kemet and Kosh, the collective who believed in one creator, the spiritual consciousness of all things. The one creator. So I'm letting you know where they got this information from. I mean, the Greeks and Romans got this information from. The spiritual consciousness of all things. The one creator, divine principle, principles and laws are called Neturu. And the worship of the Neturu was part of an everyday life. As in civilization, the spiritual system was linked to mythology and spiritual revelations. Much spiritual beliefs were centered around the heavens and the earth, and the Hapi interior. The comedic spiritual practice were linked to celestial movements, constellations, the sun, rock, the moon, Ea, the planets, which in turn guided their mythologies. So above, so below. You are not separate from the whole. Neture, you are one with Neture. In my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healers, the first chapter, I deal with the nature and the natural root. And the natural root is all. It's the all. So therefore, all of us are part of this one divine energy. If, if you can step outside of it, the nature wouldn't be the all, it would be the partial. Okay, but because you cannot step outside, because everything is part of the nature. You see, the word God should not be substituted with the word nature. God is a Greek, a Gothic word, dog backwards. It has nothing to do with your culture or concept. And we don't translate the same as, as I define nature, I say nature is the air that you breathe. The nature is your heartbeat. Nature is the water. Nature is a bug. Now, would you think, you say God is a bug. You say, no, God created the bugs, but God ain't a bug. No, the nature is all things. All things are part of the nature. So I want you to see how like, we can make that distinction. There's nothing out, the nature didn't make you and stop. I don't know how y'all could believe the fairy tale. Did somebody work for six days and then they've been on a break ever since? Or they've been <laughs> answering phones for people's prayers. No, they, nobody listened to your prayers up there. Everything is right here. You are your consciousness. The nature is here. There's a smallest example of a particle is called a quark. And when they look through an electrical microscope and they can see the quark, guess what? When you look at it, it's there and then it vanishes. And then it's there and it vanishes. And when you look at it and I look at it, it don't vanish at the same time. So it means that the observer yeah. is affecting it. Right. So you are the creator observing itself. Some of y'all get that in the morning. 
Spirituality is not religion. Being spiritual just means you're in touch with your divine self. Uh, I heard your brother before me say something really dangerous. This is not to contradict what he's doing. But you don't need education. You don't need all this stuff. All you need is Jesus. No. <laughs> you have to prepare yourself. We tell people you need to have a degree of mastery of five domains. And the first domain is the mineral domain. The planet is a mineral. The sun is a mineral. The stars are mineral. And you are made up of stardust. You are a carbon-based unit. Mm -hmm. That's what you are. And you are ignorant of the mineral domain. And if we just take the earth mineral, if I take the topography of the earth, you are ignorant of that. The very planet that you, that's housing you. We don't know nothing about topography. We look at the continent we come from. What percentage is, it's only four main terrains. You have rainforest, savanna, grassland. You have Sahil, shrubs, semi-dry, and then you got desert. Mm. That's it. Most people think that Africa is a jungle. There's more trees in New York than there is percentage of any place in Africa except for the Congo. Did y'all hear me? But they got you thinking you come from the jungle. There were more trees in Europe than there ever was in Africa. But they got you thinking you came from. And then listen to the terminology. English is really dangerous language. If I say, brother, your breath smell like a tropical rainforest, <laughs> you wouldn't be upset, would you? In fact, if your breath smell like a tropical, you start thinking something real fresh and sweet. Right? But if I say, brother, your breath smell like jungle juice, you'd be like, what? You're ready to fight me. I'm still talking about the same thing. All I did was change the name. So English, my father told me when I was young, he says, the Europeans call this beautiful nature wilderness. Like it's wild. They're the only thing wild out here. <laughs> Everything is in its natural state. He's talking about the wilderness. And the wilderness needs to be conquered. That's wrong ideology, wrong concept. And we're now thinking the same way. We didn't try religion, putting our hands up saying, don't shoot, marching, singing. Maybe it's time for us <laughs> to go back to our ancient form of spirituality. So just keep that in the back again. Breathe in gratitude, breathe out love, reflect kindness to all. This is a reflection. This is what your church looks like. Whoever controls the minds of our children controls our future. We've been, we begin to awaken the very moment you realize one fact. You are creating your own reality through the energy of your consciousness. Don't put all your apples in somebody else's face. Don't say no matter what you do, some other entity can save you. The creator sent you to save yourself. There's guides around here that can help guide you when you appear to be lost and you take counsel. But even I'm a doctor of naturopath, holistic healing. I can't save nobody. The only thing I can do is give you some advice and try to create the conditions so that you can save yourself. Mm -hmm. But in the final analysis, who has to do it? You. You. Heal thyself. You are the only person that can heal you. Other people can aid and guide you. You. Now I'm going to say something else going to sound crazy, but just bear with me. You have the right to be crazy. You do. And that you gave you will. You have the right to kill yourself. Not only that, you have the right to choose your own poison. It's unfortunately in this society, we think that you can eat poison and your enemy is going to die. <laughs> We must teach our children to be unapologetically black Africans. Yeah. Unapologetically is the word that's most profound here. The only difference between a Puerto Rican, a Dominican, a Jamaican, a Haitian, a Cuban, and an African in America was a boat stop. We must return to a holistic healing system. Awakening is about letting go. 
Today, be thankful and remember how rich you are. Your family is priceless, your time is gold, and your health is wealth. Now, in ancient Kemet, pay attention to this, there were four cosmologies. That's it. Explain, cosmology explains the origins of things. One was the cosmology of Anu. The other one, the cosmology of Hetkapata. Another one is the cosmology of Kemen. The other one is the cosmology of Waset. Each one of these cosmologies, one says that the Creator spoke things into existence. So there's the power of the Word. In the beginning was the what? Word. The word. And the Word was? God. And the Word was with? God. You are that. You can speak things into it. You have, right. when it says you are natural like God, like, it means that you have the ability to think it, then plan it out, and then bring it into fruition. Mm -hmm. That's what the Creator's doing. What we're seeing is the emanation when you look at the universe, the cosmos, the Creator's of thought. You are emanation of the Creator's thoughts. Now, what you do with those thoughts, He's giving you the power to what? Govern it. I need you to understand that some of us have relinquished our power. And sometimes that's what religion does. They have you relinquish your power and put all your faith in something else. And sometimes something that never existed. Oh, so one was thought, I mean, or speak. The other one was think, to think things into existence. The other one was to masturbate it. That's procreation, to bring things into existence. The other one, he spit forth. Creation coming from the inner, your inner heart, your inner loneliness. Okay, those, so they have to use that. Almost every religion is going to use one of those to talk about uh, how things came into existence. This is an uh, insert burger from uh, Castile, which is an ancient Nubian, ancient Kush, Sudan today. What I want you to show you here, what's powerful here. This is a burner. Now they got 3,800, but it's literally about 4,200, 4,400 BCE. But what's important here is that this existed before ancient Kemet came into existence. So you heard me earlier say that Kemet was the mouthpiece of the African continent. So now that's just a statement. So now let me speak it into existence and show you. This is a burner was found in Castile, which is in present day Sudan. Before Narn are uniting Upper and Lower Kemet into a nation state. Here is the ruler sitting on his throne, on his square, wearing the white crown. This is 400 years before Kemet comes into existence. There's Haru, Shimsu Haru, the great falcon, on top of the Seret, as on top of the White House. There's the center point of star, which is Sirius A, the brightest star in the sky, we are already doing astronomy, which also represents Aset and Sushat. Here's the, uh, the great black lion, which is the foundation of Haru M. Maketi. Haru M. Maketi, that you see there, what they call the Sphinx, was an all lion first. It was the black lion. And then they put a priest's head on top of it, which was carved much later. So there it is here. Here are, are boats that travel up and down the Nile. This is, again, three or four years before Kemet came into existence. Here's a facade of stone of, of the building that the, the ruler presides in. So I'm just trying to show you all of these concepts were in existence before Kemet. So Kemet inherited this from their Nubian black brothers from up south. So many times you'll always put, I always put Kemet and Kush together. European Egyptologists try to make me that the Nubians were the enemies of ancient Kemet. They'll show you uh, Tet Ak Amel with some Nubians underneath his foot. He didn't show you that on the other foot, he had some Asiatics and Europeans underneath him. <laughs> he was saying he was ruling everybody. He wasn't just picking on blacks, but they only showed you the black one underneath the foot. Wow. Archaeological finds such as the custom incident burner affirms the cultural continuity between Kemet and Kosh. Cultural continuity, that's from the south to the north. When we begin to talk about civilization, there are six things we have to talk about. One, a written language. 
Number two, a sophisticated plan architecture structure. Three, plan cities, not just a village. Number four, a functional calendar and organization of time and space. Number five, an organized economy with planned agricultural and animal domestication. And number six, a defense system to protect what you develop. That was done in ancient Kemet, ancient Kush, a thousand years after the last great flood. So the last great flood took place about 10,000 years ago. So 1,000 years after, and let me just say something, the last great flood decimated about 90% of the world's population. Africa was affected the least because the whole African continent is a plateau. The whole continent is above sea level. So if the water rises 500 feet and you're in an island, that's all folks, it's over. If you live along the coast, which most people live along the coast, and the water rises 500 feet, it's a wrap. And you ain't got time to pack. <laughs> okay, so tsunami comes, and, and it's over. It's over. It's, it's tidal waves, it's over. Earthquake, everything, okay? 90% of the population. So before the Great Flood, Africans did not write down their stuff. They had symbols and stuff, but they didn't write down. After the Great Flood, they realized that since they lost so much that they need to record so that when the next catastrophe happened, records would be left. How many people heard the expression, writing is on the wall? It's still on the wall, waiting for you to read it. <laughs> but you got to learn to do it. I hope this clarifies the confusion around civilization. Culture is not necessarily civilization. The first humanoids had culture. So did Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Even cavemen, the Amu, have culture. Modern humans have been around for over 500,000 years or more, originating here in Africa, as in all other stages did. Um, Dia did some fantastic work. He showed that all humanoids can be broken into six categories. There were six phases of the human development. We are the last, Homo sapiens sapiens is the last stage. But for all six are on the African continent. Only two in Europe or Asia or North America. Only two. And that's the last two phases. So you have uh, the only stages in Europe would have been Neanderthal and then what they call the Peking Man. Mm -hmm. The ancient Chinese tried to do a survey to show that they belonged to Peking Man and not anybody else, that they were separate. And they took 100,000 samples throughout all of China. All Chinese DNA is led to Africa. Mm. Okay. Europeans are the only one that has Neanderthal. If you take a test and you got Neanderthal, it means probably you got an ancestor that got raped or something of that nature from Europe. Okay. But Europeans are the only ones that have Neanderthal in them. Neanderthal did not survive in Africa. He moved out of Africa and died out on the African continent and survived in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, the Neanderthal is a different being. Neanderthal lived through two ice ages. Imagine temperatures being five times colder than your coldest winter. Neanderthal survived that. But when the European came on the scene, they vanished just like that. They didn't just die off. Neanderthal was killed off. I don't know why there's so much superstition in archaeology about dun, dun, dun. what happened to Neanderthal. We know what happened. Y'all killed them. What happened to the Australians? What happened to the Tasmanians? You don't need no theme music. <laughs> There's a group of people who exterminated. Okay, so Neanderthal got exterminated. That's what really happened. So I'm going to cut that. That's not an hour presentation. That's a one minute thing. <laughs> Europeans came on the scene and killed every Neanderthal they could find, but they had sex with it. Now, if they had sex with cattle and horses, they had no problem humping on the Neanderthal. Now, this is a timeline. People, if you teach history, if you're in charge of anybody's education, you need to be teaching with a timeline because you have to put things in spatial perspective. Now, this is basically a 4,000-year timeline, and the Greeks and the Romans haven't come on the chart yet. Did y'all get what I said? The Greeks and the Romans didn't come on the chart yet. So 
we built pyramids, we built monuments, we had great civilizations, we had mathematics, science, and even here, Tahaka, this is the fourth golden age. This is approximately 690. Now, uh, 6, 600, 6, yeah, 690 BCE um, is when the Persians, the Assyrians conquered Egypt, and then the Persians conquered the Assyrians. This is towards the end of the Kemetic War. And they had to rule for about four or five hundred years. And then finally, the Greeks came in and defeated the, the, the Persians. Because the Persian Empire was the biggest during that time. If you go back 500 BCE, the Persian Empire grew. And the Persians, when they came to your village, they would send a messenger. And it would say, bow to the Persian Empire, or we will leave your city in ashes. You have a choice. We'll come back in 24 hours. And, and we want some booty. Leave us about a million dollars out here. Go on. <laughs> If you didn't do that, they would come in, they raped the men, the women, the children, the dogs, scorch the city, burn everything down and kill everybody. So what, all they had to do that was a couple of times. When they came to your village, it was like, what y'all want? What y'all want? You know? <laughs> you know, you got the stuff already waiting. So that's how Persia ruled. And Persia, let me just say this. I, have to, I don't want to lay claim, but the Persian Empire initially was wrong. But they had some compassion. If you submit, all you had to do was submit to the will of Persia, pay them taxes quarterly, and they would let you run your own city. You, you the mayor, you can remain the mayor. You just, you know, you gotta tighten me up every quarter, right, that's all. And they would let you stay. And then they would say, okay, I need a thousand of your breast warriors, and we're gonna annex them into the Persian Empire. But if something happened to y'all, we'll come back and protect y'all. Because now you're under our protection. That's how the Persian Empire kind of operated. So the Persian Empire wasn't one group of people. Like when you had the Greeks, it was basically just Greeks and Macedonians. Okay? The Persian Empire was all types of ethnic groups together. And they kind of had their autonomy, but they all worked for the Persian Empire. Okay? But they kind of had so the Persians were able to stay on top for about five or six hundred years because of that type of philosophy. They let you keep your autonomy as long as you bow down to the Persian king and pay them taxes. So Alexander was able to conquer that. Um, and that brought an end to that era. So again, I want you to see the timeline. When we were building the Step Pyramids, 1600 BCE, that's older than the Albanek, the Albanek heads, that's older, that's older than the Persian Shang Dynasty. The Japanese haven't got to Japan yet. So I'm trying to show you on the timeline you need to be able to. We, uh, in January, we'll have this for sale, but we redid, we redid it and brought it up to the bottom of this hand. And I use it in the university. All right, let me just real quickly talk about this. I took people to the Metropolitan Museum. We walk into the Egyptian wing, and there's a map to the side that says, pre-dynastic, the old kingdom, the ancient kingdom. Every name on the list, first of all, it's upside down. The second of all, not only is it upside down, every name on it is Greek and Arabic. Wow. It's the old period, there was no Greek and no Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to let you know when you walk into the museum, you're not going to be educated, I'm going to continue the indoctrination that I got you in the third grade. So what I did here, no Cairo, the ancient name is Iwinu. No Giza, the ancient name is Aket and Khufu. No Memphis, is Ineb Hed, Het Kapita. No Saqqara, Men Nefer. No Abydos, Abdu. No Dendra, he went. No Karnak, he put Iset. No Luxar, he put, uh, he put, I mean, Waset, he put Reset. No Valley of the Kings, Nefer, Her, and Nebes. No Esna, Tasana. No Edfu, Baget. No Kahumbo, Nebget, no Aswan, Abu, no Phile, Per in Aset, no Abu Simbo, the Jew M. Ha. We know these names, it's written in the Madu Netcher, but we put some Toby names up there that has nothing to do with the cities and the people. So therefore, you can't even unearth the miracles or unearth the power that that city has to offer. You can't even go into antiquity because you're using a colonized Toby name to even talk about it. Because in each name, like hedge, that means the white wall. 
of Pekka the temple of the spirit of Pata, the creative craftsman. So each name has essence to it. The African Kemetic Prescribed. This is the prototype to prescribes all around the planet Earth. These are brothers from the second golden age on the Minchu Hotel. The Shaolin monk, the Tibetan priest, the Buddhist priest, all of them are imitating what was in ancient China. And I can show you the ancient Kemetic pictures 3,000 years before they came into existence so you can see which one came first. All of these principles are divided into celestial, trilestial, and duet. Celestial means heaven. So you have like Ra in the heavens. You have uh, Spadet. You have uh, Ma'at, the, the heavens of the creations. You have Jehuti, articulate thought, the creator. You have Amen. Now I heard the people in, in the church said Amen. And they knew that they were praying to a black veteran. I don't know if they would have did that. There's the top, there's Jehuti. These are celestial. These are responsible for creation. Then you have terrestrial, that's earth. So then you have Asar, you have Aset, the great mother. Here's the Trinity. Asar, Aset, and Baru. That's where the Trinity comes from. In fact, in ancient Kemet, Trinities go back even before Kemet came into existence. You had Kanu, Anuket, Setet. Kanu was the mother. He created people from the black mud of the earth. You sound familiar, that? that's in the Quran, that's in the Christian Bible, straight from here. So I'm trying to show you the origins. Then you got Ptah, the creative spark of the universe. Every cell with a device gives off a spark of life. That's Ptah, okay? It's responsible for all life. Then you have Ra. Ra is not the sun. Ra is the energy that allows lights to emanate from the sun. All right, so we're just trying to get you, you know, an idea. We put things in proper perspective. So all of these concepts, uh, then you have Haru, then you have Enpu, you have Set. These are trilestral. This on, on Earth. That's Earthbound. Then we have something called the Duat, Duat Nature. These are natural rooms that don't exist on Earth or in Heaven, but they exist in a space in between. I believe so the Christians have something purgatory. I don't know where that's, that's somewhere in between a waiting place or something. I don't know what that is. But anyhow, the duet. This is where your soul gets judged. So I know in King James, you can have, you could have been a, a rapist, a fornicator, a pedophile for 80 years. And on your dying bed, all you got to say is, I repent and I accept Jesus, and you're supposed to go to <laughs> Now, that don't make no sense. You are responsible for your actions. That's what ancient Kevin said. There's a scale here. There's a scale. And the scale says, have you been a righteous person? Is your heart right with the feather? This is symbolism. Okay, the feather, an ostrich feather, if you ball it into a knot and let it go, it springs right back. Symmetrically perfect. So that's why they use the feather of the ostrich. Again, the interior of Africa. Okay, the interior of Africa. It's feather tree. So if your heart is heavy, that means that you got a whole lot of stuff weighing you down. Okay? And so this guy is making one. He's called Amamet, the devourer. And he devours souls. Now this is all spiritual. So you never saw a foot sticking out of his mouth or nothing. Okay? Because this is all this is the soul. This is the spirit. And it means the soul gets devoured. Amamet lets you out again, and maybe you try it again. But you don't get infinite tries. After a while, the creator says, okay, this person is not going to learn. We're just going to use his energy in the universe. How many? How many? Oh, I didn't give you. I don't, I don't know if there's a magical number. Usually, it's seven levels of heaven, seven days, so you might get, you know, seven reincarnations. But watch this, y'all. This is a judgment scene. Everybody's using this. Info, the guardian. This is a new This is the deceased person. He's being led to the judgment scales of my eye. Jehuti has recorded your whole life. So here are the judges. And the judge says, have you stolen? And you say, Jehuti, I have not stolen. And he said, how about your grandmother's cookies in the fifth grade? I got a record right here. In fact, here's the picture with the cookie juice all around your face. And you say, okay, 
I did take my grandmother's cookies, but when she had no teeth, I chewed her food. <laughs> I carried her, I carried her when she had no legs. And so then Jeruti would say, okay, that's called reciprocity. That balance is out. I excuse you from the cookies. <laughs> so you keep moving. It doesn't mean you have never done no wrong. It means was there reciprocity for the wrong things that you have done? Okay. If you pass that, all these judges is waiting on you. Now they got Jabuti got the record, so you can't you can't lie to him. Okay. If you pass that test, then Haru brings you to his father. This is why in their books it says the only way to the kingdom of heaven, or to God, is through the what? Father. Son. Through the son. The only way to my father is through the son. Haru is the son of Hassan. So all of them are getting their stuff right here. This is 6,000 BCE, 4,000 years before JC, 3,000 years before the 16, I'm gonna bring some books next week, called the 16 Crucified Saviors Before Christ. That's 16 different people that did the same thing Jesus Christ did before him. It's a blueprint that you're getting from ancient Kemet. And then I'm gonna bring Stone of Legacy here so you can see every Greek philosopher, where they went to school in Kemet, where they get the information. So that's continuation of this. Asar is depicted green, but he's called the Great Black because we understood the mineral domain, the plant domain, and the human domain. Carbon is to the mineral domain as chlorophyll is to the plant domain as melanin is to the human domain. Mm. Y'all got that? Uh, sunlight is reflected into food through the, through the chlorophyll. All energy in the mineral domain is converted into another substance. All, watch this here, all minerals on the planet is only in three divisions. So we make this simple. It's either a truce, meaning it comes straight out of volcanic or lava, or it's sediment. That means that once it comes out of lava, then it settles and amalgamates and connects with something else in the sediment, or it's metamorphic, where two or three elements combine with another element to become a third element. So all minerals are in one of those categories. Then the next thing you have to learn is colorology. Imagine when you were teaching your children that you said, this color is red, and red represents your lower chakra center. It represents passion, fire, energy. So now the kid says, red, passion, Fire, energy. So you understand that. Red represents my lower chakra. Kids can handle this. Five-year-olds can handle this. This is green. It's your heart chakra. It's for healing. It penetrates life throughout the whole body, just like chlorophyll in the plant. Yes, green represents my heart. Kids understand that. This is purple, the highest spiritual level. Purple rises your vibration, helps you in the fourth and fifth dimension. Purple is the highest octave that the human eye can see. Little kids, yes, the high priest wears purple. I'm raising my elevation. Give me a purple stone. I'm coloring purple. Y'all understand how this? But we're not in, in charge of our education. So we say, this is red, memorize that. This is green, memorize that. This is orange, memorize that. And there's no connection to the earth. No connection to the mineral, plant, or any domain. This is just a close up of the Sar, the great father, who art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right here. This is where they get he I mean, hell from. A pep is the enemy of rock. It shows that at night when the sun goes down, and when your life goes down, there's another world waiting on you. You have to be victorious in that world. And it's based upon how you prepared yourself in the world of light. You collect enough wisdom so that you can sustain yourself in the underworld. And so they have the Book of Gates. I saw, I'm just gonna make this real quick. In the book, you hear, Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. How many people heard that stanza before? Where did that come from? Here, ancient Kemet. 
This is the heka. A heka is the shepherd's staff. This is the inkaka. This is the inkaka. This is a, a wheat thrasher, grain thrasher. So the king, Asar, holds this, and every king in ancient Kemet, whether they were male, rulers, male or female, carried these symbols. Okay? So uh, if I give you a little light, the king is saying, I can guide you, and I can direct you. I can lead you. Then he's saying, I can feed you to the grain and the wheat. Right. But he's also saying, how many familiar with the Chinese nunchuck? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the nunchuck originally was? A grain thrasher. And the Chinese used it into a weapon. Here, we, that's what we did with this. So not only could I feed you, I can give you a royal spanking. <laughs> okay, so I can protect you. So the ruler is saying, I can feed you, guide you, and protect you. I don't know if Trump is saying that. Here's that symbol you see it in ancient Asar. Here you see it in Akin Aten. Here you see it in Hatim, a woman who ruled as the head of all of Kemet. And here you see it at Tut Ang I'm going to do, oh, okay, before I'm going to take a break, we're going to take a 15 minute break right here. Because uh, I'm going to go into the four golden ages that's going to set the tone for next week. So when I talk about the ancient Greeks and Romans, you see exactly where they're getting all their information from. So um, we're going to take 15 minutes. Do all. Again, I can say, Santi Sana, thank you very much for y'all staying and listening. I'm going to wrap this up in about half an hour. Now, I kind of gave you a little backdrop, so I want to go into what we call, you see, the Europeans have defined this. They created a character named Anatha and said he was the high priest of the Amid Temple during the time of the Ptolemies. When the Ptolemies, the Greeks, were controlling ancient Egypt, they wanted to understand the African people that they were dominating and ruling over. So, Manatho, they had closed all the temples and brought all the, the doctrines, all the, doc, all the documentation, the books, to one temple, the Temple of Amun. And Manatho was supposed to be the head of this temple. So they told Manatho to go to the archives and write the history of these African people we are controlling here in Kemet. We want to know it from the beginning up to now. And so Manapho broke ancient Kemet up into dynasties. A dynasty is a family rule. So it's not like a decade, 10 years, a millennium, a thousand, or a decade, or a century, a hundred, you know. Uh, a dynasty is a family rule. It could be 28 years, 152 years. It's a family rule or the same ideology. So he broke ancient Kemet up into 31 dynasties. But the people of Kemet didn't know nothing about it. This is after Kemet has fallen. Somebody goes back and rewrites the history and puts it into family groups. So that's what Egyptologists use. My teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, Asa Hilliard, and Dr. Jason Cruthers said, this is crazy. That's not how the ancient Kemet defined defined themselves. So they broke it into four golden ages. So that's the way I teach it. Four golden ages. The four golden ages is supposed to be the first six dynasties of ancient Kemet is the first golden age. Then there was the intermediate period where there was chaos, drought, government broke down. Then people reunited again and we start the second golden age. That's the so-called 11th dynasty. So that you follow with me. So if you read their books, 11, 12, and 13 is supposed to be the middle, what they call the middle kingdom. We don't use the word kingdom because then that means that how about the women? Kingdom is a racist, sexist terminology in itself. Yeah. So we say the second golden age. Very good. Okay. The third golden age is what they call the new kingdom. And that's the so-called 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st dynasty. But we call it the third golden age. But and the 17th dynasty, see, is obviously black coming from the south. So they try to put that as part of the intermediate period. Well, really, there's nothing to distinguish it. The ruler of the 18th dynasty is the son of the people in the 17th dynasty, so there's no change in family. But again, politically, they do what they want to do so they can try to separate from the blacks. 
So we have the third golden age. The fourth golden age, they leave out altogether. That's the so-called 25th dynasty. They try to say that that was foreigners. No, that's the Kushites from the south coming home to rule after it's been moved astray by the Libyans and other people. So that's just, it's like your grandchildren coming back to set your house straight. Okay, so that's the fourth golden age. So those are the four golden ages. And then you have foreigners, you have the Assyrians, then you have the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then you're going to have the Turks in 640, the Arabs come in and sack Egypt in 640, and that's the beginning of Islamic history. There's no ancient Arabic history. The Sufi is created in 640. After they sacked the temples in Kemet, they translated everything from Arabic, I mean from Medunetje, um, into Arabic. So that's the beginning of the Greek. There's no Quran when they, after that, all of a sudden there's a Quran. They claim they found some books in a cave. Okay, all right. But all of it's based on ancient Kemet. The Moors, you don't hear anything about the Moors until this time. So the Africans who were converted to Islam become the Moors, who travel into Spain bringing civilization. Okay. After the Roman Empire fell, and I'm going to go into great detail next week, when the Roman Empire fell around 465, the Vandals from, from Europe just came in and just tore up and wrecked everything. That's why today when you tear stuff up, they say it's what? Vandalism. Right. And they just went berserk on people because the people from Russia then were berserks. And when they just tear people and kill for no reason at all, they say you went berserk. Well, these are names of European countries, nations, and people, the berserks, the Vandals. So we use it today. Symptomatically, I'm trying to connect you with the thoughts. We say the words and we don't connect them to a people. Okay, so I'm trying to make that connection so you understand. So they try to make you like you were tearing stuff up. We created the stuff. They tore it up. So the first golden age, like I said, is the beginning. This guy is Nama. He is the founder of the first golden age. Now, what does he look like to y'all? Does he look of African descent? He comes from the Sudan. Okay, so he is the founder. They'll try to tell you that the only black rulers in ancient Kemet was the 25th dynasty. That's ridiculous, okay? So, he is the founder. He sets up the first golden age. This is the normal power. And he's wearing the white crown. Remember the white crown? Excuse me. Remember the white crown all the way up here before Kemet came into existence. So he is normal wearing the white crown, the same white crown that his ancestors, three, four hundred years before Kemet. Then he's wearing the red crown as he conquered the people from the north. In the north, during the intermediate period, we have a group of people called the Hyksos. Hyksos simply means foreign rulers. Asiatics, they were the Asiatics that came in. Later, it be the Syrians and the Persians, but they came in. And people were kind of connected to the Jews, European Jews. They conquered those people, kicked them out of Africa, and reunited them up in the north. Every ruler shows himself doing this. It's a base of his hand, beating his enemy, smashing his enemies. Was no turn of the cheek. They didn't say we shall overcome. There was no kumbaya. They came in and they took care of business and united the nation. This is called Polaro Stone. This is a record of all the kings, so we know the names of all the rulers, male and female. This Nusufit. Is the ruler's name, meaning ruler from the south and a ruler from the north. The north was where the bees, beehives, and the honey was. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. And then in the south was the soup plant. Mm -hmm. And so that was simple. When I said the name was Neti, Neti is the two ladies, that's Nekafet and Wajet, which also represents upper and lower kibble. Yes, sir. Uh, you said the soup plant? Soup. The soup plant. Yeah, S W. Yes. yes. The soup plant was food. It was used to make rope. It was it was uh, it was used for about ten baskets, everything like that. It was nutritious, so that was symbolic of the South. So that's why. Also, the soup plant was it was considered a symbol of divinity mm. because it came from the South in the land of their ancestors, mm -hmm. the interior of Africa. So I'm trying to show you symptomatically where this is coming from. 
So this is why people want to say the Pharaoh. They don't want to connect you to the interior and the history and the culture of the people. We are the first people to domesticate honey and sell it around the world, import, export. And just about every time, they had barges of honey where they could control the, the bees' diet and they would just have, you know, honey made just from the maple. Honey just made from, you know, the blueberries. Honey just from this, right? But well, that's an ancient pepper. So this is the first golden age. This guy over here is Pepe. Um, it's Pepe 1 and 2, actually Pepe Minkara and Pepe Makara. Before the first dynasty, Egypt was uh, fact two lands. According to folk tales, Menace, that's the person I just showed you, also his name is Narma, the first mortal king after the rule of the Netsharu. United these two lands. But at the end of the first dynasty, there appeared to be a survival between the two. So we have the names Nong, Aha, Bajar, Bajet, Din, Abnebju, Semerket. So we know their names of all the rulers of the so called first dynasty. When this was taking place, there's no other nation state recorded mm. on the planet Earth. Mm. Wow. Mm. No other nation state recorded on the planet Earth. Mm. Okay, so I just need to just make that clear. If you went throughout Asia, there was no Persia yet. There was no Sumer. Sum Sumer, Sumer is one of the first Asian countries. That's not, because those are the same people, Kush. People will argue that the cuneiform is older or rather the Madhu Netcha. But what I want to let you know is both of them were black folks. Both of them came from Kush. The people who created the cuneiform and the people who created the Madhu Netcha. So I just want you, it's like twiggly be, twiggly go. But the Madhu Netcha is a little older, okay? And the cuneiform is only abstract. The Madhu Netcha is a language of nature. So remember I said you need to know about the mineral domain, the plant domain, the animal domain, then the human domain, then the spirit domain. Yeah. And we are ignorant. I told you how ignorant we are of the mineral domain. Yeah. We don't understand the plant domain. We understand that that's the food that lives off of the minerals. Mm -hmm. And then the animal domain. Animals were not put here for us to eat. Yeah. And they were here before we were. All the animals were here before you eat. You need to understand that. They're not supposed to be our pets. They're not supposed to be enslaved by us. You don't want nobody carrying you around on the leash. Okay, so, and when you create the extension of an animal, you offset the ecosystem of the planet. Wow. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. When you make an animal extinct, no more, they had a function in a particular territory, in a land. So when you erase that, you offset the ecosystem. Yes. Wow. Yeah. When you cut down the rainforest, you decimate millions of animals, creating them extinct. So you're changing the whole atmosphere of the planet. In ancient Kevin, if you cut down a tree, you make the plant fire. Mm. Because maybe two might not exist. Might that make it? Okay. So it was important. You need to be one with your environment. That was important. Uh, the sec the so-called, uh, that was the end of the first dynasty. At the end of the second dynasty, we had a rivalry between the Haru, the Mishemsu Haru, the followers of Haru, the great falcon, and the followers of Set. So there was a battle. So the first rulers were Haru. Then there was a battle, and Set took over. These guys got Set at the end of their name. Set at the end of their name. House of Kimberly at the end wasn't taking any chances. He put Peru and Set on his crown. <laughs> <laughs> These are the people, and I need you to see the people. See, this is why this is so important. That's the founder of the so called Third Dynasty. Look at that brother. He looks like the guy in KRS1. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't he look just like that? He looks just like that, right? Look at this brother. And he's got big jumbo lines. It's really dangerous. This is not to contradict what he's doing. But you don't need education. You don't need all this. Other. All you need is Jesus. No. <laughs> you have to prepare yourself. We tell people you need to 
have a degree of mastery of five domains. And the first domain is the mineral domain. The planet is a mineral. The sun is a mineral. The stars are mineral. And you are made up of stardust. You are a carbon-based unit. That's what you are. And you are ignorant of the mineral domain. And if we just take the earth mineral, if I take the topography of the earth, you are ignorant of that. The very planet that you, that's housing you. We don't know nothing about topography. We look at the continent we come from. What percentage is, it's only four main terrains. You have rainforest, savanna, grassland, you have Sahil, shrubs, semi-dry, and then you got desert. That's it. Most people think that Africa is a jungle. There's more trees in New York than there is percentage of any place in Africa except for the Congo. Did y'all hear me? But they got you thinking you come from the jungle. There were more trees in Europe than there ever was in Africa. It's up saying don't shoot, marching, singing. Maybe it's time for us <laughs> to go back to our ancient form of spirituality. Okay. So just keep that in the back of your head. Breathe in gratitude, breathe out love, reflect kindness to all. This is a reflection. This is what your church looks like. Whoever controls the minds of our children controls our future. We, been, we begin to awaken the very moment you realize one fact. You are creating your own reality through the energy of your consciousness. Don't put all your apples in somebody else's face. Don't say no matter what you do, some other entity can save you. The creator sent you to save yourself. There's guides around here that can help guide you when you appear to be lost and you take counsel, but even I'm a doctor of naturopath holistic security. I can't save nobody. The only thing I can do is give you some advice and try to create the conditions so that you can save yourself. But in the final analysis, who has to do it? You. Heal thyself. You are the only person that can heal you. Other people can aid and guide you, but you. Now I'm going to say something else that's going to sound crazy, but just bear with me. You have the right to be crazy. You do. When Netra gave you, and the word was with you, you are that. You can speak. The other one was think, to think things into existence. The other one was to it masturbate it. That's procreation to bring things into existence. The other one, he spit forth creation, coming from the inner, your inner heart, your inner loins. Okay, those, so they're to use that. Almost every religion is going to use one of those, uh, how things came into existence. This is an uh, incense burner from uh, Castile, which is an ancient Nubia, ancient Kush, Sudan today. What I want you to show you here, what's powerful here, this is a burner, now they got 3800, but it's literally about 4200, 4400 BCE. But what's important here is that this existed before ancient Kemet came into existence. So you heard me earlier say that Kemet was the mouthpiece of the African continent. So now, that's just a statement. So now let me speak it into existence and show you. This incident burner was found in Castile, which is in present-day Sudan. Before Narma united upper and lower Kemet into a nation state. Here is the ruler sitting on his throne, on his square, wearing the white crown. This is 400 years before Kemet comes into existence. There is Haru, Shimsu Haru, the great falcon, on top of the Sarek, that's on top of the White House. There's the seven-pointed star, which is Sirius A, the brightest star in the sky. We are already doing astronomy, which also represents Aset and Shashat. Here's the, uh, the great black line, which is the foundation of Haru M. Aketi. Haru M. Aketi that you see there, what they call the Sphinx, was an all-lion first. It was the black line. And then they put a priest's head on top of it, which was carved much later. So there it is here. 
Here are, are boats that travel up and down the Nile. This is, again, three or four years before Kemet came into existence. Here's a facade of stone of, of the building that the, the ruler presides in. So I'm just trying to show you all of these concepts were in existence before Kemet. So Kemet inherited this from their Nubian black brothers from up south. So many times you'll always put, I always put Kemet and Kush together. European Egyptologists try to make believe that the Nubians were the enemies of ancient Kemet. They'll show you uh, Tet Ak'amun with some Nubians underneath his foot. He didn't show you that on the other foot he had some Asiatics and Europeans underneath him. He was saying he was ruling everybody. He wasn't just picking on black ones. They only showed you the black one underneath the foot. Archaeological finds such as the Custo Incident Burner affirms the cultural continuity between Kemet and Kosh. Cultural continuity, yes? From the south to the north. When we begin to talk about civilization, there are six things we have to talk about. One, a written language. Number two, a sophisticated planned architectural structure. Three, planned cities, not just a village. Number four, a functional calendar and organization of time and space. Number five, an organized economy with planned agricultural and animal domestication. And number six, a defense system to protect what you develop. That was done in ancient Kemet, ancient Kush, a thousand years after the last great flood. So the last great flood took place about 10,000 years ago. So 1,000 years after, and let me just say something, the last great flood decimated about 90% of the world's population. Africa was affected the least because the whole African continent is a plateau. The whole continent is above sea level. So if the water rises 500 feet, and you in an island, that's all folks, it's over. If you live along the coast, which most people lived along the coast, and the water rises 500 feet, it's a wrap. And you ain't got time to pack. Okay, tsunami comes, and it's over. It's over, it's tidal waves, it's over. Earthquake, everything, okay? 90% of the population. So before the Great Flood, Africans did not write down their stuff. They had symbols and stuff, but they didn't write down. After the Great Flood, they realized that since they lost so much that they need to record so that when the next catastrophe happened, records would be left. How many people heard the expression, the writing is on the wall? It's still on the wall, waiting for you to read it. <laughs> but you got to learn to do much. I hope this clarifies the confusion around civilization. Culture is not necessarily civilization. The first humanoids had culture. So did Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Even cavemen, the Amu, have culture. Modern humans have been around for over 500,000 years or more, originating here in Africa, as in all other stages did. Um, Diop did some fantastic work, and he showed that all humanoids can be broken into six categories. There are six phases of the human development. We are the last, Homo sapiens sapiens is the last stage. But for all six, or on the African continent. Only two in Europe or Asia or in charge of anybody's education, you need to be teaching with a timeline because you have to put things in spatial perspective. Now, this is basically a 4,000 year timeline, and the Greeks and the Romans haven't come on the chart yet. Did I hear what I said? The Greeks and the Romans didn't come on the chart yet. So we built pyramids, we built monuments, we had great civilizations, we write mathematics, science, and even here, Tahaka, this is the fourth golden age. This is approximately 690. Now, do, uh, six, about 600, six, yeah, 690 BCE um, is when the Persians, the Assyrians conquered Egypt, and then the Persians conquered the Assyrians. This is towards the end of the Kemetic rule. And they had to rule for about four or five hundred years. And then finally, the Greeks have and write the history of these African people we are controlling here in Kemet. We want to know it from the beginning up to now. And so Manapho broke ancient Kemet up into dynasties. A dynasty is a family rule. 
So it's not like a decade, 10 years, a millennium, a thousand, or a decade, or a century, a hundred, you know. Uh, a dynasty is a family rule. It could be 28 years, 152 years. It's a family rule or the same ideology. So he broke ancient Kemet up into 31 dynasties. But the people of Kemet didn't know nothing about it. This is after Kemet has fallen. Somebody goes back and rewrites the history and puts them into family groupings. So that's what Egyptologists use. My teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, Asa Hilliard, Dr. Jason Crowther said, this is crazy. That's not how the ancient Kemet to U defined themselves. So they broke it into four golden ages. So that's the way I teach it. Four golden ages. The four golden ages is supposed to be the first six dynasties of ancient Kemet is the first golden age. Then there was the intermediate period where it was chaos, drought, government broke down. Then people reunited again, and we start the second golden age. That's the so-called 11th dynasty, so that you follow with me. So if you read their books, 11, 12, and 13 is supposed to be the middle, what they call the middle kingdom. We don't use the word kingdom because then that means, that how about the women? Kingdom is a racist, sexist terminology in itself. So we say the second golden age. Okay. The third golden age is what they call the new kingdom. And that's the so-called 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st dynasty. But we call it the third golden age. And the 17th dynasty, see, is obviously black coming from the south. So they try to put that as part of the intermediate period. But when there's nothing to distinguishing, the ruler of the 18th dynasty is the son of the people in the 17th dynasty. So there's no change in family. But again, politically, they do what they want to do so they can try to separate from the blacks. So we have the third golden age. The fourth golden age, they leave out altogether. That's the so-called 25th dynasty. They try to say that that was foreigners. No, that's the Kushites from the south coming home to rule after it's been moved astray by the Libyans and other people. So that's just, it's like your grandchildren coming back to set your house straight, okay? So that's the fourth golden age. So those are the four golden ages, and then you have foreigners, you have the Assyrians, then you have the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then you have the Turks in 640, the Arabs come in and sack Egypt in 640 from uh, Medunetje into Arabic. So that's the beginning of the Greek. There's no Quran when they, after that, all of a sudden there's a Quran. They claim they found some books in a cave. Okay, all right. But all of it's based on ancient Kemet. The Moors, you don't hear anything about the Moors until this time. So the Africans who were converted to Islam become the Moors who traveled into Spain bringing civilization. Okay. After the Roman Empire fell, and I'm going to go into great detail next week, when the Roman Empire fell around 465, the Vandals from, from Europe just came in and just tore up and wrecked everything. That's why today when you tear stuff up, they say it's what? Vandalism. Right. And they just went berserk on people because the people from Russia then were berserks. And when they just tear people and kill for no reason at all, they say you went berserk. Well, these are names of European countries, nations, and people, the berserks, the vandals. So we use it today, symptomatically, I'm trying to connect you with the thoughts. We say the words and we don't connect them to a people. Okay, so I'm trying to make that connection so you understand. So they try to make me like you were tearing stuff up. We created the stuff, they tore it up. Okay. So the first golden age, like I said, is beginning. This guy is nominal. He is the founder of the first golden age. Now, what does he look like to y'all? Does he look of African descent? He come from the Sudan. Okay, so he is the founder. They'll try to tell you that the only black rulers in ancient Kemet was the 25th dynasty. That's ridiculous, okay? So, he is the founder. He sets up the first golden age. This is the normal palette. And he's wearing the white crown. Remember the white crown? Remember the white crown all the way up here before Kemet came into existence. So here's Norma wearing the white crown, same white crown that his ancestors three, four hundred years before Kemet. Then he's wearing the red crown as he conquered the people from the north. In the north, during the intermediate period, we have a group of people called the Hyksos. Hyksos simply means foreign 
rulers. Asiatics, they were the Asiatics that came in. Later would be the Syrians and the Persians, but they came in. Was no turn the other cheek? They didn't sing, we shall overcome. It was no come by y'all. They came in and they took care of business and united the nation. This is called a collateral stone. This is a record of all the kings, so we know the names of all the rulers, male and female. This Mesutmiti is the ruler's name, meaning ruler from the south and a ruler from the north. The north was where the bees, beehives, and the honey was, right? And then in the south was the soup plant. And so that was the symbol. When I said the name was Nepti, Nepti is the two ladies, that's Nekabet and Wajet, which also represents upper and lower kingdom. That's it. You said the soup plant? The soup, the soup plant. Yeah, S-W. The soup plant was a food. It was used to make rope. It was, it was, uh, it was used for about 10 baskets. Everything like that, it was nutritious. So that was symbolic of the South, so that's why. Also, the soup plant was, was considered a symbol of divinity because it came from the South in the land of their ancestors, the interior of Africa. So I'm trying to show you symptomatically where this is coming from. So this is why people want to say the family. They don't want to connect you to the interior and the history and the culture of the people. We are the first people to domesticate honey and sell it around the world, import, export. And just about every time, they had barges of honey where they could control the, the bees' diet and they would just have, you know, honey made just from maple, honey just made from, you know, the blueberries, honey just from this, right? So that's an ancient pepper. So this is the first golden age, this cow over here is Pepe. Um, it's Pepe 1 and 2, actually Pepe Nimkara and Pepe Maka. Before the first dynasty, Egypt was uh, fat two lands. According to folk tales, Menace, that's the first I just showed you, also his name was Narma, the first mortal king, after the rule of the Neturu, united these two lands. But at the end of the first dynasty, there appeared to be some rival between the two. So we have the names, Narma, Aha, Bajar, Bajet, Din, Abnedju, Semerket, so we know their names of all the rulers of the so-called First Dynasty. When this was taking place, <clears throat> there's no other nation state recorded mm. on the planet Earth. Mm. Wow. Mm. No other nation state recorded on the planet Earth. Mm. Okay, so I just need to just make that clear. If you went throughout Asia, there was no Persia yet. There was no Sumer. Sum Sumer, Sumer is one of the first Asian countries. That's not because those are the same people, Kush. People will argue that the cuneiform is older or rather the Madunetra. But what I want to let you know is both of them were black people. Mm -hmm. wow. Both of them came from Kush. Mm -hmm. The people who created cuneiform and the people who created the Madunetra. So I just want you, it's like Tweedly D, Tweedly Do. But the Madunetra is a little older, okay? And the cuneiform is only abstract. The Madunetra is a language of nature. So remember I said you need to know about the mineral domain, the plant domain, the animal domain, then the human domain, then the right. spirit domain. Yeah. And we are ignorant, I told you how ignorant we are of the mineral domain. Yeah. We don't understand the plant domain, we understand that that's the food that lives off of the minerals. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the first dynasty. At the end of the second dynasty, we had a rivalry between the Haru, the Lishimsu Haru, the followers of Haru, the great falcon, and the followers of Set. Mm. So there was a battle. So the first rulers were Haru. Then there was a battle, and Set took over. These guys got Set at the end of their name. Set at the end of their name. Kasim Kimbi at the end wasn't taking any chances. He put Haru and Set on his crown. <laughs> <laughs> These are the people, I, I need you to see the people. See, this is why this is so important. That's the founder of the so-called Third Dynasty. Look at that brother. He looks like the guy in KRS-1. <laughs> Does he look just like that? He looks just like that, right? Look at this brother. And he's got big jumbo locks. 
This is before Rastafarians or anybody. Now, he's the king. He's wearing serious locks. And his, you can still see the chocolate on his skin. Every melanated dark color. No, they tried to cut his nose off, but it's all over the place. This is him also. So this is naturally cut, or they call the Zosa. The step pyramid was built for him. This is Imhotep, the first multi-level genius. These are all African people who were proud to be African. They picked themselves black. This is Imhotep's mom with locks. She was a physician. She was also born to a royal family. She was not only a physician, um, she was a divine healer, a herbalist, and a scrap. So Imhotep, the multi-level genius, his mom and pops was a genius, okay? His father was an architect. <clears throat> this is Pepe again. He is the, one of the last rulers. Here is uh, his, this is um, Unas' temple. This is where the pyramid text comes from. Okay. Imhotep, the first recorded multi-genius. <laughs> Third dynasty is still first golden age. He's an architect, an astronomer, a physician, and was known later as Ascalaphus, the god of medicine of the Greeks. So the first so-called, they were worshiping Imhotep, the Greeks, as their god of medicine, and they called his name Ascalaphus. So I'm just trying to show you the origins of all of this. We're still in the first golden age. Sinneferu. This is Sinneferu. This is his name. Sinneferu means one who causes beauty. This is his son, Khufu. The Great Pyramid was built for him. This is his son, Min Kara. The second Great Pyramid was built for him. And this is his grandson, Ka'afra. The third Great Pyramid was built for him. So we just let you know, it's like a family rule. And here is Sinneferu destroying his enemies. Again. And inside of his shin, he got all his titles. Look at here. Nasuk Viti, Nebti, Nekabed Waje, Neb Ma'at, Haru Nubu, Sinneferu. So he's saying, I'm the ruler of Upper and Lower Kemet, Master of the Two Ladies, Protector of the Two Ladies, Nekabed and Waje. I'm Master of Ma'at. Truth, justice, righteous, harmonious balance, and I am one who causes you. So all that's in his name. These are the texts that if you learn in the do lecture, you should learn, you should try to get your hands on. The Mirku Sabia. That's the so-called pyramid text. This is the inside of a pyramid. The text is on the walls, on the ceiling, and everywhere. You can still go see it today. See, this is not mythology, something we just made up. It's not some superstition. I can take you to Kemet, and I can take you right inside, and you can see this today. And we can read it right off the walls. You don't want to take anybody else's word for it. So that's where the vehicle. This is about writings that existed 8,000 and 10,000 BCE. Then we have the Karas Sebiya. That's called the coffin text. On side of every karas or coffin, they would have sacred prayers and hymns. So somebody collected all of them and put them back in a book. And so they, today they call it the coffin text, but it was the karas sabia. Then you have the Pert in Peru. The Pert in Peru is what they call the Book of the Dead. But it's really the Book of Life, the Book of Coming Forth by Life. So when somebody else has named their stuff, you see what happened? Book of Dead as opposed to the Book of Coming Forth by Life, so I can live forever. Very good. Then you have the Shabaka stone, which is this is part of the Shabaka stone. Today it's being held hostage in the British Museum. And Shabaka is the fourth golden age, rewrote the worm eaten texts and stuff that had been destroyed, rewrote it so that his people can read the ancient words. Uh, and then you have the Yango stone, that's here. This is also during the time of Imhotep where they're writing about how to solve the problem of, the, of uh, a drought and stuff like that. And in this text is where they get in the Bible the whole concept of uh, Joseph coming into Egypt, being the advisor, and, and then the seven-day famine, 
It's all in that text right there. They figured you would never learn to read it, so we only have to hide it. But I can take you right there and say, yeah, bro, I swung. And you can just come right up to it and read the text. Actually, we have a book by our advanced students. We retranslated it, and the book will come out like in January. So you can get a chance to read uh, what our ancestors did. Science has proven that the pyramids and other monuments of Kemet, ancient Egypt, were built not by the Hebrews or foreigners, nor by slaves. They were built by paid citizens during the farming off-season. Mm -hmm. Since many of the mentally challenged Negro humans only this is the present day Sudan. And so I want to make sure you'll have your opinion to politics say that Kemet is the child of the Nile, of Hapi Ipiru. But I want to make it clear that Kemet is the child of the African continent. And so the gift came from Western Africa, from the Sahara as it died, dried up. Africans moved down to the valley. Africans from South Africa were migrating and moving. Africans from East Africa, West Africa, and ancient Kemet was the depository of all this information because we wrote it in stone. So I wanted to be clear, it's not just the gift of the Nile, the Hapi Itiru was definitely the focusing point because of the water, the longest river in the world, over 4,160 miles long, okay? But I want to make sure that we understand that Kemet is the child of Kush or Kosh, and that it is the child of the African continent. It's like the mouthpiece of the African continent. It would be like Mpundishi speaking, and they was like, did you see his lips? His lips is what he was all about, forgetting the rest of my body and my mind and my consciousness. Well, that's the way Kemet was. So we got to put everything in a proper spatial perspective. <clears throat> you have to excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, last week, I showed you the proper spatial perspective of the world and specifically Africa, and that we've been looking at the world upside down, inside out, and backwards. The Hopi River flows down north from up south. South is the highland, flowing down. So I gave you a really good spatial perspective last week. So I'm kind of reviewing what we did. Kemet actually started its journey about 6,000 years ago. Well, actually 6,000 BCE, which is about 8,000 years ago. So today, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans who are veggie backing deep off of what was done in ancient Kemet, I need you to see the origin of what they, where their history comes from. Who were the original people there? Um, and how did they get this information? Because we have to understand that the Greeks and the Romans is the foundation of Western civilization. So really what we're trying to say here is that Africa, is the foundation of Western civilization. You, it won't get printed in any media, it won't get printed in any university, but technically that's what we are talking about. That Africa gave birth to civilization as we know it on the planet Earth since the last ice age. And I need to say that since the last ice age because that happened approximately 10,000 years ago. I'm saying to say that there were other civilizations that existed prior to the last ice age. But after the last ice age, maybe 85 to 90 percent of the world's population was decimated. So a lot of those great sages, great philosophers, great builders, you see uh, where the Bermuda Triangle is, there's pyramids under the water there. They didn't build the pyramids under the water. That means that the Earth's geographic shape was different. Off the coast of Portugal, there are pyramids, a pyramid just as big as Khufu's pyramid in Kemi. It wasn't built under the water. Okay, I'm just trying to let you know. Off the coast of Japan, there are pyramids that's underwater. All right, so I'm trying to show you places around the world where there were ancient civilizations that were destroyed. Now, one of the reasons why the ancient Kemet U began to write in the Madhu Netcha, the divine word, is because we had a very oracle civilization. Everything was passed on from teacher to student. And it was kept alive in songs and dance. 
But if the great musicians were all destroyed, some of the great priests were all destroyed, then people had to start all over again. So that's what's happening in this modern world that we're in now since the last ice age, is that civilization had to start all over again. And the ancient Kometa'u, as they began to amass this information, they wrote it in stone so that if there was ever another great catastrophe on the planet, that they would have written it in stone of who we were, who we are, and who are we to be. Okay, so that is clear. So that's what the Madhu Netra, I'm a, people know that I teach the Madhu Netra, it's our classical language of African people, and I think that it's extremely important that we grasp this language. You see, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans, their classical language is, wrong, is Latin, Latin and Greek. If we created Latin, we created, we taught the Greeks, and we don't know our stuff. So we can't go to their stuff to find us, because they're telling their story. That's why it's called history, his story. Whoever controls the situation defines the situation. So I need you, that to, I want that to stay in your head. Whoever controls the situation defines it. Now they define Rome as the greatest Western power ever. But what was Rome? It was tyranny. It was colonization. It was enslavement. It was homosexuality at its highest level. It was all of these things that we don't hold in high esteem. Did that make them the greatest nation in the world? We have to begin to classify. What is that? America is trying to imitate what Rome was doing. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of the Masonic Order brothers will say, if the Roman emperors were here today, they would be proud of America. Because it has its foot and its tentacles in everybody's business. It's colonizing, it's decimated all the people here in North America. It's enslavement, and now we're embracing uh, confused sexuality. Uh, just like Rome. So Rome would be actually proud of America right now. But I'm going to show you that that's nothing. You see, the Greeks and the Romans did not grasp the 42 oracles of Ma'at. In fact, morality was never even questioned or talked about in ancient Greece after they basically eliminated the indigenous people. Every place you go in the world, any records of ancient Kemetists says they are the most spiritual people on the planet. Everybody's record. There was no churches, no mosques, no temples, because everybody had their shrine in their home. So your place of worship was your home. Those temples were like universities and repositories of information. Okay, where etiquette and things of that nature was taught about your ancestors and how to keep it alive. And so there was no need to have a whole lot of churches. There was no need to have the comedic spiritual priest. It's not like a preacher today. I had a, a gentleman came up to me. He said, oh, Infugishi, man, you just like my preacher, man. You running it down. I said, how long have you been to that church? He said, 20 years. I said, can you do what your preacher does? He says, no. I said, well, he's not like me. Because right? if you was with me 20 years, you'd be running your own center, your own synagogue, your own temple. You would have your own university going. I'm proud to have students around the country who are running their own centers, running their own shrines. I don't want them to stay up under here. I want them to be able to fly. Falcon. That's what it's all about. Shemsu Haru, followers of the great Falcon. So I'm trying to set up where we were last year, I mean last week, so that we can move forward. Um, we got to the point where after the four golden ages of ancient Kemet, and let me go back, the first golden age is headed by Narma, or some people call it Mene. That's approximately 4240 BCE. That's 6,258 years ago. So I'm trying to put these dates because I had a timeline up yesterday, I mean last week, and um, today I have a timeline for the Greeks and the Romans. So uh, it's on a different tape, so I can't pull that one up, but I, mentally it's all in here. So the second golden age is Menchu Hotep, 
who I wrote a book about, who was a Magi, and this book is Minchu Hotep in the Spirit of the Magi. And that takes place about 2000 BCE. So that's approximately 4,000 years ago, Minchu Hotep set up the second golden age. The third golden age is by Amos, the son of Ketusheri, okay, who was the great African queen from Nubia, from ancient Kush. He defeated the enemy, kicked out the Hyksos, and started the glorious 17th, 18th dynasty. Now we're about 1500 BCE. This is still before. I'm at the third golden age. There are no Romans. There are no Greeks. The Japanese haven't gotten to the seven islands of Japan yet. There is no civilization in Western Africa. There is no civilization as we know of it on this high level in North America or South America. The Olmecs and the Aztecs haven't started things yet. So I'm trying to put things in a space of perspective. You see what's going on. We're at the third golden age, <coughs> almost 3,000 years, and the rest of the world is still asleep. Now we go into the fourth golden age. This happens around 725 in the, uh, still in BCE. And this is by the Kushites who, uh, chase the Libyans out and the foreigners and reunite ancient Kemet again, north and south. So we have Sahaka, um, Shabaka, these powerful brothers who came from ancient Kush and then they start the fourth golden age. And this fourth golden age is the last about a hundred years. And then the Persians finally come in and conquer them. You have the Assyrians, and then the Persians defeat the Assyrians. And that's about 625. Now, this is when the great philosophers in the world began to emerge. When Kemet, fourth golden age, comes to an end. So I need you, I know you people are not putting the research together, but I've done the research. Uh, Zen, Taoism. 600 BCE. The teachers from ancient Kush, when they were controlled, they left and spread their wisdom towards Asia. The Shang Dynasty, ancient China. The first two dynasties in China, the Shang One and Shang Two, done by Kushites, Africans. The first uh, shogun of Japan, a black man from ancient Kush. Okay, so I'm trying to put things in the proper perspective. Now you got the Davidians in India. Uh, you got all of this is happening as the fourth golden age of Kemet comes to a close, now the rest of the world is beginning. The Olmec head in South America, Mexico, all this is beginning to happen now that ancient Kemet has come is being controlled now by others. So a lot of these teachings left and are spreading the world. And you'll notice there's a common thread among all these spiritual teachings where they've taken from the 42 oracles of Ma'at, they've taken from Ma'at, the, the discipline and the philosophy, they're all biting hard on Jehuti, the wisdom teacher. In fact, if you go to Washington, D.C., or in the House of Congress on the door, it said all wisdom starts with Jehuti. And they show it right there on the wall. And they break it down. Then they go to the Asians, then they go to Socrates, and all of these people who I'm going to show today all studied in ancient Kemet. So, in order for us to get this information out, we're going to have to write the book. So that's why it's important. Uh, I'm proud to say that my book, Spiritual Warriors and Healers, is being used in over 24 universities uh, in Africana studies here in America and being used uh, in other parts of Africa. In Egypt, my book is banned, it's contraband. Now, my book is about ancient Kemet. But see, ancient Kemet has nothing to do with modern day Egypt, the Arabs. And so what happened in Egypt today, the Nubians are beginning to get consciousness. You see, Africans here in America, y'all don't know how powerful you are. When you begin to protest and stand up for your rights and demand a proper education and proper living, other people around the world are hearing that. South Africa's movement, Veggie backed off of the movement here. They marched and sang just like we did here. In my country, Tanzania, the same thing happened under Julius Nieri and them. They were echoing what was going on in America. As you know, the first president, um, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana in 1957, outside of Ethiopia, went to school here, came here to be a preacher. 
Dr. Clark and them got a hold of them and said, don't Africa got enough preachers? He joined the Harlem Book Club. Actually, it's a block away from where I live. And he went back to Ghana and started a, a revolution. But one thing Kwame Nkrumah said, he said, we can't celebrate the victory and the independence of Ghana if the rest of Africa is enslaved. Y'all understand that? So he wasn't just taking the glory for himself. He said, this means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. And that means we got to, what, break the shackles of neocolonialism. Because right now, that's where Africa is, in a state of neocolonialism. I'm building a school in a temple in Ghana. And you know, Ghana this year wants to introduce French as a mandatory language. Their, their national language is Ashanti tree. No schools are being taught in their native language. All education is taught in English, and now they want to introduce French. You're co so you still, the colonial master still got a loose around your neck. That means that the French print the book. You got to have new French teachers. You got to, you see, right now France would collapse without the money they get from Western African countries that they enslaved. Let me say it again so that you understand. France would be a third world country and would collapse without the money they get, the billions they get every year from West Africa. That's Senegal, Gambia, Cote d'Ivoire, all those countries there. They are financing France. So I just need you to get clear. We are a powerful people, people. you got to understand that, but we have to begin to take control of our own education. Think about this. Would the rabbit send his children off to Fox School to be educated on how to be good rabbits? No, they're probably going to end up as rabbits too. And if the rabbit gets a Nobel Peace Prize after all of that, then what did he actually get the prize for? You begin to ask, we got six African, seven, we got Nobel Peace Prize and there's no peace. So we have to begin to understand. We got to take control of the educational system from pre-K to Ph.D. You see, I sat on the council of, called CB, the Council of Independent Black Institutions, and we were raising kids from pre-K to 12. But then at the 12th grade, we sent them off to Wolf School. And we lost almost all of them. Because the Wolf recognized how bright these young men are. They give them, oh, listen, you can come and work to AT&T for 200000 You think he's coming back to the hood? No, I don't think so. So they know what to do. They know how to entice our young people, our young gifted minds. I'm forever reading the paper where some Nigerian gets scored off the chart in terms of SATs and all of that. That means he knows the European culture better than the European. But then they brag about going to an Ivy League school. They was accepted at all the Ivy League schools. They should be smacked. Because you're not going to benefit Africa now. You're going to these Ivy League schools, and obviously this information isn't going back to Nigeria to help develop a very corrupt country. All right, so we have to begin to think now. We got to stamp approve our young people. And the European Jews are using our model. This is not their model, they're using our model. If there's more than Six families, they have to open up a synagogue. If they have a synagogue, they have to open up a school. Not only that, the people who go to this have to be able to walk there. So that means it's in your community. If it's in your community, you have to control the stores in your community, and you only shop there. Do y'all see what's happening? Now, do we call that racism? No, they call it smart business. When you try to do it, it's racism. You faulty thinking, people. We are upside down, inside out, and backwards. We have to begin to look. We don't have neighborhoods. I mean, communities. We got neighborhoods. You don't even know the next door neighbor. In some cases, you don't want to know. Okay? So we have to begin the word Kim unity, black unity. Kim unity, the word Kim, black, black unity. And we are moving far away from that. So the more information we have, the better off we'll be, and the better we'll be able to control. So people, I do have a couple of decks here. I think I only brought four with me. 
It's the beginning alphabet on teaching yourself the Badu Lecture, our ancient classical language. Okay, we sell them at 35 today. They are 30. Uh, so like I said, I only have four decks with me. Uh, but, and I teach it from symptomatic thinking. Symptomatic means it is what it is. It's, if a black cat crosses right now, what are you thinking? Huh? You're thinking good luck. You're thinking, no, it means the black cat's going somewhere. We automatically assign all these other things. <clears throat> That's from mythology and superstition. African people are the most mythological and superstitious people on the planet. As long as we continue to think like that, we will continue to be controlled. No, the black cat probably going home. He's going to get something to eat. He's going somewhere. Has nothing to do with no luck. Has nothing to do with no witchcraft, no nothing. You see how we've been programmed. That's symbolic thought versus symptomatic. Let me say this. All religions are based upon symbolic thought. I don't even have to prove they exist. Just believe. I can't find nobody's body in the Bible. Not their bones, not their grave site. But when I talk about ancient Timber, you can go to Laura. I can show you their bones, their grave site, their temples, their work, their writings. That's symptomatic thought. That means it is what it is. It's, I don't mythologize about it. Let me make another statement. There's some, let me clear up the thing about ritual. Even most rituals, even the word ritual is a mythology. Symphony. For example, I saw the sister saving the room. Now some people say that's a ritual. I say no, it's not. That's a symptomal attitude about cleansing the air, about keeping good vibrations. Scientific proof shows that when sage is in the air, all harmful bacteria is destroyed. In fact, in that room, a week later, they still will not appear. It's a scientific study showing you. So it's symptomal. That's not some, so we're doing some good things and we call them ritual. The brother poured libation here. They said, oh, that's a ritual. No, that's a symptomal act of honoring our ancestors. Take that word out. We can't take the European's word and redefine it. I know we've done that. Oh, yeah, that's my living. You know, you're trying to make it sweet. No. <laughs> the word is what it is. Keep it in its proper context. Okay? So, um, with that done, I also bought only two copies but I bought the book Stolen Legacy because I'll be making reference to this. Uh, George D. M. James did a magnificent job. His job was done so well, he was killed as a result of this because he let secrets out from his order that wasn't supposed to necessarily come out. But his attitude was like mine. This is about educating the people. It's about empowering the people. So that's the step he made. He, the price of knowledge sometimes is death. Okay, and he was willing to take that. So George M. James, he basically takes every so-called Greek philosopher and tell you where they studied. They studied all in Africa, except at the feet of the temple, and then went back and became the first teachers in Europe. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to start. Before I go, though, is there any questions on what I covered last week? The four golden ages. The four golden ages of ancient temple. And let me just talk about the European Egyptologists break Egypt into 31 dynasties, done by Manasseh, who was supposed to be the high priest of ancient of the Amun Temple during the time of the Ptolemies, because the Ptolemies were Greeks and Macedonians who were ruling Egypt, and they wanted to know the history of the people they were ruling. And so Manasseh had access to all the books, and he was supposed to break down chemist history into family groupings. So a dynasty. It's not like a decade, not 10 years, not like a century, 100 years, not like a millennium, a 1,000 years. A dynasty is a family rule. So it could be 28 years, 57 years, 150 years. A family rule or the same ideology. For example, like Herrenhard wasn't connected to the royal family, but he was keeping the same ideology of reinforcing Amun. Okay, so therefore that dynasty stays the same. The ancient Greeks, without question, the beginning of Western civilization, 
but the first civilization in the Grecian history was the Pelagians. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race, just simply saying the black race. Ancient Greece is without question the beginning of Western civilization, but the first civilization in Grecian history was the Pelagians. The Pelagian civilization sprang up its roots around 2500 BCE. The Pelagians are a satellite coming from ancient Egypt who were colonizing or moving in the whole Mediterranean area. The oldest race of mankind is the Hermetic or the Black race. The Hermetic people were civilized civilization builders. They spread out into uh, every culture in the world. <coughs> when you look at the most remote civilizations of Asia and Europe, you will find these Hamites, or these small black people. They were the founders of civilization in Europe. Blacks branched out from North America and spread across the Mediterranean and in Southern Europe, and then left its mark on the entire European continent. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race. Five of the main Greek city-states were said to be founded by the descendants of these Semites. Corinthia was by the Phoenicians, Thebes, Cambus, and the, uh, also uh, Cambus from the Phoenicians. Uh, Laconia, these are the Sparta, um, these are the main places, Athens, all of these, Argon, these were all the major cities in Greece, were all founded by these black Pythagians. The Pythagians were made of various tribes, including the Tarians, the Legions, the Canodians, and the Gormelians. And all of these tribes actually come from ancient Kut. So I'm just trying to give you just a little background there. As previously noted, the Greek city-states were founded and developed by maritime colonizers from Phoenicia and Kenneth. Who are the Phoenicians? They got you taking notes of white people. Those were the ancient blacks who traveled the sea. They had the first great navy, okay, the Phoenicians, and they were great traders and commerce. In fact, when we think of ancient Egypt, you think of the pyramids, you think of all of these temples, but you don't think of the greatest economy the world has ever seen. Let me say it again. You're looking at the greatest economy that the world has ever seen, where you can see 5,000 workers, their family, their houses, taking care of everything that they do, build the greatest monuments and temples, and everyone is taken care of. There is no inflation in the land. There's a bartering system, and there's a system that makes sure everyone is taken care of. No such thing as homelessness. No such thing as a senior citizen home. No such thing as an orphanage. Every child belongs to the state and is taken care of by a family. Okay, so all of that's in ancient Kenya. We don't talk about that. Uh, uh, if I have time, I'll give you 10 great points about the pyramid. They've been lying to you about the pyramid. The pyramid is not a tool. Okay, I'm going to talk about all these other things that the pyramid does. So let me move on here. We are also told that they built canals, uh, subterranean waterworks, dams, walls of astronomy, of, of astounding strength and most excellent construction. Five years of the um, theosophy, theosophy, edited by George Robert, that's the name of the book, Read. Uh, London Read. There's a couple of books I'm trying to give you some references that you can go to. The deities of the Pelagians were predominantly the same as the ancient Kometa U, the ancient Kemet. Uh, and, and I give a book here that you can find all of that. So these, all of the Greek gods and goddesses, their origin comes from Kemet. Zeus is at the high of the list. Zeus comes from Ethiopia and has to go back every year to get charged. Did they tell you that? No, I got some pictures here to show you. All right, the Pelagians were eventually subjugated by the Hellenites and later assimilated into the Indo-European Hellenic population. But when we speak of Greece as the origin of Western civilization, let us not forget that it was the Pelagians, the black people, who were the original inhabitants and who were the bearers of civilization in that era. So all that we think of when we think of Greece, the Parthenon and all of that was set up by the ancient blacks that were there. Just like in Rome, it was the Acrusians, the Acrusians, are the same as the Pelagians who come from ancient Kemet. 
uh, and Cretans, they said, now this is mythology, they said that when more whites filtered into the area, they knew that life was going to be over. All the blacks got in boats and left. That's an ancient room. That's not in Troy. I mean, that's pretty deep. I mean, as long as they know something we don't know. Uh, the Greek cities, oh, I already mentioned it, Greek city states. All right, now let me just show you some pictures. These are what the ancient Pelagians look like. So you get an idea of what's here. Look, this is Greece in 550. Greece just starts. It's all black, all black, all black. The Minions and the Pelagians were the original black inhabitants of Greece. And here you see uh, they, the warrior here, all in black. <coughs> Note Herodotus in his book, The Persian Wars, in 440 BCE, this is all still pre Alexander. Remember, he's 332. Identifies the Spartans not as white, but as a combination of Phoenician and Nimyad, who, along with the Pelagians, were original black inhabitants of Greece. See Herodotus' text below. So, I just, again, you can quote even the Europeans are saying the European Scots, that these original people were all black. This is a silver, a silver coin. Done in 550 to 470. Black faces as the rulers and leaders of Greece. How many people got this in your history book when you were studying ancient Greece? Zero. That's about what I thought. Greek attic, attack, uh, attic uh, black figures, a vase of the Hopalites leaving home. This is 510 BCE. All warriors leaving their homes in Greece. And to the right is Zeus and the Eagle Oracle, 460. Zeus is black. And so the oracle, the highest oracle in ancient Greece is black from Ethiopia. So I'm trying to show you this. This is not like a feel good. I'm not trying to damn nobody. I'm just trying to let you know the origin of where this comes from. Again, the uh, Maxim in Sicily. You see, they were black. In fact, even today, you, a lot of people from Sicily, uh, when they came to America, they were classified as black folk <laughs> and were treated just like black people. In fact, Italians only in the 1900s became officially white people. <laughs> they made them honorary white people. Uh, the Irish and the Italians were called niggas and, and treated just like black people, and they weren't considered white. But as the white population was dwindling, they needed some more numbers, so they made them honorary white folks. But if you were to go to Sicily, you would see a lot of folks speaking Italian looking like y'all in this room. And here you see uh, pictures 430 to 420, which is still prior to Alexander. Uh, here in Macedonia, uh, to the right, you see the warriors here, 490 BCE. This is Hercules. Hercules, yeah. I know y'all seen the white version of Hercules. Hercules was a black man. And here he is depicted here slaying um, some kind of creature, mythological creature. But Hercules, again, the whole legend was an African. And all the ancient pictures of Hercules is an African. With an Afro. When they show the movie, he got long, stringy blonde hair and, and, and melanin deficient. The ancient name of the country is Tolo, or Hala, or Elada. That's the Greek. Uh, when we say Greece, that's the Roman rendering of it. And so we're actually talking, we're using the English name based upon what the Romans said. And so when we say Greece, or Greek Latin, it's called Gracia, as used by the Romans, and literally means the land of the Greeks. So here, just talking about roads, Crete, Cyprus, all the shores here were all originally inhabited by African people. Uh, where did Darien come from? Darien people of ancient Greece, they, their name is mythologically derived from Dora, the son of Helen, 
y'all know the story of Helen and Troy. They stole Helen, she came back. The husband went to war, okay. So the people who are the descendants of that are, are called them. These new divisions soon began fighting. Although the Greek culture had spread throughout much of the world, it was politically divided. The period of ancient Greece after Alexander, the Greek, is called Hellenic. Now, Hellenic, let me just give you a little background. I just explained that the original people were black. Rome, uh, Italy, and Greece, and Iona, all that area around there, was colonized by the ancient Greeks, I mean, ancient Kemetra Inc. They set up temples there. They left temples where they would educate, watch this, and they would try to bring these savages who came from the north out of a barbaric state. <coughs> In fact, Thale, T-H-A-L-E-S, said the first Greek philosopher is not Greek, he's from Iona. He went to a Kemetic temple in Iona, got a scholarship to go to Kemet. Sound familiar? He gets a scholarship, scholarship to go back to Kemet, studied in Kemet for 22 years, and came back and set up the first school of philosophy and thought and mathematics in all of Europe by a non-black. So I'm just trying to give you just a little background here so that you, you'll uh, be able to appreciate who we are. So when we say Hellenic, this is the Asian, this is the Eurasian, and I say Eurasian because Europe is not a continent. Europe is just Western Asia. There's only six continents in the world, and Europe is not one. It's just the Western part of Asia. So we'll put it together and say Eurasian. Yes, sir. Yeah, that happens around 1200 B.C.E. This is the, again, uh, the people, indigenous people who, uh, who were there mixed with other people, and then you got the northerners coming down. And so there's a battle for possession in that. Uh, Homer writes about this. Now, Homer, I know the Greeks try to claim Homer. Homer said he was Egyptian. And if you look at the old, Homer describes himself as having swarthy skin and kinky hair. And then they show you a, a Wazungu, a European, on the cover. So that means that they, they're thinking, you don't know what you're reading. Look at this image. You know an advertising uh, image, uh, image is ten times more important than the spoken word. So even though he tells you who he is, they just adopt him and we don't even question him. Okay, by 146 BCE, the Romans had conquered the Greeks and the city states. So now let me explain. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to backtrack to talk about the Ptolemy because the Macedonians conquered Greece and they are ruling Greece. But now <coughs> many of these leaders are in Egypt. Now, and I call it Egypt now because it's Egypt now. It's not Kemet. Ptolemy is a title. It's a Macedonian Greek lead king. Cleopatra is a title. It's the so-called queen of the Macedonians and kings. So they had names. You had Ptolemy Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia is named after him. Uh, you had Cleopatra Bernice up to Cleopatra the seventh. There were seven Cleopatras and 14 Ptolemies. I think I mentioned last week that the Cleopatras was wearing the Ptolemies out. Okay. Okay, so now, everybody kind of, I kind of got you where we are now. So now, the power is in Egypt, under the Ptolemies. But now, while the Ptolemies is eating grapes and enjoying, the, you know, the beauty of ancient Kemet, the Romans are gaining power. When they defeat them, they had just come from the Pyrenees War. You know, that's against Hannibal and the Carthaginians. And Hannibal in 200 and something go into, into, he goes across into Spain, across the out France, and then comes back into Italy. He confronts the Roman army seven times. He's outnumbered 20 to 1. And he defeats them all seven times. He whoops them so bad, you can read about it, 
if you go to places like West Point and all of that, they talk about the strategy of Hannibal. The Romans were rigid and they, you know, in the row and they lined up. And, but what they don't talk about is the genius. Now, Hannibal left Carthage with all black warriors and elephants. He got into Spain and he didn't get the weather report. As, <laughs> as he went across the Alps in the winter, almost all his elephants died. Only one or two actually made it the other side. But he lost many troops in the, in the bitter winter. But he was such a great organizer and such a powerful leader that he enacts troops on his way. Because guess what? Rome had created so many enemies, terrorizing everybody, making everybody pay taxes, that almost anybody was willing to fight against Rome to bring them down. So Hannibal was able to feed on this. And he was annexing all these, like the ghouls. The ghouls are what we call the French today. Hannibal talks about they were naked savages throwing rocks at them from the mountains. Minister to say he whooped that tail and annexed them. And they fought with them against the, uh, the, the, the Greek, the Romans. He came into Rome backwards. They, they, they thought he would come, you know, the waterway. But he came in towards the land. Now, they claimed that Hannibal was not victorious, but so they didn't understand Hannibal's plan. No, he did not sack Rome. He could have, but he did not. He wanted Rome to sign some type of treaty that they would leave Carthaginian alone, and they would have peace. So he whooped their tail, like I say, seven times. He was actually within 100 miles of the Roman city and did not come in and destroy Rome when Rome was actually almost defenseless. Rome sent 100,000 soldiers against 20,000. And the 20,000 decimated the 100,000 in three hours in an area about the size of Central Park. Now that's some fighting, y'all. That's some serious fight. And Hannibal wasn't no place pushing buttons telling people to go. He was leading the charge, slicing folks up like Swiss cheese. Okay, all right, so you got to understand this is the nation's war. Uh, he eventually tried to come to some type of agreement with Rome, and the Romans were so scared of Hannibal that even a hundred years after Hannibal dead, died, they would use Hannibal's name to put fear in Roman's heart. If kids act up, they said, you don't act, if you don't get right, Hannibal come get you. Oh. You know, like that, that was, that was like, you know, you must straighten up because I don't want Hannibal coming. Okay, all right, so that was, they would use that name. Hannibal goes back, and he's betrayed when he goes back to Carthage, his own brother, and so other people sell out, and they sell him out. Eventually, he just dies. Uh, and, but they're defeated, and there's a treaty with the Second Trarian War, and Rome takes control of all of North Africa. So I'm trying to get you up to date here. So Rome takes, so Carthage was the last stronghold there. Remember, Kemet was already controlled by the Macedonians and Greeks. So now, here's a timeline of Greece. So let's put it in proper spatial perspective. In 776, that's the traditional date of the first Olympic Games. And almost everybody in that first Olympic game were black. In fact, there's no such thing as Greco-Roman wrestling. That's Nubian Kushite wrestling. And all you have to do is just check the records and you'll see. Okay? And they're still doing it today. Okay? So that's 776. That kind of starts Rome. All these cities that the Palladians had started up now competed each other in an Olympic game. <coughs> in 750, Greek cities planted colonies on the Mediterranean coast, adopted the Phoenician alphabet. So in 750, before 750, the Greeks didn't even write. Now you have to understand, we've already had four golden ages, 3,500 years in ancient Kemet, of writing, sculpturing, plotting the stars and the heavens, and in 750 BCE, they just get an alphabet from us. So just trying to put things in their proper perspective. In fact, when Thales was studying in 640, they said, your people are like children. Each generation you have to start over. You don't even have a record of your ancient history. Okay, so that's Africans talking to these Europeans. Okay, in 595, we have Solon gives 
um, Athens and new construction. This is the start of the rise of democracy in Greece. Uh, Solon is the one that says, here's the one that tells you about Athens. That's how we, I mean, uh, Atlantis. The word Atlantis we get from Solon. Solon studied with the ancient connection and they told them about great civilizations before the flood. And so we, everything that you think you know about Athens comes from what Solon said. That would be like following rabbits to study with the fox on what rabbits said. Okay. I don't know if you follow me there. The Persian Wars, Athens and Sparta, led by Greeks in defending their own land and invasion. So in 490, <coughs> the Persians were controlling Egypt. In 447, works began on the Parthenon, 447, Greece was still predominantly African people, so the architects and engineers from Chemin came to build the Parthenon, as well as building many of the cathedrals in ancient Europe. Um, okay, Athens philosopher Socrates uh, is condemned to death. In fact, all, let me say it, all of the so-called Greek philosophers were kicked out of Greece. All of them. For teaching foreign thought. What's the foreign thought? African philosophy. African spirituality. Today, they're glorifying these people because after they came out of the Dark Ages, they realized how powerful these people were. But the Greek people, the Europeans, the Hellenic, who occupied Greece, who displaced the Pelagians, the blacks, didn't want to hear nothing about black stuff. So when these new philosophers who had studied in ancient Kevin came back talking about triangles and pyramids and the sun and the moon, they were like, get out of here. Stone. Kick them out. In fact, I just want to put this footnote. Europeans know about Greek philosophers from the Moors. When the Moors came in, Moors, the, the Arabs, under Islam, sacked Egypt in 640 CE, the common era. That's the beginning of the move. So they move across North Africa, which was the territory of the Romans. And like I said, Roman theory was so efficient that they just welcomed the Muslims in. So all of North Africa became Muslim. And then they moved into Spain in 711 CE, in the common era. In 711, Europe is in the Dark Ages. Why was Europe in the Dark Ages? Because Rome had fell. Rome was their connection to the Western world, to the Asian world, to Africa. When Rome fell by the Vandals and, and the northern Germanic tribes, and just tore it up, Europe fell into the Dark Ages because they were disconnected from the source of information, of knowledge in the world. The Moors came in, built universities, taught algebra. The Moors didn't create algebra, they're using the Arabic word. So they got this from Africa, they called it algebra that comes from the uh, algorithm. All of this comes from the Moors. Uh, they set up the first public bath because they were really funky and they had to do something about that. So the first bath, public bath was set up, uh, all of that. In fact, seven major universities the Moors set up. Later they were converted and they kicked the Moors out in 1492. So they were there over 700 years. Some of those castles and temples are still there today. Many of them have been converted to Catholic uh, buildings, worship churches, uh, a few uh, museums. But almost all those buildings that they built <coughs> almost a thousand years ago are still standing. 1492, the war is over, and we talk about the Crusades. Europe is trying to rebuild. You have to understand, Europe is financially poor, people poor, food poor in the 1400s. They just had a devastating war that, and plagued the damaged almost their whole population, and now this is when they go to the sea, which is the explorer. And what they're not telling you 
They're going looking for food. They're looking for food, y'all. They ain't going to trade nobody. It's like the Vikings. They're trying to make the Vikings now great explorers and traders. When you're exploring and trading, that means I got some stuff on my boat that I'm going to trade when I get there. The only thing they had in their boat was machetes and axes and arrows. And they wasn't in the weapon business. They were going to destroy. And so even other Europeans were afraid of the Vikings. Okay, so I'm just trying to put things in a proper perspective. So 1492, the Queen gave a session and said all Moors have to be out and all Jews have to be out. So the Moors and Jews, but this is what they said. On April 1st, I want you to go down to the river, go to the ocean, and we'll have boats waiting for you with food and water so that you can make your journey. So the Jews stole all the stuff they had, the Moors got all their stuff together. They got down to the boat and the army was waiting on them. April Fool. And decimated them. So today, y'all brothers out here selling April Fool Day, not understanding that it was created on the decimation of African people. So the real fool is on you. Right, so let's, let me get you back here where I'm at. Hold on. You're like about three quarters in there. I'm just about finished with Greece. I'm going into the Ptolemy, and then we'll end up with one of them. Even though I just kind of gave you a precept to one. Right. Castles, the first castles were built, not even in Egypt. The first castles were built in Kosh, in the Sudan. There's pictures on my uh, 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 presentation I do on chemical test cost relationships. <coughs> the fighting that you see, the weapons you see, the Romans using those big things and climbing up castle walls, they got that from the Nubians. The Nubians and the Kemeta U were building trade castles <coughs> 3000 BCE. Did you hear me? 3000 BCE. Even the castles in Ireland were built by African people. The original inhabitants of Ireland are black people. Who do you think the little green people were? The leprechauns. They were black folks. And white folks were trying to kill them and take their gold. Ain't no gold in Ireland. So listen to their folklore. They're telling you who they are. We are killing you. Listen. For African people, in order for you to be our enemy, you got to do something to us. You got to do something to us or our family. Now you cross the line, you are enemy. For Europeans, you got to have something they want to be their enemy. You got land, they came to Jamaica, saw the white beaches, oh, we've taken this. They came to Australia, Tasmania, saw these beaches, and oh, we've taken this. Y'all are enemies. Came across America, Native Americans, all this land, we've taken this. You are enemies. Anybody that has something of value is the enemy of Eurasia. So I know that's different for African people because y'all think it's all, you know, what did we do to them? You know, to get this type of woman. No, you got stuff they want. So I'm trying to break this down to the lowest common denominator. Okay, so now let me, I had talked about that the original inhabitants people were of uh, African descent. But what I wanted to tell you, the area where Greece is today is a very mountainous area with a lot of waterways and swamp areas. It wasn't conducive of farming. So that's why the Greek civilization had to go to the water to trade with other people. They couldn't produce enough food to feed their population. And so they became a trade state. And with the help of the Phoenicians and the ancient connected U, they got into the shipping buildings early from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians learned them, taught them that. And, that, and no one talks about how powerful the Kemetic Navy was. There's a, look it up, there's the legend of the sea people. And the sea people, these agents who had the boats like the Vikings coming around terrorizing everybody. The Hittites, who had a famous battle with the ancient Kemetic U. Um, the sea people came and destroyed all of that, all around the Mediterranean. They came towards Kemet, Kemet got in their boats, came out and met them, and decimated 
the three people and they were obliterated from history. Okay, so I'm just trying to show you the power behind the navy of ancient Kemet. Their major crop in Kemet, I mean in Greece, was olive. Olive. And olive, the olive crop was started by the ancient Kemetaum who had been using that as a colony. Olives are unedible when they come, when you take them from the tree. You got to take the olives, they're a little hard like marble. You got to soak them in oil for a year before you can pick them and use them. So, in other words, so when you pick this year's crop, it, it, it's not good to next year. So, you're harvesting last year's crop and picking this year's crop, and you have to keep it going like that. And then they're exporting it all around the world. And that became one, and they use that to get food rations and other things uh, from the more agriculture. But I wanted to say this, the dams that were built there were all built by the Africans throughout Rome and Greece. They inherited a structure, just like here in New York City. Some of the major buildings and dams and stuff that were here in New York City were built here by the Moors. So the Europeans came and inherited that. And you think that they built everything. No, they didn't. A lot of those dams are built. I was in uh, Detroit, looking across into Canada, on the island, and there was um, a giant structure there on the island and everything. And so, the European guy asked the guy, he says, um, it was a Native American guy, he said, did your people build this? He said, no. These mounds and these great structures were done by blacks before we got here. This is the Native American, the red man, talking about what was going on here in America before they got here. So they just inherited it. So people think that the red man is responsible for the mound. They're not the mound builders. The mound builders are the indigenous Africans who came here first. Very many Greek city states were located by the sea. Almost many of them confined as they were by steep hills and mountains or by the sea itself. If they were if they were on islands, suffering from a shortage of agricultural land from an early stage in their history, therefore many Greeks looked to the sea for their livelihood. For a period of about 150 years after 750 BCE, many city states sent, sent out groups of their citizens to found colonies in distant shores of the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. These established strong trading ties with their mother city. Greek traders soon dominated maritime trade for the Mediterranean, edging out the Phoenicians who had preceded them and adopted a mental coin, uh, much uh, to be seen. So the mental the coins that we see today were kind of mapped out. This is an Athens coin. All right, people, I'm about three quarters. I only have about a half an hour left. We're going to take a break, and then I'll finish up here with the Ptolemies in the room. So at this point, we'll take a break. Is there any questions on what I did first, first here? Come on, I wasn't that good. You only have one or two questions, no? All right, so I'll, con I'll continue with where we are. Let's move into art and architecture. Greek architecture is known for its grace and simplicity. The finest buildings the Greeks erected were their temples, and the most famous of these was the Parthenon in Athens. I already explained that Athens was created was founded by African people. The center of each temple was space known as the cellar. Here you are located the statues of the god. In front of the cellar was the porch, and both porch and cellar were surrounded by a colonnade of columns. <coughs> Each column was topped by a capital and carved blocks of stone, and the top of rested. <coughs> um, and then rested the roof, and these elements went together to form a simple yet gracious building. And I'll give you an example of that. Religion among the Greeks. The Greeks worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses headed by the chief of the god Zeus. Other gods included Hera, Zeus' wife, Athena, 
goddess of wisdom and learning, Apollo, the god of music and culture, Aphrodite, goddess of love, Dionysus, the god of wine, Hades, the god of underworld, and Diana, goddess of the hunt. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. I think I mentioned this before. I'll say that again. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. Stories about the gods portrayed them as lying, cheating, being unfaithful, getting drunk, and so on. As many traditional religions as Greek gods and goddesses have seen more a potential source of help rather than a source of devotion. So we kind of ask these gods to help you on your journey. But it had nothing to do with trying to be a good person, a moral person, and having value. That's something that African people introduced to that whole concept. When you have the same success as your colonizer, your former enemy, then your success is probably going to benefit them more than it benefits you. Can I say that again? Mm -hmm. that our concept of success has been defined by our enemy. Carter G. Woodson in 1931 said that our new enslavers will be our most educated, our PhD club will be responsible for keeping us enslaved. Because you look up to them. They got the Europeans' highest degree. They've been stamped approved by your enemy. And some of us don't even want to hear you unless you've been stamped approved. Well, where did you go to school? I, you know, I was, uh, <laughs> they brought me in, paid me $1,500 to speak at Kent State. And from DC, they didn't know I was African. <laughs> And when I got there, the dean of men says, you him from DC? I said, yes, and I've already cashed a check. So, <laughs> where do I speak, you know? <laughs> you, already cashed seven, check. Bro. you can't get that back, okay, you know. But it was like, they were like, oh, you know. Um, but then he looked down, oh, he went to the University of Dallas Salaam, he went to Rutgers University. Oh, he taught at the University of Khartoum. Oh, okay, yeah, all right, come on in. In other words, it looked like I was stamped to prove. But nothing I had to say had anything to do with those universities. Okay? So sometimes we have to do that. But see what happened, we get caught up in their approval of us. What did they tell us when you were young? Y'all old enough, y'all probably heard the same thing. Get a good what? Education. And what do they mean by a good education? A good European education. Right now, uh, we have a, a, a whole host of like Nigerians and people from West Africa, and they want to go to Ivory League schools. That's all. And they brag about it. Yeah, I got accepted to all the Ivory League schools. So you're trying to tell me that the most genius people can only be get a thorough education by going to their institutions. Then after you get this thoroughly educated European indoctrination, because that's all you're doing is being trained, then the next thing your parents say is get a good what? Job. job. Stay just over broke. That's what job means. Okay? And excuse expression, usually you have a jackass of a boss. Say, okay. And now if you got both of them, that's a terrible job. Okay? All right? So we have to understand that paradigm needs to be flushed down the toilet. I graduated from a um, traditional black college. I went to Norfolk State University in Norfolk, Virginia. And I remember, and I'm one of those guys, I set up, we protested, took over the school, and set up the first African Studies Department. But all they did was give us a band-aid when we needed a major operation. They took some handkerchief head Negroes and said, okay, I want you to teach African history, you teach Afro-American history, you teach African literature. They weren't really trained to take on that job. I remember I had an African literature class 
I was a sophomore and he had me teaching the class. So I'm just saying, and this, and we protested, we couldn't have no African languages. We were at African school, black people. So I'm just trying to let you know what this good education is. This good education that we, you've just been well trained. Right now in America, the most educated group of people is black women. Mm. Black women right now are the most educated group in America. But guess what? Black women make the least amount of money of any group in America. So obviously getting a good education was not the key. In 1816, Africans were in, only employed 1% of their population. In 2016, we employ 1% of the population. That means that you, if you're not an entrepreneur, 98% of y'all got to work for your former colonizer and slaver. You see what kind of condition that is? That's faulty thinking. That logic doesn't even make sense. I believe the last time we had full employment was during slavery. Okay, and we weren't getting paid, but you was employed. Okay, all right, you had a job. We have to change our paradigm. So the reason why I push the Madhu Netcha is because what it does, it changes our paradigm. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we look at nature. I teach this component. We first have to master the mineral domain. The planet Earth is a mineral. The sun is a mineral. The stars are mineral. And you are made of the same compound. You are a copper-based person. You are a, your blood is liquid crystal. But we are the most ignorant of the mineral domain. People come by my table and go, I'm from DC, you selling rocks? What's up with that? Have no clue. The mineral domain, totally ignorant. Our, there are mines in Africa that go back over 100,000 years where we were mining semi-precious stones. Mm. We've lost the way. We had this connection with Earth, the connection with the stars. We planted the stars before the rest of the planet woke up. We have to understand that. So we have this relationship. When people ask um, George Washington Carver, how did you do 300 inventions from the peanut? He says, I just talked to him, and they told me what to do. <laughs> he would get up 4 o'clock in the morning. He would water the plants, talk with them, feed them, you know, cultivate their soil. Now, I want to tell you, from reading the emerald tablets in Madhu secrets were revealed to me. And those secrets said that any time genuine, unconditional, un traditional love is exchanged between two energies, secrets are exchanged. So as we cultivated and worked with the minerals, they told us, oh, your pressure's a little high. You need to pick this up. Oh, you're a little stressed out. You need to go towards this color. We began to have a relationship with nature and nature, to, even a dog gets sick, know what grass to go eat. Yeah. But we're so out of tune with nature, we've lost that. So that's the first element. Understanding the mineral domain. The second element is understanding the plant domain. And again, you have a relationship with the plants. The plants tell you, they speak to you mentally, spiritually. You get premonitions. You get visions. You get dreams. You are guided. Every place there's a poisonous plant, the antidote to it is right near it. But if you don't have no clue of what's going on, you miss all of that. Your relationship. No herbal plants, no medicinal plants, no wood plants are edible. And then you need to have a relationship with them. Then it's the animal domain. Now I know some of y'all are going to be upset because animals were not here to be our food. <laughs> animals were not here to be our pets. Animals were not here to be enslaved by us. If you're the highest elevation of the spiritual domain on the planet, you're supposed to be a caretaker. 
You're supposed to be a protector, not the destroyer. And so animals are not our food base. Animals are not our pets. And animals are not our slaves. Animals are part of the ecosystem of this planet. When they're in their natural habitat, all of them have a function and they contribute to the well-being of the planet. So when you exterminate them, bring them in your house, pet them, domesticate them. What did I say? The African male slave, they broke them like they broke a horse. When the horse is running free and you don't want nobody on him, they say, that's a wild horse. He ain't no good. No, that's the way the horse is supposed to be. Ain't nobody supposed to be on his back. <laughs> now, after you broke him, now he can't even find no food. He's, he's totally dependent upon his master. That's a good horse. Look at that paradigm. That's the paradigm we're living in. And so good Negroes have been well trained. No, no fuss, eat European food, uh, wear European clothes, uh, go to European religious institutions, and that's a good person. If you rebel against that, you wild. I remember my father telling me in Tanzania, he said, son, there's nothing wild about nature. The only wild thing here is the wazungu, the European. He says, everything is in accordance with where it's supposed to be. It's not wild, it's natural. We make things that are natural wild. Your hair is natural. Oh boy, yeah, that, get that woolly stuff off your head. You need a haircut. That's wild. You see how we, we are defining even ourselves through a European paradigm. The wilderness. No, that's nature. Watch this. If somebody said, bro, watch the terminology here. Man, your breath smell like jungle juice. You'd be like ready to fight. But if you say your breath smells like a tropical rainforest, you'd be like, oh, thank you. The tropical rainforest and the jungle is the same thing. It's the terminology. Jungle making termination that this is wild, untamed. A rainforest is the natural state where there's heavily wooded area and trees. It's the same thing. So the jungle versus the rainforest. Terminology. Your paradigm. How you look at it. You go on a vacation. You go on to lay on the beach. You're already black as smut. <laughs> you go on to lay on the beach because Europeans say this is what you do on vacation. You go to the Bahamas, you go to Jamaica, you, you know, and they define where you go. You gotta change that paradigm. Every time you get, at one time, we were trying to get back to Africa. Every chance we get, we were trying to get home. Right. Now we have the ability and ain't nobody trying to get to Africa. We have to change our paradigm. We are the ones we've been waiting for. The fourth paradigm, after the, uh, excuse, after the animal domain, then you go to the human domain. You can't understand the human domain perfectly because you're a combination of the mineral, the plant, and the animal. So if you're ignorant of all of them, you're going to be ignorant of who you are. Because now you don't even understand your relationship to all of them and the relationship to the heavens, which is just an extension of this mineral domain. Most of us have no clue. Forget about not knowing history. We don't even know what it is to be human. We don't even have a clue of the power that we possess. Your pineal gland connects you to the whole cosmos. You can feel what's going on on Mars, Saturn, Uranus, through your pineal gland. You can feel every human being in this room through your pineal gland. You're in tune with all the minerals and plants of the universe through your pineal gland. It's open. It's a receptive. You can feel it. Someone asks a great master, he says, if you've never been there, how do you know you got there? He said, because I can feel it. He said, the pineal gland is like your G GPS. And so as long as the planet exists, as long as energy is being projected, I can see myself within this hologram. So I always know where I am. Bert, eagles sometimes travel 200 miles in a day looking for food. They don't get lost. 
Their own GPS system, their pineal gland guides them where they need to be. And that used to be us. Follow the North Star of freedom or whatever. We, we didn't have a GPS system that was here. And we were in tune with nature. Uh, I went to a family reunion once. Uh, we had one was in Florida, and then the second one was in Canada, or uh, uh, near Niagara Falls. And I had all these relatives there, and I'm like, how did y'all get here? Because we all had the same great grandmother. And they said, we walked. <laughs> now it took me 14 hours to drive there in the car. They walked, and, some, and then, <laughs> One of the Mr. Ed, he said, and we didn't have no shoes. <laughs> I mean, that just kind of like messed me up because I mean, I saw what it took to drive there. It was a different determination. Whatever is necessary to be free. I'm saying, people, if we have that determination today, we will be free tomorrow because we will be pulling our economic resources together. We will be building our own communities. Uh, part of my family lives in a place uh, in Tanzania, uh, near uh, Lake Iwanza. And what they do is when a person gets married that day, everybody in the village comes out and they build their home. Mm. So when the sun sets, that newly married person has their own house. And everybody in the village is contributing because you know when your child grows up, you know, the same thing's gonna happen to him. It's reciprocity, what goes around comes around. We call that what? Collective work and responsibility. One of the principles like in Kwanzaa. That's what we need, people. But we gotta be operating. Uh, Professor uh, Reverend Clemson talked about how the trial were all working with one accord. When I take people to the Metropolitan Museum, there's one room we go in towards the end. And it shows an incompleted wall inside of a temple. But on this wall are all the elements of what a finished wall looks like. So it, on one part of the wall, there's just red drawing of what's going to be on the wall. On the second part of the wall, you can see it's being carved back and the whole wall is being pushed back so it can be raised. The third part, somebody is refining and putting in detail. The fourth part, somebody has sanded down so that it's perfectly smooth. And then the fifth part, somebody is painting. Now on this wall, all of this is happening simultaneously. That means there's at least six different groups of people working on this wall at the same time. And everybody has a responsibility of what they're supposed to be doing towards the completed project. Because all of them can see what the finished product is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. All of them understand what freedom is. All of them understand what completion is. One of, all of them understand what fulfilling your goal is. So guess what? They're all eating together. They're all eating the same type of food. They're eating onions and radishes and, and stuff. But they're all eating that. Well, you'd be like, ooh, you smell like onions. So all of them are eating onions. All of them are eating the, the same foods. So they're vibing together, working together, thinking together, because they have a collective goal. African people have lost that. We don't have a collective goal. Freedom ain't even in our, some of us think we're free now. We're more enslaved now than we were in 1816. And so how do we change that paradigm? I speak about five or six other African languages. If you speak Swahili and you still got to, you just be crazy speaking Swahili. You speak Yoruba, you just be crazy speaking Yoruba. So speaking an African language isn't the key to liberation, but it does help you connect with the culture, which is part of that journey. Language is the best expression of a culture. Mm. If you don't understand the language of the people, you won't understand their culture. You'll always be on the outside looking in. You have to learn some, some words can't even be translated into English. And English is probably one of the worst languages on the planet. It's the only language that has the word try in it. Nobody else even know what that is. What you mean try? You either do it or you don't do it. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to be there. That means I'm not going to see you. <laughs> okay, you know, we can't translate it to Swahili. You're going to try. No, you're going to be there or what? You know, you're going to go the now. You know, okay, so. And I hear people saying all the time, I need to make this now. There's quite a few people. They even got some young brother now on the internet saying, no one can translate the Nigerian. 
I've heard even some of our scholars saying no one can read the Madhu Netra that it's a lost language. No, that is so far. And none of these people are linguists who are making that statement. In fact, the people who are making the statement only can speak English. <laughs> I don't think they're an authority on what can be done. It's a language that can be recovered. It's attached to, we belong to a group now where we have 18 African languages and we're comparing the Madhu to 18 different African languages and almost all of them fit in. They're all Bantu languages, you know, from, from the interior of Africa, from Ga, Tree, uh, 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 Shanti, uh, Shanti Tree from uh, Thong, um, all of the Hausa, Yoruba, all of them are connected to the Madhu Netra. Swahili, all of them, all the way to South Africa. I'm in touch with some people who are shamans, Zulu shamans from South Africa, and some of the same Madhu Netra words from South Africa are in ancient Kemen. So we can recover this word, we can, we can do it. And let me just say this, if something is lost, use your pineal gland. There's something called the Akashic Records. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. The Akashic Records simply say that everything that has been said, everything that has been done is still being done and you can tap into it if you have the right spiritual connection. Right. And so that means that you have the ability to go back and retrieve. Let me just give you a perfect example. The European Jews in the 1940s, when they stole the land and 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 well, the land was given to them and did uh, from somebody else, the Palestinians, and they created Israel. They were not speaking Hebrew. Most of them were speaking Yiddish, Russian, all these other languages. They had to come together. They knew what the Hebrew alphabet looked like. They knew what the sounds were. They had to pull all their lingual scholars together and they reorganized the Hebrew language and made it official. And now that's their language. It might be slightly a little different from the ancient Hebrew, but it is theirs and no one is questioning that. So when African people try to do that, oh, that ain't the real stuff. You define yourself. See, that's the wrong paradigm. Here we go again. Almost all those people who make those statements are operating from somebody else's paradigm and actually hating on you trying to recover yourself. That's what Sankofa is. Sankofa is go back and fetch what you have lost, what you have forgotten, or what was stolen, and bring it forth to the front. That which is good. Now, if you have some messed up stuff, leave it back there. Take the best that you have and bring it forward. That's it. That's what has to happen as African people. And two we uh, my teacher, uh, Dr. Sinjeni, Dr. Jacob Crothers, and Sister Brichetti, spent time with Diop. And Diop had told them that we're not serious about recovering our story until we learn the Madhu Netra. Because our story is rooted there. See, the Madhu Netra is not just Kemet. The Madhu Netra is Africa. Kemet was the mouthpiece of the African continent. The first time we even see a petroglyph of an Ankh is carved in South Africa out of diorite. It goes back 75,000 years. And the symbol of Rob, circle with the dot in it, it's in South Africa, all the way to the, the top of our continent. So at the first place where we see a falcon, a room, at the head of their astrological calendar. Haru, a hundred thousand years old. So Kemet, which is only what six thousand years ago, up to two, up to a little over two thousand years ago. So that's a four thousand year period. It's just the mouthpiece of the interior of Africa. That's all. They recorded it in stone. If you're in the tropical rainforest, it's going to deteriorate the next season. Mm -hmm. You can't keep things stored up. Even now, even the, when I went to Mali, the writings from, from ancient Mali and them is almost all destroyed from deterioration, you know, not being well kept, even though they're in the library. Uh, a lot of it is destroyed. Just, And that's only, what, five, six, seven hundred years old. So you can imagine Kemet is able to preserve things for 6,000. When you look at the Mir Kuk text, the pyramid text, this is from writings that go back before the first, the last great flood. 
but it's just being recorded during the first golden age of ancient Kemet. So that's why it's so important for us to go back and learn how to read this. Would the rabbit take the fox's translation of their sacred books? Well, that's what we're doing. We got a fox, <laughs> a slick fox all around us, and we're taking his word for what our ancestors left us. That is insane. That's upside down, inside out, and backwards. And we think it's okay. There's not a museum in the world. It's a national museum that has Kemet, ancient Egypt, inside of Africa. They separated every one. If you go to the Louvre Museum, the largest museum in the world, Africa is on one side of the museum on a different floor. Egypt is at the top and on another floor on the opposite end. And it's next to Greece and Rome. Go to the Louvre Museum, the second largest museum in the world, in London. Three, two different floors. You have to go to the third floor and then part of the first floor in the corner and Africa's in the basement. So <laughs> I, just, I just did a lecture there in, 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 in January, okay? Not even close, they don't want no connect. Go to the Metropolitan, which is the third largest museum in the world. At the Metropolitan, when you come in, if you go all the way to your extreme left, it's ancient Africa, West Africa. Africa south of the Sahara, or Africa period. If you go to the extreme right on the other side of the museum is ancient Egypt and Greece. So they're making sure that you don't make no connection. If you go in their library, there's not one book in the library written by an African scholar. Whoa. I mean, we have some great people, Asa Hill, Dr. Benz, none of them. None of their books are in a museum that is controlled by the state or the government. Not one. Even on our own topics. Whoever controls the situation defines it. You see, and we haven't addressed any of this. And then we wonder why we're messed up, why we're upside down, inside out, and backwards. Why even though we got PhDs, two of them, three of them, and we still haven't made any inroads in terms of changing the economic status of African people. Let me just say this here so uh, people will have a clear idea of what I'm saying. What made, another thing that made Kemet, see we're not even examining that part of Kemet. We're not examining their connection to nature. That's a lecture all by itself. Kemet's connection to nature is phenomenal. You can have a PhD just on that on how they were connected to nature, how they used the Hopi River, how they used the, the desert, how they used their trade and commerce. Kemet is the first major conglomerate of import-export in the world. They were able to take all of these places in Africa and be able to bring their merchandise to Kemet and then disseminate it through the rest of the world. And so they control commerce, economics. They're the first people to import and export honey. They had barges with just, where the bees would just cultivate the honey and they could determine what kind of honey would be because that's the only thing that the bees could eat on that barge. And they had 101 different cures that honey had for the body. Most amputees would not have to be amputated if you would just wash it and put honey on it. It's the, most, it's the best antibiotic known to man. Just, just hundreds of years, plus honey can go for 100,000 years without spoiling. Okay, so you just, I'm just giving you just a little tidbit. What happened to other African countries, what happened is that they were not manufacturing and producing. They had the raw materials. The North culture, which is smelting of iron, and, and the reason why it fell is because they cut down all the trees, and then the people couldn't sustain themselves. They weren't in harmony with what? Their environment. Kemet was in harmony with what? Look at the places they extracted the gold. When the gold got low, then that civilization crashed. Each one is a story almost like that. Kemet was able to produce so it could sustain itself for 4,000 years. It produced. We have to get into production. Go to Ghana every year. Ghana is the leading exporter 
of cocoa bean, of the cocoa. There's no manufacturing plants in Ghana. Chocolate in Ghana costs two times as much as it does here. And we ain't got nary cocoa bean. So Nestle's and all of them are there, they get the cocoa bean, they come back, they manufacture it, they got people working for slave wages, and no, we have to change our paradigm, our thinking. We have the natural resources. And see, we're in a perfect position right now. Africans in the diaspora, especially America, have the largest economic resources to our availability right now on the whole planet among African people. We are the most educated African people on the planet. In somebody else's paradigm, but we, <laughs> we're the most educated. So if we can take our expertise and then take our money to Africa, which is the richest continent in the world by far, not even close, nobody else. Europe don't hardly have any resources. China don't have no resources. Japan don't have no resources. We have resources. But somebody has kept us apart. Because remember, we're not trying to get home anymore. We're not trying to get free. We're not trying to liberate ourselves. And I'm not saying everybody in Africa just get up in America, get up and go to Africa. But there needs to be this relationship back and forth. Most European Jews, their education isn't complete until they make a pilgrimage back to Israel. And even the Jewish boy here has to go back to Israel to serve in the army and then come, keep and come back. Then that allows him to go back and forth. Because he understands there's an obligation to their so-called motherland now. We have to have an obligation to go back. And we have to create this. And it's okay. We just got to change our thinking paradigm. Now, after you get to the human domain, the fifth domain is the spiritual domain. Some of us want to start there and then we don't understand anything else. The spiritual domain permeates the mineral, the plant, the animal, the human. Through the spiritual domain, now you know how I'm supposed to manifest and use all of those domains to my disposal. I have one more form that I want to share with you. This is on how we as an African people have to be able to sustain ourselves economically. Number one, find out what you love, what you're good at. What, what would you do for free, even if you weren't getting paid? What do you love to do? Everybody loves to do something. And what are you good at? Because you might love it and can't do it. You love basketball and can't ball at all. Okay? <laughs> so what do you love and what are you good at? Let's put those two together. Number two, after you know you love it and you're kind of good, become an expert at it. Become an expert at it. Then number three, you will be compensated for it. Because you're an expert at it and you love to do it. You would do it for free, but now people will pay you to do it. Number four, take that financial expert and then reinvest it into yourself and diversify it so that the money works for you and don't you just work for money. And then at that point, it uplifts you, it uplifts your people, and it uplifts humanity. And it has to be based upon ma'at. Ma'at is truth, justice, righteous, harmonious, balance, reciprocity. So if you have that formula, you can't go wrong. Ma'at has to be there. Because you can tell me, look, bro, I'm going to be a drug dealer. I love it. I'm good at it. And I'm getting paid. But is it based upon ma'at? Is it uplifting you, your family, and humanity? No. So just scratch the drug dealer out, folks. Okay. <laughs> it has to be about my art. And you look. What an African village used to do, what the chiefs used to do, is take an inventory of everything they needed with, to survive. That's what they did in ancient Kemet. What do we need? We need food. We need shelter. We need clothing. We need transportation. We need a defense force. We need an educational system. And we need a facility in order so we can have a spiritual oneness. You take that inventory and then you make sure what some Jewish synagogues do, they take that inventory and as kids come up, they say, okay, you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna be our lawyer, 
you're going to be our construction worker. They, they tell the kids almost what they're going to be, almost. And then they get them scholarships to go to school, they pay, and their obligation, and they sign a contract, and that kid, when he gets a degree, has to come back to that community and has to give five to 10 years back to the community because that community sponsored them. We have, and get, they got that program from us. Jews didn't make it up. <laughs> and we've abandoned it because we want to be like somebody else. And so what ancient Kemet do, all those formulas I'm getting from ancient Kemet, I'm going back to ancient Kemet, they're telling us how to be dynamic. And they always show excellence. I showed the slide, people are plowing in the field, and the guy got a white pleated outfit on him, he's plowing. I don't see no dirt on him. His wife is behind him with a beautiful white pleated, and she's sprinkling seeds, none of them dirty. Now you know people get dirty when you're plowing, but they're trying to show you excellence. They're trying to show you that we are projecting excellence every chance we get. We have to begin to do that. When they look at our story, we are projecting excellence. So now your children are looking at excellence. Your children's children are looking at excellence. So what's their model? Excellence. That's not our model today. We have to show a model of excellence. And that excellence has to stem from that we are African people. Somebody gave me a clip on the internet uh, uh, a day ago. It was on the, the Olympics, and it was on uh, uh, the women's running events. And it had first, second, and third was a relay. So there was like four, 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 what's that, 16 people? What? And 12 people up on the podium. Every person was an African woman. It was like there was racism. Everybody on the running event was who won was African. Africans, not from Africa, Africans in the diaspora, Africans from America took first, Jamaica was second, uh, uh, Africans from the UK I think was third, but the idea was Africans. And in India, India has never won a gold medal in any running event. So 15 years ago, or almost 20 years ago now, they went hunting for black people in India, Africans, because every, everybody's black. But they went hunting for African people. Anybody saw that special? No, no, no. Well, anyhow, they, they went and they went to each little village in India and sought out black people. And they gave them a scholarship and, and, <laughs> and brought them to a, 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 like an athletic club and stuff like that and start training them. And uh, the last Olympics, they won their first medal. They, they got a third place. One of the Africans got a third place, you know. But Everybody's understanding that the power. Now, let me just say this, y'all, because we got our paradigm messed up. In order to be the fastest runner, physical attributes start what? Mentally. In order to be the most agile shift, that's all mental first. So by professing that Africans are superior athletes or saying that Africans are what? Superior mentally. We just don't get it. We don't get it. That those powers that we have, we're the most creative, the most dynamic people on the planet, but we're not using it for ourselves. So all those Africans on the podium, but they weren't representing Africa. They were representing our colonizers, people who had colonized us, Great Britain, Jamaica, United States, you know, all of this. So we're making all of our colonizer nations look great. At some point, we have to do this for ourselves. How about there was the United States of Africa? Do you understand how powerful that would be? That scares the rest of the world. It really scares Europe. It scares China. And it definitely scares Japan. They are all frightened of something like that. I had a class with Dr. John Henry Clark back in the 80s, and he had us read a book called The Canary and the Scarecrow. Anybody ever read that? It was dealing with European War II. And Hitler had promised Tojo, Japan, that if they defeated America and helped them in the war, he would give them Africa as the reward. 
they would exterminate the African people and Japan could relocate and take the whole African continent. That's one of the reasons why Japan actually attacked America from the West. Because the, the deal was Japan would come from the West Coast and Hitler, after he got finished doing Europe, would come from the East. But it, you know, that didn't work out. Okay. But I'm just letting you know. So Dr. John Henry Clark said, we have no friends in the world. No friends. Our only friends that we have is us. And until we can work together in operational unity, if we, no, see, you have to understand, even though America is a nation and it has many different religions within it, people all come together to work for the one nation. If you go to any nation, it's like that. And so we can't let religion divide us. Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindu. But we have to recognize that we're an African people and we have a common enemy, we have a common goal and a common objective until we can come up with a platform. Like people said, Obama, had he didn't do anything really for black people in eight years. We didn't give him an agenda. The Jews gave him an agenda. As soon as he got there, he had to meet with the Jews. The gays had an agenda. As soon as he got there, he passed more laws about gay people than anybody. We didn't give him an agenda. Now, some people say, well, we shouldn't have had to give him an agenda. He's black. But he's just a figure's head. There's people that he's accountable to who are actually paying his salary, and it's not our taxes. Okay? You have to come forth with an agenda. African people, as long as we're still thinking like Afropeans, we won't have an agenda that will liberate us. We're still upside down, inside out, and backwards. And Carter G. Woodson was clear, even in 1930, that our most educated blacks would be our new enslavers. So we have these degrees, we're making this money, and we're giving it right back. And it's not going to us, our people, or our inheritance. I was just reading something that was said it would take 288 years for Africans in America just to get even with Europeans in America in terms of heritage, in terms of passing down wealth. So you see where we are. So all of this, uh, a program like this is, is like a band-aid on a major operation where we need to change our paradigm, change our thinking. We need to change how we look at nature, how we look at the mineral domain, how we look at the plant domain, how we look at the animal domain, how we look at other human beings, because there's only one race on the planet, and we are the foundation of that. We have various little species to the race, like we have different kind of dogs, but they are dogs. Okay, so there's only human beings on the planet that can interrelate and intermarry and have sex and have babies with each other. Other than that, you wouldn't be able to. You can't have babies with a gorilla. You can't have babies with a, a monkey. You can't have babies with a dog. You can only have babies within that race or in that species. So, you know, so we can all interlock. So there's only one race. And so, but we have to come together based upon our connection to nature. And our connection to nature has shown us different. In ancient Kemet, everything, if you were an engineer and you were building a building, your building had to be aligned with Ra. So you had to know where Ra was coming up, where Ra was setting during each of the seasons. And we go inside of some temples and it's light all day because the architectural structure, as soon as the sun comes up, that light emanates through that temple until it goes down, that temple is lit. So the architect engineer had to be in tune with nature. He had to understand the rising and setting of the sun. So y'all see what's happening? There's a relationship with nature. I want to just do this before we I, I close out. I want to take a couple of things here.
This is what happens when other people define your paradigm. People will say, oh, MFDC, y'all just worshiping idols and, and statues and false gods. That's somebody else. That's the fox telling you what the rabbits do. <laughs> you didn't ask the rabbits what, what was that? So people, first of all, in case nobody has no knowledge, I know we have a pretty educated group here. I've seen y'all in all the lectures. They are principles and laws. The next group are principles and laws. That's like somebody saying, don't pay attention to nature. The weather don't matter. <laughs> we don't care about the sun. See how far you're going to go. Okay? And so we were in tune with nature. So some of you heard me talk about the fountain. Can, can you talk about that fountain? I find that fascinating. So now I'm going to distinguish African symbolism from symbolic thought and show you what symptomatic thought is. Symptomatic thought means I intrinsically know what it is. Other people look at this and they go, it's a bird with a hat. You know, that's supposed to represent a pharaoh? That's stupid. That's symbolism. That don't even make no sense. That person is totally disconnected from nature and doesn't understand symptomatic thought at all. And so the ancient natural root, who are living around the falcon, understand that it flies faster than any bird or any animal on the planet. The pelican falcon that was found in Egypt can go 285 miles per hour. Ooh. 285. I've you ever been in a car going 100? You know, 285. And he, can, he has the keenest eyesight of any creature on the planet. He has an extra eyelid that can look directly at the sun. Our ancestors looked at that as like looking at the creator. He can, without damaging his eye, no other creature can do that. He can swoop down on a mouse and spot a mouse under a leaf while he's a mile in the sky. Jet planes and bombers are trying to imitate the falcon. He can hunt within a day, within a 200 mile radius of his home. Swarm. You can look at a falcon. He, he can see the current of wind in the air, just like you can see the highway. Some falcons can hover for 20 miles without batting their wings. They're just in the current. And so the Africans are looking at this and they're saying, my goodness, this is dynamic. His, he lives on the highest tree or perches on the highest mountain. He can go 20, 40 meters under the water to catch a fish. That means he can calculate the speed of the fish, the bend of light in the water, and he's when he goes under and comes up with the fish in his tie lines, he's dry. Aerodynamics. So the Africans is like, oh my God, this is, this is miraculous. I want to be like a falcon. I want to have the attributes of a falcon. Even though I'm a human, I'm not turning into a falcon, but I want to have these attributes so that I can be. Every creature on the planet, when a storm comes, seeks shelter. The falcon flies over the storm. Mm. So Jehuti says, when a storm hits your life, don't seek shelter. Rise like a falcon over it and overcome it. Okay, so we can use the parallels from something symptomatically in our life. That's symptomatic thinking. Yes, yes. All right, yes. so you see what's happening. So now the king wants you to understand that he is like a mighty falcon. He has no rivalry in the sky. You can't even hide from him. He can see you. He can look directly at Ra and get messages. Okay, so just like the falcon. So now this is symptomatic thought, but I use a symbolic image to depict the ruler of upper and lower kingdom. And so it's not no spookism. You can go through now and go see a falcon. So it's not something I made up. Het Haru, the golden calf. The cow, when it became domesticated, became a source of milk protein for Africans who were living in an area where there wasn't much protein to be found. The cow also when he lays what he uh, has done, only certain types of mushrooms grow in that dome. The supersizing mushroom, which is hallucinogenic, which can take you on journeys that 
I know some of us are already on journeys, but a different type of journey, okay? <laughs> At one time, everybody in the village took that journey. So when they said, did you see the guy with the three heads, the message he gave us? Everybody was like, yeah, we saw him. We saw him last night, you know, because they all had the mushroom, okay? Now, <laughs> as the cow became less extinct, only the priests would take the mushroom. So you would have to come to the priest and he would give you a message. Yeah, the guy with the three heads, with the one eye in the middle of the head, said we need to do so-and-so. Everybody was like, oh, okay, we understand that. But see, symptomatically, we all knew it existed. Because at one time, we had the mushroom. We knew that the three-headed man is there. Yep. He's, he's, he's there helping us. us. He's a guy. That's right. <laughs> now, five generations later, young kids don't know nothing about the three-headed man. You go, son, I saw the three-headed man. Like, okay, mom. All right, you know, let me get away from you. Okay, so he only knows it symbolically. He doesn't know it symptomatically. But what the ancients did is the name made Hetharu. Used to be Bat. That was an ancient name, Bat. Then it became Hetharu. That became a symbol of the great mother. And so even in the European parallel, when Moses took a long time and they collected all the gold, they made a what? Golden calf. It showed you that the so-called ancient Hebrews were worshiping the great mother before they worshiped the father. So I'm just going back just to give you a little idea. So the great mother, even the Zulu, um, not the Zulu, uh, I want to say the Maasai. The Maasai, the cow is sacred. In fact, the reason why the cow is sacred in India is because we travel there. Okay, so you have to understand, you know, this concept. We are the original inhabitants every place on the planet. And so she is a symbol of the great mothering. Sometimes they'll even show the king sucking the udders of the cow, getting the message directly, this link to nature, because the cow understood nature to its highest degree. So it's not that we were just worshiping cows. We understood that this cow was necessary for the survival of people living in a certain geographical location. And we gave honor and homage to that. And now people say, you're worshiping the cow. No, we're worshiping the, the attributes that this cow had that, that enabled us to survive and flourish. Not just survive, but survive and flourish. Sekhmet, the lioness, the daughter of Ra. Now some people say, come on, and from DC, a woman with a lion head, this is ridiculous. I'm like, no, look, you have no clue what nature is. Right. First of all, why do you think they call the lion the king? Because when it comes to smart, now it doesn't mean the lion go jumps on an elephant, okay? Um, so he's smart enough to know that. But if it's time of a drought, I've seen two or three lions take down a sick elephant. An elephant who wandered away from the cry. Two or three lions will take them. One to the front, one to the back, one grabs him on the throat, one grabs him with the golden ass, the elephant turns around, they all up. And if the elephant fall, he don't get up. The lion is the king because he's the smartest hunter and fighter. Lion can take down a water buffalo four times his weight. He's a smart fighter. And the, the most tenacious of the lions is the male, but the most fierce hunter is the female. She does most of the hunting. The lion domain, the, the male lion, be chilling most of the day. He's actually one taking care of the kids. The little cubs jumping all over his head. You know, he smacks them every once in a while, but he's, 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 he's the one. Now let me say this. The lion is so tenacious, and everybody knows how bad he is before he goes to sleep. And only the male lion can roar. The lion roars out for about four or five minutes before he goes to sleep. I want everybody to know where I'm sleeping. Because if you roll up in here, you did it. He's letting you know this is where I am. So there's no mistake if you come up in here. Okay. Four or five hyenas will jump a female lioness and try to take her prey. But if it's a dozen hyenas and the male lion comes, they scat. The lion will just break their backs. Bam, bam, bam. He's a tenacious fighter. So now in ancient Kemet, if you look at the Norma palette, you see the king depicted as a great lion. If you see all the male deities, they either have a lion's tail or a bull's tail. The age of Taurus was the great bull, and then the age of Leo was the great lion. So we were in sync with nature. And 
the course of symptomatic thought, we already knew what that was about. So it wasn't you were trying to be like a lion. You wanted to bring some of those characteristics into your village. If you were the chief, you wanted to be like the lion. Okay, so I'm just showing you. So Sekhmet, the daughter of Ra, and the reason why they use the daughter of Ra, because listen, sometimes the king don't know about his son. Because the son might be scheming up on his title. You know, so you got to watch the son sometimes. But daddy's daughter will do anything for daddy. So some of the royal guardians were women. The chief's daughters became royal guardians. Even in ancient China, some of the most fierce guardians were women because they will protect daddy's domain. And so if you know anything about the story of Sekhmet, the daughter of Ra, she's on a mission. And Ra has her to clean up everybody who's doing isfet, wrongdoings. But uh, she found out that everybody's foul. <laughs> yeah. So she started killing everybody. So the other natural run to Ra and said, listen, you got to do something about your daughter. He was like, y'all handle it. He said, no, we ain't messing with her. He was saying, listen, send Jehuti. So Jehuti, the Ibis Crane, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding goes, and he tricks her. He says, oh, she's got infatuated with blood. So he turns the Nile River red and tells her, there's all the blood you can have. And she jumps in the Nile, starts wrapping it up, but it was red wine. She got drunk, and then Jehuti transferred her into Basset. The beautiful black cat. And so black cat is music, adornment. So brothers, there's always two sides of your woman. One side is segment, the other side is the gentle black cat. You want to nurture that side. <laughs> so I'm just going to do one more. This is Asar. Asar in ancient time was called the crop, the corn. He represents resurrection, rebirth, renewal. Every year the corn comes back. People can feed themselves. They harvest themselves. He became a nourishment. At one time he was known as the Hopi, the energy of the Hopi River. They brought inundation. And so they understood that their food source, their life force, was connected to Asar. So he became the great father. He was known as harmonious balance. He was the great giver. He was uh, associated with the planet Saturn but also the good side. Saturn is the planet of extremes. Um, so Asar was that extreme good, but he has to have a mate, Aset, who represents the balance. And then his son was Haru, and that was the first trinity. In ancient Kemet, you had several great trinities. Uh, before Narmer united upper and lower Kemet, you had Kanu, the molder. This is where Europeans got the idea of man who comes from the black dust, the dust of the earth in the Quran from the black mud. The molder, Kanu means molder. And it was Kanu, Anuket, and Satet. That was its holy trinity. Then during, when the unification of Kemet came, you had Patah. You had Patah, Sekhmet, and Atum. Atum, okay, uh, Nefer Atum. Then you moved to the pyramid age, and you had Ra. And you had Ra, Hekharu, and Atu, later which became Adam, the first person, okay? Then, the second golden age, they issued in Amun, the unseen creative force of the universe. And it was Amun, Mut, and Kinsu. And for all the four, and for 3,000 years, it was Asar, Aset, and Haru. So all of these, we gave trinities to the world, this idea. But the trinity was family. It wasn't two brothers, it wasn't two sisters, it was a brother, a sister, and a child. Sometimes it was a daughter, sometimes it was a son. And so this concept, being in relationship with nature. So people, we didn't have any gods and goddesses in ancient Kenya. We weren't worshiping idols. <sighs> we say there's four ways to honor your ancestors. Number one, you speak their name, the way they spoke it. Number two, we honor and do their great works. We honor and do their great works. That's what we're doing here. We're honoring the great works of our ancestors. Number three, we complete their incompleted works. So that's another thing we're doing. We've lost our mind. So this is some incompleted stuff that has to be recycled. We have to remember who we are, who we were, so that we can go forward in greatness. Number four, we need images and 
of them behind so that we'll know what the ancestors look like. Okay, that's important. Think about it. Every park you go into, you see some bazooka on a horse or something, right? They're doing that. They took our formula, and now they're doing it. And you go to Washington, D.C., they get, you know, Washington sitting up there looking like her, um, Ursa Ma'at Ross, the Tepper and they tell you, the artists said they were imitating ancient Kemet when they did the Washington Monument. When they did, uh, where's the one where they have the four people, the four presidents up on the Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. They were imitating ancient Kemet. They were imitating uh, Ramses II, Ursa Ma'at Ross, with the four statues of him. Okay? So their greatness is imitating us, and then we're not even doing it. That means every black community, you need to have a statue of somebody great. I like it at the corner part, Adam, Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard and Malcolm in uh, 125th Street. There's a picture of Adam Clayton Powell there. You need to see that. Yeah. If you go around the corner, they got a picture of Harriet Tubman. Right. You know that. We need to see yeah. African art throughout the African community. And African art is reflective of the greatness that we have left behind. So the children will say, Mommy, who's that? You know, oh, wow, yeah, I'm going to read about that. I want to be like that. Okay, so we need to do this. So those are four things. Speak their names the way they spoke it. So don't go King Tut. His name was Tut Ankh Amen. Betty and Ma Amen. So you need to know his name, speak it. Know their great works, like Imhotep. Even the Europeans were idling him. Escalapius, the, the head of all that. All people who are doing law degree, all people who get a doctor's, have to do pledge to Imhotep. That's giving homage to great people. You're following in their steps. And then we're trying to do the, that means we're still doing innovative work. We're still creating. You have, still have a house of experts. So that gives me a, another uh, formula I want to give you. Every village has to have a steam, a council of esteemed ancestors. Those are ancestors who've already laid a black print that you can use as a blueprint for success. They've already done it. So you have them. So it's clear about where you're going. Then you have a council of esteemed elders who are now carrying out that work and who've been doing that work for 30, 40 years and now can give you counsel on how to do that. Thirdly, you have a council of experts. That's in the various fields. Linguists, mathematicians, scientists, agriculturists. You have these experts and the experts are accountable to the elders. And the elders are accountable to the ancestors. And so the masses of people now are learning from the experts, and the experts are setting up an educational in each area so that you can become an expert. Your children become experts. And then you have the sesh, the scribes, who are to record all of this. Ancient Kemet left this model for us. So if we don't do anything else, we need to know our community need the esteemed ancestors, the esteemed elders, and the experts in each one of the fields, and that we need to have institutions of scribes that can disseminate this information and record it for our children and for our namesake. That's not a, that's not rocket science, y'all. That's pretty clear. So the Madhu Nature is an example already of that. I talk about if you take all the ancient languages and put them together, it doesn't equal one one hundredth of the Madhu Nature. We can't say that about Sanskrit, cuneiform. We can't do that for any other language. Only the Madhu Nature. And it's still there. The writing is still on the wall waiting for you. And that writing, just like I went through this, teaches you about nature. See, English, every language almost do we have on the planet now is abstract. That means it's totally symbolic. Abstract. Means that if I give you a faulty definition of what that is, you're just going to perpetuate that because you don't really know why it's that. If you ever walked through the park and found the age growing up, anybody ever seen a bee growing in the park or a big C just coming out of the ground? No, these are all abstract concepts. But in Madhu Nature, when I show you Ah, the hawk vulture, I can show you one. When I show you Boom, I can show you the leg and the foot of the person. Ah, oh, the arm. I can show you all these symbols in nature. Sa, the duck. I can show you all these symbols in nature that still exist. That's symptomatic. Now I put a sound next to it and a meaning next to it. And in ancient Kemet, everything almost has three levels to it. 
It can be four, depends on, that would be more symbolic or spiritual, but at least three levels. So if I show you If I can show you Haru. So one level, Haru is actually a falcon. Another level, Haru is the king. Another level, Haru is the day, daylight, the light of Ra. So those are three. Then it's a spiritual level. Haru represents higher consciousness. So we took one word in English, a bird is a bird. <laughs> I don't care if you got a PhD, you don't change, it's a bird, you know. Um, and Kemet, all these levels, because I'm in tune with nature and I know how to translate that symptomatically. And so our children, I saw on the internet, this woman had her child, she was in the park, I'm in a zoo, and there was a chicken there. And the mother, the little girl must have been about three, and the mother said, what's that? And the girl said, it's a lion. She's like, you don't lie. Look at it. She says, oh, it's chicken McNuggets. <laughs> she saw the bird and she translated like chicken McNuggets. I mean, you see, that's retarded. Thank you. And she was saying, yes, baby. <laughs> that's our relationship to nature. You know, you see a bird, you think of chicken McNuggets. You ever seen one of those cartoons where y'all stranded yeah. on a boat and the person looked like, like a turkey? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't want to be around nobody that got that type of stuff in their head. You know, they just have, um, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, people, we have to elevate our thoughts. We have to get off of our head. We have to get the proper spatial perspective of the world. We have to recapture our language. We need to recapture our story, not his story, our story. And we need to put it in a proper spatial perspective. We need to get, see, we're talking about how the educational system is jacked up, but we're not developing one ourselves and put it in place. There is a council of independent black institutions and they're almost out of business. Mm. When I was a member in 1970 something, we had 200 independent black institutions that belonged to the organization. Then charter schools came back out and that cut that down to about 50. Because people said, well, if we can get an uh, Afrocentric school and we don't have to pay, See, we don't know that we have to invest in our children's education. We have to invest in other people understand. Everybody understands that but us. Now, there's less than 20 schools, independent schools in the whole country, that's teaching from an Afrocentric thought from pre-K up to a high school. We went from 200 and something in the 70s to less than 20. Charter schools have been coming in and out in waves to destroy independent schools. In the 1900s, there was over 5,000 independent African schools in America. 5,000! The government put out charter schools and it put 90% of them out of business. Then in the 1930s, during the, after the independent African schools began to pop up again around the country. Over a thousand after the European War II, and then they came back in with charter schools, all of them went out. Then in the 1960s, it arrives again. But I told you charter schools came back. See, a charter school is still just a public school, and they allow you some community control. But then after you still, your teachers still have to go and get certified by the Board of Education. They still have to be stamped approved by Europeans, even though it's an independent African school. And then They'll let you have your curriculum, but then after three years, these are mandatory classes you gotta teach. So it just turns back into a regular public school. And they've done this for us over the last hundred years, ups and, ups and downs, every time we get it together, they come back out. And then after 10 years, those schools go out of business. And then you run right back to the regular public school. And we haven't learned our lesson. So I'm here, if we change our paradigm, we're not worried about that. We understand that you have to pay for, you have to create the institution, you have to develop the curriculum that's not designed just to go to, to be a, an employee. It's designed to fill all those things that your community needs. You need what? You need the engineer. You need the agriculturist. You need the scientists. You need the scribes. You need the teachers. 
So your educational system is based upon producing everything that you need. And then you stamp your own children approved. You understand that? Yes. And you don't stop at high school. You have to go to your higher degrees also. So if you don't send your best, we send our best kids off to the Harvard, to Harvard, to Yale, to the Ivy League school. And then you come back looking like Skippy Gates or something like that. With, with a white boy or a white woman. Yes. You know, so that's what happens. So we have to, from the cradle to the grave, we have to be in charge of educating our children with a curriculum that's reflective of nature and ourselves, which is part of nature. Mm -hmm. And Kemet still gives us the best example. During the second golden age under Minchu Hotep, he may describe the most sought after position in the nation. Because no matter what you did in ancient Kemet, you needed a scribe to record. The military needed a scribe to ration the food out, to make sure people got paid to make sure the mission, everything was recorded. The farmers needed the scribe to record and to sell their market. The, the government needed the scribe to, you know, to document everything. Everybody, marriage, government, everything needed the scribe. So that was created by us. And now we don't have no scribes in the neighborhood. Mm. You got scribes in your neighborhood? Who, somebody raised their hand when they got scribes in their neighborhood. Did you know of? Okay, you see, we, you know, but we, how, so that means we got to get our news from, from our witness news <laughs> or, or television, channel five, channel two. Y'all believe that stuff? No. They only, what, show you catastrophe. That's to keep you at edge and to keep you agitated and to keep you confused, confused and in pain. Right. Mm -hmm. And to let you know how hopeless you hopeless. are. As opposed to showing your power. I'm, I'm sure the news could show some, some black kid got straight A's. Some guy just graduated. That don't, that don't make the news. Okay, so we need to be able to control our destiny. That's media. I see some cameras here, television. We need our own channel. And I'm not talking about BET. <laughs> and people. You, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall again. So we have to have a common collective goal, economically, politically, spiritually, and it has to be manifest a reflection of where we want to go. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I would like to address, I didn't get a chance to do a question and answer last time, so I'd like to address any questions on the little Q and A on anything I've said or people who came to my last lecture when I talked about the power of the two lecture. Okay, can you uh, kind of come up front? Hey, Brother Charles and Sister Colia in Lafayette. They'll be with us next week. I think Brother Charles is going to speak. Um, again, um, we're excited seeing all of you here. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we are going to do a question and answer, but when you talked about the lion, everything began to make sense on why the villagers were so, uh, uh, they were so in awe of the lion. They treated him that way, even though they took him out. It was respect. The respect that they had in the lion. So after listening to you, I got a much deeper understanding. Those who want to ask questions, please come forth so we can get you on. Um, I heard you talk about the pineal gland, how it opens up um, us to everything in the universe. Um, but I also talk a lot about the um, hypothalamus, which is also the, the gland that makes us respond to music and puts us in tune to the vibrations of the universe. I would like for you to um, elaborate a little bit more on that. And I want to thank you for saying that um, our elders and our family um, need to um, connect with nature. I was like around uh, 12 years old and my grandfather's Native American and I came in one day and I saw my grandfather, I didn't understand what it was, but he was in a trance now that I think about it. And when I walked up on the porch and I said, oh, you know, he didn't see me and I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, oh, granddaddy, Didi, I said, oh, 
are you all right? What you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just listening to the grass and the trees grow. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're 12 years old, you start laughing. So I start laughing, I said, Granddaddy, you doing what? You're not watching it? You're listening to it? And he says, yes, child. I'm listening to the trees and the grass grow. And now that I'm a little older and I sit in the yard, my penal gland, along with the hypothalamus, being in tune when I'm open up, when I'm not thinking about the rent or some problem that came up with my girlfriend or the boss, and I'm just sitting there and I'm opened up, I laugh at myself because I can hear the trees <laughs> and the grass grow. So I just wanted to remind you because my grandfather was in the house and thank you for that. And the penal and the hypothalamus is the most important gland we have as a people side. So and they to... work kind of together. Yes, that's what I was going to say. They work. Symbiotic. The melatonin, right, and the it's serotonin it's... Yes. helps to thank tap you. into it. But it allows you to tap into the vibration. See, people, when you meditate, like our grandfather was, that you're listening to divinity. Right. When you are praying, <laughs> you are speaking to divinity. And some of y'all confuse praying with begging. God, I get a new car. God, I get a woman. God, I get a man. That's begging. That ain't prayer. Prayer usually comes in terms of affirmations. Prayers come in gratitude. You start out by saying, thank you for allowing me to have another day. Thank you for giving me breath. Thank you for putting me, giving me a mission to be on. Thank you for giving me the strength to be able to. So you start off like that. When you go to bed at night, Creator, thank you for allowing me to have this day. And all the things that I did not accomplish, give me the strength to accomplish them tomorrow. Let during my dream state, you give me premonitions so that I can solve the problems of myself, and my family, and my neighborhood, and my people. You know, gratitude is your prayer. Not, I need a new pair of shoes. I need the, 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 the numbers to lottery. You know, okay? Because people, if your mind is retarded, money is not the antidote. 90% of people who hit the lottery 10 years afterwards are actually more broke than they were before in debt. Because they still had an upside down mind. They didn't have, they had a poor person's thinking with a whole lot of money. So what did they do? Go out and buy a $5 million house, four brand new cars, you can only drive one, four brand new cars, then they can't pay the taxes on the house, the cars are repossessed, they lost all their money because once you drive it off the lot, it's depreciated by 90%, okay? And now they got all, all, all these people money, relatives they never saw came out of the woodwork, okay? So you still have to change your thinking paradigm. So having a check, having money, is not going to solve the problems that African people have. Changing your mind. This is your bank account right here. So my sister, thank you. I appreciate that too. And th those vibrations of the universe. You, how many, when's the last time somebody hugged a tree? Yesterday. Well, you got three, four tree huggers in here? Go to the park, y'all. Go out and hug a tree. Take your shoes off. Walk barefooted. Get in touch with Earth. I thank the only apple tree in the whole neighborhood for the apples. And I collected apples from Tuesday until yesterday and made a pie last night. <laughs> 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 on the tree. I'm coming over for dessert. Okay, all right. Um, <laughs> if I thank you for your lecture. Um, really appreciate it. I'm learning a lot. Um, I just recently had my DNA done through Ancestry DNA, because I wanted to know what parts of Africa are in me. And what I found interesting, one of them is um, Cameroon, and they are herdsmen and farmers. And I have a green thumb, where people bring me their sick plants. Okay. And I walk out, I walk out my apartment, and there's dying plants sick. They don't even say who it's from. <laughs> <laughs> the word got out. Huh? The word got out. And I give out, you know, little snippets of plants and they say they do very well. So my question to you, I'm from Ivory Coast and Cameroon. Um, do you think it's important 
for most African Americans or African to find out what part, do you think this is important for Africans to do, to find out what their DNA is, so they can concentrate on what part of Africa they're from and try to, you know, do their research on it? Yes and no. Okay, I'll do the yes first. The yes is because, yes, because now you're not just wondering and guessing. You know, uh, even though my father is from Tanzania, and I was raised in Tanzania, my kids still did a DNA testing, my son and my daughter. And it said that your heritage comes from Eastern Africa, and it, linked, and it also had Western Africa, and it had some Native American in it. And my son's was almost identical to mine, but my daughter had zero, 0.1% Neanderthal. I said, that's your mama. <laughs> and it just so happened that her great, her, her mother's grand, great grandmother was European, okay? So that's where that 0.0.1% Neanderthal. But it didn't show up in my son's DNA at all. But my daughter, I guess the mighty conjure hold on to that. So my daughter had 0.0.1, so she's still mad at her mother. Okay, good. <laughs> well, exactly <laughs> but now, the, the no part to that, ma'am, was that we belong to the continent. That's up. So I'm saying, even if you don't know what particular ethnic group you belong to, you know that you are African. I'm saying, go adopt one. Did you hear me? Yeah. Just go adopt. I want to be Zulu. Go to South Africa, connected to the Zulu. I want to be Ashanti. Go to Ghana. You, have, you are the captain of your ship. You claim the captain navigates where he wants to go. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't know specifically, you can adopt Africa. You can go around Africa and say, well, I, I've been to five different countries, but I like these people the best. I'm gonna make that my home. You have the right to do that. And most African countries today still will accept you in as an African from America. There's almost no African country unless it's some Arab country you know, they have no problem with, you know, you coming in and getting um, getting land and things of that nature and repatronizing. And sometimes there's even organizations that are set up to help you repatronize mm. and land grants. And what you need to do is you need to seek out some chiefs and seek out some kings in Africa. Come, show your homage. They will induct you into their nation and give you some land. That's true. But you got to go there with something. Remember we talked about the experts? You gotta have something to offer. Don't go there thinking you just gonna squat. Mm -hmm. They got enough squatters, so they don't need to import some squatters, okay? All right. So you need to go there with your skills and your expert, and you will be welcome almost into any nation. You go there showing uh, with a good heart, you go there with my art, you will have no problem. In fact, I was just um, in Zimbabwe. There's a whole organization for repatronization for Africans in America. Uh, they're welcoming you in. You know, giving you land, set you up. But they want you to come in, put a business, they want you to come and do something. So we're going back to that formula again. Ancestors, esteemed elders, experts. They're looking for experts. They got ancestors and elders. They need some experts. That's where you come in. Remember, we are the most educated group of Africans in the diaspora. And we're not using it. And we're not employing even ourselves here. So we got to change our paradigm. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, brother. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I have two questions, actually. My first question is, um, I have a seven and a four-year-old, and I've begun homeschooling. Absolutely. I have signed them up for the Kamali Academy, which is um, an online, independent, African-based school. But I wanted to know what other tips or resources would you give? That's my first question. And my second question is, um, we're working on our plant domain and our memory domain at home. Um, recently, I started looking into buying crystals to put into my plants to um, increase the growth and the spirituality within the plants. What would be the all right, first let me do the first question first, and the second one. The first thing is that, uh, copy this op when you get back, CB, C-I-B-I, -I, Council of Independent Black Institutions. And uh, 
One of the uh, um, heads right now is in Trenton, New Jersey, the Garvey School. So if you look up Brother Baye Kimmon, so you can just look them up on the internet, Baye Kimmon. They have home, they have people who are doing self, um, who are doing homeschooling. They actually have kids or they can direct you. They have curriculums that have already been developed by the Council of Independent Blacks. Remember, they've been around for over 100 years and they've been revised, okay? So they're designed to do what I told you we need to do. So they have curriculums in history, curriculums in science, curriculum in language, you know, like in Swahili and a couple other things like that. So that already exists, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But I would recommend that you teach these kids when they're that young, how old are they? But do nature, while they're young like that. When they're your age, they'll be our new scholars, they'll be the scribes of the neighborhood. People, you gotta learn, you gotta change your paradigm. You start at four or five, by the time they're teenagers, I taught my kids uh, this, by the time they were teenagers, I allowed them to go to high school, to a regular high school. My daughter finished with straight A's. Now she's finished her second master's degree in cultural anthropology and wrote her own grant. Her and this Nigerian got a $20 million grant on studying stress for African people. My son, when he was eight years old, he knew what he wanted to be. So I put him in culinary art school. I let him go to a, a, a Voltec High School because he thought he was Michael Jordan. Okay, when he found out he wasn't Jordan, then he went on to college. Now he's a master chef. And he can take any food that you have in the Wazungu world and turn it into vegetarian. And you wouldn't know the difference. So you've got to cult up your homeschool, you boy, you get around people who have like minds, you put them in the independent black institute. Don't send your school kids off to the Fox school. All right? And that's what we do. We take our brightest and we give them to our enemies. And our enemies love that. And they want to give your bright black kids scholarships because they're going to use them up. And that's what they do. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. The second part of her question dealt with minerals. Yes, people, you know, it's a proven fact. If you put certain crystals like quartz crystal and, and rose quartz and citrine in your plants, the plants flower up. It does the same thing around you. When you have this around your house, there's the vibration, there's an energy. There are certain minerals. If you rub melachite and, and, and rose quartz, it will dissipate pain in the body. You have a headache. My students will testify. They have a headache. You put the amethyst up to his head, it stopped almost instantly. He's here to now, he'll testify. We, we teach, I teach a crystallology class. We teach people, you don't have to use drugs. You can just use natural herbs or crystals and gemstones. Why do you think we were mining stones for 100,000 years? Look at ancient Kemet and look at lapis lazuli, carnelian, citrine, amethyst, uh, turquoise, these constant stones were used over and over again. Why? Amethyst, the pineal gland, opens up your pituitary gland, your master gland, and allows you, connects you to your dream state, your fifth dimension, so that you can master the fourth and the third dimension. That's all done with a crystal. Pur the high priest wears purple. Why? It's the highest octave that the human eye can perceive, or those colors are related to purple. Blue, that dark blue, indigo, lapis lazuli stone, mm. called the wisdom stone. Every ruler surround himself with lapis lazuli. Why? It opened up their pineal gland and allowed them to remember, tap into ancestral member, tap into the Akashic records. This is just a, this is a crystal, it's a gemstone, it's energy. Uh, turquoise, the throat. And the reason why it's the most used stone among indigenous and Native Americans, it puts you and allows you to communicate with the ancestors. It kept you in real time reality, and it helped you uh, accent the spiritual domain of nature. And so that's why the indigenous North and South use turquoise. Turquoise was used in ancient Kemet, the throat chakra, the th you know the thymus gland here. Heart green and pink, green the healing, pink the um, emotional. And so if a person's hyper and they have a rose quartz and they rub it, it helps bring them down. Mm. If you need healing, the green stone, like melachite, aventurine, jade. The ancient Asians used to trade jade equal with gold. Every member of the family had a piece of jade. So that when they went on the village, if they were 100 miles away and they got into stress, 
the other person would feel it through their chain and know something's wrong with that family member. It's a vibration, it's energy. This is not hocus pocus. This is waves of energy in the universe. It's just like somebody can turn on a radio in Japan and you can pick it up in America. Those waves are traveling all around the planet. But you gotta have the right equipment. You gotta be open, right? If you got a little cheap transistor radio, you can't even get New Jersey. Okay, all right? So you gotta open up your channels. So eating the right foods, thinking the right food, meditating each day. I'm gonna teach y'all a meditation too before I go. So sister, yes. Europeans teach you seven chakra centers. I teach my students, you'll see in Laida, Africa, we have, as African people, have 12 major centers. Seven, the reason why that's pushed is because that's an upgrade for Europeans. Most Europeans only have like about five open. So seven is like, you know, heaven for them. Seven for you as an African is what? A downgrade. And that's what they need to do. They need, look, I just talked about the Olympics. Everybody, every world record in any running event is held by an African. Go check me out. Look at the Guinness Books of World. Every, I'm talking about from the marathon, 26 miles, to the 100 meters. Every running, steeplechase, jumping through water, held by Africans, or a person of African lineage. They don't want you to tap in. Imagine, you would do that in the corporate office. You would do that as an engineer, you know, you know, you would do, look, we invented the computer, we invented the cell phone, imagine if it was doing it for us. And that's what they're afraid of. So sister, get your crystals and get them on, put them around the house, in the plants. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, I heard that the pineal gland in the African is active and in the European it's calcified. Is that Yes, ma'am, you heard some good. Let me explain. Let me give you a little research behind that. During the Vietnam War, everybody who was everybody that was deceased of American, they did an autopsy on it. And Europeans used to think that the, they thought that your pineal gland was like your appendix. You didn't really need it. Because 90% of Europeans, it is ineffective. What they found out is that. 85% of all the African-American soldiers who died, their pineal gland was active and juicy like a grape. 85 to 90% of all Europeans who died in the Vietnam War of American soldiers, their pineal gland was calcified like a stone. So now they began to do the little study. But let me say this, where's the, uh, who's the lady who asked that right here? 10% of Europeans have an open pineal gland. And 10 to 15% of Africans don't have a closed one. So it's just a reverse. So you could be black as smut and have a calcified pineal gland. Or you could be white as snow and have an open. But let me say this, all children have an open pineal gland. And Europeans calcify their gland, doesn't get calcified till they reach puberty. That's why you can have, doing like slavery, and even now, a black mammy, right? And a little white kid, love mammy to death. And then they grow up, and they're like, send her to the fields, okay? <laughs> because now his gland, he ain't connected to everything. But all children's pineal gland is open. They're attached to the world. They can feel everything. That's the course. They need this just to survive as a human being. But now, when they go into puberty, now they're beginning to go into the niche of the culture. So if you've come from a racist culture, then that pineal gland pulls up and they tap into that. Okay, it's just like, you notice on TV, all white people can dance on TV? I went to a white high school, nobody could dance. I'm like, where are they find these Europeans? They must have auditioned 5,000 Europeans to get one that can dance, and then you saw those on TV, you know. And we know, you know, they say all black people can dance, we know. Just among us, we know all of us cannot dance. Okay? <laughs> okay, so the idea though is to cultivate the pineal gland. So, yes, ma'am, most Europeans, that's why they can't even feel the problems we have. They're not even in touch with it. Crimes against humanity. Europeans exterminated all the people in Tasmania. And they're not even mad about it. The Australians, they're not upset about that they exterminated the original people in Australia, the Aborigines. Just like, they were there, they was in the way. They're five, they only got five centers open. 
and the pine the glands calcified. So they're not even feel even the white Americans, they don't have no remorse for the Native Americans that were here. The very people who are telling people to go back where they come from, they stole this land, telling other people to go back. They don't have a connection. They're pineal gland clones. Okay? And there are exercises you can do to enhance your pineal gland. But it all goes back to meditation. Meditation should be taught in pre-K all the way up. Y'all should have meditation hour at home. At my house, we used to have a study hour. Study hour, everybody study. So it wasn't like kids, y'all get a book. They saw daddy, mommy with a book, cousins. If a neighbor came over, I gave him a book. Yeah. Everybody, it was a study time, y'all. Okay, so they, and then you have a meditation time. Everybody has to be in this. Now, if that becomes part of their life, their communication to divinity is open. Did you? Uh, so, ma'am, did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Well, I, one thing I wanted to ask is that in the Vatican, uh, ad, is that in the Vatican, there's a huge depiction the pine cone. of, yeah, because it looks like a pine cone. Right. right. If you see, in fact, yes, yeah, so if you see that, right in the middle of the Vatican of is a pine cone. Pine cone is symbolic of the pineal gland. If you look at cuneiform, if you look at the ancient Chaldeans, if you look at Sumer, if you look at all those rooms, they would hold the pine cone. We knew we were touched and connected to the universe. And you'll notice that even the early Babylonians, the Chaldonians, all of them, their leaders were great falcons and lions. There's no lions there. In China, the most sacred dance is the lion's dance. There's no lions there. That all comes from us traveling around the world. So, and that's why when you're learning our story, you need a timeline. So we talk about everybody on the planet, and we talk about ourselves, you can see in perspective of where they were. So if you're homeschooling your kids, you have to have a timeline up. So you can say, all right, when we were doing Madhu Netcha, when we were writing this 6,000 years ago, let's see who else was writing. And you start looking blank, 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 blank. And then you'll find out that when they try to say cuneiform, black people from ancient Kush created that. The black heads. Not because they wore black hats. Okay, they came from ancient Kush also. The Dravidians in Europe, I mean in India, coming from Africa, Sri Lanka, all this, this connection. So you need a timeline so you can see. When you look at the Almond heads, that's during the time when the Kushite, the fourth, the uh, fourth golden age, where we travel. Mm -hmm. So we need to see a timeline so we can put everything in its proper spatial perspective. You don't want to be, what's the word? Uh, you don't want orientation. If you're getting ready to go to orientation, you're getting ready to get bamboozled. When you go to your job, what do they say? Go to what first? Orientation. Orientation. We're going to tell you, do this, do that, or you get fired. You go to a new European school. What's the first thing you got to go to? Orientation. orientation. Do this, this, or we dismiss you. Instead of telling you what you need to do to flourish, just give me proper spatial perspective, and then I can flourish. Our children don't have proper spatial perspective. They've been orientated in these Western schools, whether it's a black school or white school. Give them proper spatial perspective and they'll know where to hold them to their expertise. Hello? Um, yeah, speak loud. Hello? 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 Louder, louder, louder. Hello? 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I never heard about you before, but I accept everything you taught today, and it's hard for me to accept everything anybody taught today and stuff. Um, you, you talk, man, you talk about a lot of stuff, man. Even I've been sitting up there getting my questions ready to tell you, <laughs> you said something about the Tasmanian piece, and I'm like, wow, you really did study, because not too many people talk about that. But anyway, I really want to ask you about, you talked about the um, the first um, um, Holy Trinity. And okay, I accept that, but you didn't mention um, Osiris, Isis, and Amen. And I was wondering if you, or did he say that? I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. He did say that? Well, that's the incorrect thing. You know, um, God, man, I got so many questions. But I really wanted to, my cousin is interested in what book, what book you read? Uh, clarify uh, the spelling and the pronunciation of 
Madhu, what is it? Madhu Madhu Madhu. Madhu. Yeah, please. And yeah, I'm a little bored here, but uh, it's Madhu is a walking stick word, it means wise words of an elder. Nature is a flag, which means divinity, that which is divine. And symptomatically, oh, okay. One of my students prepared. Oh, so if the camera can pick this up. The language is called Madhu Netcher. But the word Netcher is written first. And we call this honorific ordering. If you and your grandparents is getting ready to eat, who eats first? Who do you serve first? Children. No, you serve the grandparents first. Yeah. In the Western world, they serve the children first. If you're walking in some place, and who comes in first? The elders. The elders. If you're getting ready to do honor and give homage, who do you ask for permission? The elders. That's part of an African culture. I, taught, I, I did a, a workshop one time at this Ukrainian center in uh, Somerset, and they fed the children, the babies first, and the children, coming from a European paradigm, because for them, living in the cold, they needed to make sure the babies survived when they knew they would cease to exist. So all their energy was on the babies first, and grandparents, they figured they had their time, but they ate less. So babies first, then the mothers and the fathers, and then they fed the grandparents that there was some leftover food. So their culture, and it's not that that was wrong. That's their culture. That's how they were connected with nature. In fact, just real quick, the reason why European blondes, blue-eyed blondes, get the most attention is because they were the most receptive and the most vulnerable in their society. They died out quickly. And so they got special attention as babies. And so that's why the blondes got more attention. That's why they have the dumb blonde joke because they're the most receptive. No blondes win Olympic gold medals. No, go check me out. Even the Europeans who do win are dark, melanated Europeans, you know, who are more Mediterranean and have dark hair and dark brown eyes, okay? But, brother, you see this down here? This says nature, the word where the word nature comes from. And so walking stick and the flag into divinity. In ancient Kemet, um, when the wind blew, if you were working in the fields, you stopped. And you would put your hand and let the breeze, that was the ancestors yeah. coming to bless you. And all throughout all of Eastern Africa, you see it in Ethiopia, you see it in Tanzania, Kenya, okay? So symptom, symptomatic thought, we connected elements with the creator. So we use these elements in our writing. So I'm just trying to show you. So this is, the language is alive. It's working, it's teaching you. It's showing you perspective. It's showing you how to relate to your elders, how to relate to nature. And don't put them between two pieces of bread. Okay. Um, Dr. Ellis. Um, oh, I'm, the, I'm, oh N -T, in English is N, Madhu is M-D-W, Madhu, and N-T-C-H-R. Or some people go N-T-R, Netcher. But I spell it N-T-C-H-R because I understand the, the glyphs. We're, we're going to take one more question from Dr. Ellis. Uh, but before, I, I just want to recognize a, a few people. Um, I want to recognize my nephew, who uh, is like my son. Uh, I have three sons. This one, would you say? And, uh, Welcome. I'm still waiting on the other two. <laughs> One, I think, will be here by uh, two o'clock. I want to recognize Sister uh, Coney Clark, uh, who is special assistant to many others. And uh, I'm going to be hearing from her next Saturday. Besides her, is Dr. Uh, Charles Pitts, uh, Brother Pitts. We'll be, right back. we'll be hearing from him also next Saturday. And I want to thank all the people who 
have assisted us getting set up for breakfast and everything. Uh, we're at Joanne, because we need to get set up for lunch, uh, and I think we'll be set up for lunch in about 10 minutes. It's already ready. Uh, so we're going to take one other question from uh, Dr. Gloria Ellis, and then we're going to break for lunch, and we got a surprise for you when we come back. Brother, I wasn't sure about your name. M. Fundishi. M. Fundishi. Uh, and I, I'm the type of person, I like to see what I'm saying, so it's M F U N D I S H. It's a, a Bantu word. So even in South Africa, they know it means spiritual teacher. It actually means spiritual grandmaster. But throughout the whole, no matter where I go in Africa, when I hear the word M. Fundishi, Fundishi, they know the root means to teach. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for a powerful lecture. Uh, I'm educated in the European system, and I, I have some skills, but I became very much aware that what you taught today was that connection of our heritage, our legacy to Africa, to those native uh, Egyptians in the Nile who built the pyramids and all that. And what you were able to provide was a whole notion of par the paradigm of symptomatic thinking yes. versus symbolic. That was powerful for me. I mean, and to, you know, the, the whole notion that we honor gods or, or things that, why, why do you pray to these objects? Wow, it gave some meaning to what our forefathers did. I just wish that your lecture had in some way had a format or a, um, what would you call it, uh, a, a lead sheet so that we could follow and take notes. I took copious notes, but I couldn't keep up with you <laughs> because you said so much. And I don't know if all of you guys are like me. I can't remember everything he said, so I had to write it down. But in order to go back, when I leave here, I will go back and review my notes. And I probably will have more questions then, because I was just trying to keep up with you. But I would like to know if you have anything written or that kind of traces what you, uh, that is kind of follow your, your outline of what you presented today. Because I think it would be whole us to have some, for me, have something to take home with me that I can read it a little bit more. I'm just fascinated. I want to. I want to make that connection with some of those things that you said, uh, which would be my education about myself from my elders, from where I came from. That somehow or another been disconnected with, and it's clear that we've been disconnected through the European education. You know that. I appreciate your question. Thank you very much. So people. The symbolic, let me explain. Racism can only exist through symbolic thought. Religion can only exist through symbolic thought. Most, nine, in fact, all of the wars that existed in recorded history is because of symbolic thought. You're being colonized through symbolic thought. I just throw some symbols out here, tell you to believe them, and then you fight and give your life over it without even really even knowing what it's about. Racism can only exist. Einstein said that racism was a disease. You don't like somebody and you never even met them. I, I don't like black people, never even met no black people. I don't like people with straight hair, you never even met nobody like that. I, I don't like people because of the color of their eye. This is all symbolic thought. Symptomatic thought is I have to have a relationship with that. You see, for African people, in order to be our enemy, you had to do something to us. Let me just give you a scenario. If you came to the shores of Africa 2,000 years ago, they would welcome you. They want to know where you're from. They're going to feed you. They're going to bring you into the village. Everybody want to come and try to touch you or something, right? Now you come to Northern Europe 2,000 years ago. You would be for dinner. And then after they killed you and ate you, they say, I wonder where she was from. Because <laughs> she was tasty. Okay. <laughs> All right. Difference. 
connection. Our intuitive, symptomatic thought versus I want to experience you. I want to be part of that energy as opposed to somebody else's definition of what that energy is. Yes. So there are a couple things. I was meeting with some of the folks in this group. I, I, I feel amiss in not being a part of the 10 week program, but having come in a little late, I'm really appreciative of your, your presentation. But for some of us that are meeting that are dealing with the issues of violence against symbolic thought. Or symbolic thought. So how do we, you know, kind of deal with that in reality right now, you know, in the real? Uh, I, I'm not dismissing what, what, what I said earlier, but this is a crisis. We can walk out of this door right away and somebody gets stopped by the cops and bam, bam. Why are they even fighting? Well, the cop, you have to understand, even the police are imagery. They're here to protect private property, not human beings. They are offshoot of the enslavement system. Their main job was to get runaway slaves. Their main job was to protect the property of plantation owners. And all we've done is shift it to corporations now. That's their main job, to protect corporate pr property and to keep everybody in their place. That's just like the plantation. That's their job. So when they, first thing they do is beat you and everything, that's what they've been, the reason why they get off is because they've been programmed to do that. How many people saw the whooping Rodney King got? And no police officer was indicted because they said they were doing what they were trained to do. So ma'am, you have to get in my charge head. of the babies. But my, 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 my question is, how do we get, what we do in our heads when that's happening? When that, you walk out there, what do we do in our heads now? How do we deal with that in the moment? That's well, the reality. Well, first of all, you need leaders who understand symptomatic thought. And you have to start wherever you're at. You have to start to organize and you have to change your paradigm. We're reacting. That's all this is. We're reacting and we're not changing our paradigm. Even Black Lives Matter is a reaction to our. We got to go to the root. The root is symbolic thought. We have to be able to, at each stage of life, remember I said you do an inventory of what you need? So you take control of the schools. Don't talk about how bad the school is. Organize your own. Start in basements. Start in churches. This is make a beautiful school. You need to start wherever you're at. Take control of your food source. Take control of economics. Young guys are out in the street because they don't have no job. And guess what? They don't have a real purpose because no one told them they were experts at something. No one told them that they are part of the solution. Uh, do we end with this here? There used to be, no matter, in, no place, to, you go to any city of America, midday, right now, you're gonna see hundreds of brothers standing on the corner and sometimes holding their, their private parts. They stand on the corner, yo, what's up? What's happening? That's how come we don't know what's happening? <laughs> you go to Houston, what's happening? You go to LA, what's happening? Texas, what how come everybody knows what's happening but us? And we on the corner. Now, I'm in Tanzania and I look, and the brothers are on the corner. But they are protecting the neighborhood. They know what's supposed to be going on. Anybody strange to come in, hey man, we'll watch this guy. Let's follow him. Get boom. One time we knew what we were supposed to do because you were taught from the little kids. Little kids are watching their big brothers on the corner, so they can't wait to go in the corner to look out for the village. Any strangers coming? You can't get rid of drugs in the black community. The police can't. Only the families can because it's your brother, your sister, your uncle. Y'all the ones selling the drugs. You, everybody know who the drug dealers are. Raise your hand if you believe me. We all know we're the only ones that can get rid of drug dealers. When you don't allow them in your neighborhood, when you don't allow them on your porch, when you don't allow them, and guess what? Don't call the police on them. There used to be a movie in the 60s called The Drop Squad. Anybody remember that? When it was a community people would come together and the neighborhood drug dealer, they put a blanket over their head, a pillowcase, snatched it, threw them in the car, took them and they took care of them. Okay? 
you take care of your own. Some Jewish communities, the police can't come in and arrest them. They have to go to the rabbi. Even if they saw the guy shoot, they go to the rabbi and say, listen, so-and-so, so and so and so And the rabbi would say, okay, we'll deliver him to the police station. That's when you got control. That's symptomatic thought being utilized on the everyday thing. Take control of your community. As a drive-by, you know who did it. You send appropriate brothers, y'all go pick them up. That's the last drive-by you'll see from that organization. You know who the gangbangers are. We all know. But because we are been taught symbolic thought, we just turn the other cheek. We just turn the other way. And it all stems back from the very beginning. We are not in control of the various institutions that we need to sustain ourselves. And at one time, you couldn't bring no drug money into the house with your grandmother, your mother. They want to know where that money came from. Right. If, if you didn't have money, a job that she, could put, that she can find you out during those hours, you wasn't bringing those sneakers, that shirt or nothing, and your ass was out the door, I remember. So it starts at the home. So it's our mind. we got to change our mindset, man. So the meetings need to be, what institutions do we need to put in place to change our paradigm? What institutions do we need to put in place to change our economic status? What institutions do we put in place to begin to employ our people in meaningful jobs? What institutions do we need to put in place to control the housing? Like in Harlem, it's controlled by European Jews. They control the housing. And then you upset because they reach justification. No, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, um, I, Thank you again. Uh, let's give Brother Introvisi yeah. a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Would be present day Sudan. And so I want to make sure you'll have European Egyptologists say that Kemet is the child of the Nile, of Hapi Itiru. But I want to make it clear that Kemet is the child of the African continent. And so the gift came from Western Africa, from the Sahara, as it dies, dried up. Africans moved down to the valley. Africans from South Africa were migrating and moving. Africans from East Africa, West Africa, and ancient Kemet was the depository of all this information because we wrote it in stone. So I wanted to be clear, it's not just the gift of the Nile, the Hapi Itiru was definitely the focusing point because of the water, the longest river in the world, over 4,160 miles long, okay? But I want to make sure that we understand that Kemet is a child of Kush, or Kosh, and that it is the child of the African continent. It's like the mouthpiece of the African continent. It would be like Mfundishi speaking, and they was like, did you see his lips? His lips is what he was all about, forgetting the rest of my body and my mind and my consciousness. Well, that's the way Kemet was. So we got to put everything in a proper spatial perspective. <coughs> you all have to excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, last week, I showed you the proper spatial perspective of the world, and specifically Africa, and that we've been looking at the world upside down, inside out, and backwards. The Hopi River flows down north from up south. South is the highlands flowing down. So I gave you a really good spatial perspective last week. So I'm kind of reviewing what we did. Kemet actually started its journey about 6,000 years ago. Well, actually 6,000 BCE, which is about 8,000 years ago. 
So today, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans, who are veggie backing deep off of what was done in ancient Kemet, I need you to see the origin of what they, where their history comes from. Who were the original people there? Um, and how did they get this information? Because we have to understand that the Greeks and the Romans is the foundation of Western civilization. So really what we're trying to say here is that Africa is the foundation of Western civilization. You, it won't get printed in any media, it won't get printed in any universities, but technically that's what we are talking about. That Africa gave birth to civilization as we know it on the planet Earth since the last ice age. And I need to say that since the last ice age because that happened approximately 10,000 years ago. I'm saying to say that there were other civilizations that existed prior to the last ice age. But after the last ice age, maybe 85 to 90 percent of the world's population was decimated. So a lot of those great sages, great philosophers, great builders, you see uh, where the Bermuda Triangle is, there's pyramids under the water there. They didn't build the pyramids under the water. That means that the Earth's geographic shape was different. Off the coast of Portugal, there are pyramids, a pyramid just as big as Khufu's pyramid in Kemet. It wasn't built under the water. Okay, I'm just trying to let you know. Off the coast of Japan, there are pyramids that's underwater. All right, so I'm trying to show you places around the world where there were ancient civilizations that were destroyed. Now, one of the reasons why the ancient Kemeta U began to write in the Madhu Necha, the divine words, is because we had a very oracle civilization. Everything was passed on from teacher to student. And it was kept alive in songs and dance. But if the great musicians were all destroyed, some of the great priests were all destroyed, then people had to start all over again. So that's what's happening in this modern world that we're in now since the last ice age, is that civilization had to start all over again. And the ancient Kemeta U, as they began to amass this information, they wrote it in stone so that if there was ever another great catastrophe on the planet, that they would have written it in stone of who we were, who we are, and who are we to be. Okay, so that is clear. So that's what the Madhu Necha, I'm a, people know that I teach the Madhu Necha, it's our classical language of African people, and I think that it's extremely important that we grasp this language. You see, as I talk about the Greeks and the Romans, their classical language is, Ro is Latin, Latin and Greek. If we created Latin, we created, we taught the Greeks, and we don't know our stuff. So we can't go to their stuff to find us, because they're telling their story. That's why it's called history, his story. Whoever controls the situation defines the situation. So I need you, that to, I want that to stay in your head. Whoever controls the situation defines it. Now they define Rome as the greatest Western power ever. But what was Rome? It was tyranny. It was colonization. It was enslavement. It was homosexuality at its highest level. It was all of these things that we don't hold in high esteem. Did that make them the greatest nation in the world? We have to begin to classify. What is that? America is trying to imitate what Rome was doing. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of the Masonic Order brothers will say, if the Roman emperors were here today, they would be proud of America. Because it has its foot and its tentacles in everybody's business. It's colonizing, it's decimated all the people here in North America. It's enslavement, and now we're embracing uh, confused sexuality. Uh, just like Rome, so Rome would be actually proud of America right now. But I'm going to show you that that's nothing. You see, the Greeks and the Romans did not grasp the 42 oracles of Ma'at. In fact, morality was never even questioned or talked about in ancient Greece after they basically eliminated the indigenous people. Every place you go in the world, any records of ancient Kemet, it says they are the most spiritual people on the planet. Everybody's records. 
there was no churches, no mosques, no temples, because everybody had their shrine in their home. So your place of worship was your home. Those temples were like universities and the depositories of information, okay, where etiquette and things of that nature was taught about your ancestors and how to keep it alive. And so there was no need to have a whole lot of churches. There was no need to have the comedic spiritual priest. It's not like a preacher today. I had a, a gentleman came up to me. He says, oh, Infundishi, man, you just like my preacher, man. You running it down. I said, how long you been to that church? He said, 20 years. I said, can you do what your preacher does? He says, no. I said, well, he's not like me. All right, because if you was with me 20 years, you'd be running your own center, your own synagogue, your own temple. You would have your own university going. I'm proud to have students around the country who are running their own centers, running their own shrines. I don't want them to stay up under here. I want them to be able to fly. Falcons. That's what it's all about. Shimsu Haru, followers of the great falcon. So I'm trying to set up where we were last year, I mean last week, so that we can move forward. Um, we got to the point where after the four golden ages of ancient Kemet, and let me go back, the first golden age is headed by Narmer, or some people call Menes. That's approximately 4240 BCE. That's 6,258 years ago. So I'm trying to put these dates because I had a timeline up yesterday, I mean last week, and um, today I have a timeline for the Greeks and the Romans. So uh, it's on a different tape, so I can't pull that one up, but I, mentally it's all in here. So the second golden age is Menchu Hotep, who I wrote a book about, who was a magi, and this book is Menchu Hotep in the Spirit of the Magi. And that takes place about 2000 BCE. So that's approximately 4,000 years ago. Menchu Hotep set up the second golden age. The third golden age is by Amos, the son of Tetesheri, okay, who was a great African queen from Nubia, from ancient Kush. He defeated the enemy, kicked out the Hyksos, and started the glorious 17th, 18th dynasty. Now we're about 1500 BCE. This is still before, I'm at the third golden age, there are no Romans, there are no Greeks, the Japanese haven't gotten to the seven islands of Japan yet, there is no civilization in Western Africa, there's no civilization as we know of it on this high level in North America or South America. The Olmecs and the Aztecs haven't started there yet. So I'm trying to put things in a spatial perspective. Do you see what's going on? We're at the third golden age, <coughs> almost 3,000 years, and the rest of the world is still asleep. Now we go into the fourth golden age. This happens around 725 in the, uh, still in the BCE. And this is by the Kushites who uh, chased the Libyans out and the foreigners, and reunite ancient Kemet again, north and south. So you have Chahaka, um, Shabaka, these powerful brothers who came from ancient Kush, and then they start the fourth golden age. And this fourth golden age is the last about 100 years. And then the Persians finally come in and conquer them. You have the Assyrians, and then the Persians defeat the Assyrians. And that's about 625. Now, this is when the great philosophers in the world began to emerge, when Kemet, fourth golden age, comes to an end. So I need you, I know you, people are not putting the research together, but I've done the research. Uh, Zen, Taoism, 600 BCE. The teachers from ancient Kush, when they were controlled, they left and spread their wisdom towards ancient. The Shang Dynasty, ancient China. The first two dynasties in China, the Shang I and Shang II, done by Kushites, Africans. The first uh, shogun of Japan, a black man from ancient Kush. Okay, so I'm trying to put things in the proper perspective. Now you got the Dravidians in India. Uh, you got all of this is happening as the 
fourth golden age of Kemet comes to a close. Now the rest of the world is beginning. The Olmec heads in South America, Mexico, all this is beginning to happen now that ancient Kemet has come, is being controlled now by others. So a lot of these teachers left and are spreading the word. And you'll notice there's a common thread among all these spiritual teachers where they've taken from the 42 oracles of Ma'at, they've taken from Ma'at the, the discipline and the philosophy, they're all biting hard on Jehuti, the wisdom teacher. In fact, if you go to Washington, D.C., on the House of Congress, on the door, it said all wisdom starts with Jehuti. And they show it right there on the wall. And they break it down. Then they go to the Asians, then they go to Socrates, and all of these people who I'm going to show today all studied in ancient Kemet. So in order for us to get this information out, we're going to have to write the books. So that's why it's important. Uh, I'm proud to say that my book, Spiritual Warriors and Healers, is being used in over 24 universities uh, in African studies here in America and being used uh, in other parts of Africa. In Egypt, my book is banned, it's contraband. Now my book is about ancient Kemet. But see, ancient Kemet has nothing to do with modern day Egypt, the Arabs. And so what happened in Egypt today the Nubians are beginning to get consciousness. You see, Africans here in America, y'all don't know how powerful you are. When you begin to protest and stand up for your rights and demand a proper education and proper living, other people around the world are hearing that. South Africa's movement veggie backed off of the movement here. They marched and sang just like we did here. In my country, Tanzania, the same thing happened under Julius Nieri and them. They were echoing what was going on in America. As you know, the first president, um, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana in 1957, outside of Ethiopia, went to school here, came here to be a preacher. Dr. Clark and them got a hold of him and said, don't Africa got enough preachers? He joined the Harlem Book Club. Actually, it's a block away from where I live. And he went back to Ghana and started a, a revolution but one thing Kwame Nkrumah said, he said, we can't celebrate the victory and the independence of Ghana if the rest of Africa is enslaved. Wow. Y'all understand that? So he wasn't just taking the glory for himself. He said, this means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. And that means we got to, what, break the shackles of neocolonialism. Because right now, that's where Africa is, in a state of neocolonialism. I'm building a school in a temple in Ghana. And you know, Ghana this year wants to introduce French as a mandatory language. Their, their national language is a Shanti tree. No schools are being taught in their native language. All education is taught in English and now they want to introduce French. Your, so you still, the colonial master still got a loop around your neck. That means that the French print the books, you got to have new French teachers. You got to, you see, right now, France would collapse without the money they get from Western African countries that they enslave. Let me say it again so that you understand. France would be a third world country and would collapse without the money they get, the billions they get every year from West Africa. That's Senegal, Gambia, Cote d'Ivoire, all those countries there. They are financing France. So I just need you to clear. We are a powerful people, people. You got to understand that, but we have to begin to take control of our own education. Think about this. Would the rabbit send his children off to Fox School to be educated on how to be good rabbits? No, they're probably going to end up as rabbits do. And if the rabbit gets a Nobel Peace Prize after all of that, then what did he actually get the prize for? You begin to end, we got six African, seven, they got Nobel Peace Prize and there's no peace. So we have to begin to understand. We got to take control of the educational systems from pre-K to PhD. You see, I sat on the council of, called CB, the Council of Independent Black Institutions, and we were raising kids from pre-K to 12. But then in the 12th grade, we sent them off to Wolf School. And we lost almost all of them because the wolf recognized how bright these young men are. 
They give him, oh, listen, you can come and work to AT&T for 200000 You think he's coming back to the hood? No, I don't think so. So they know what to do. They know how to entice our young people, our young gifted minds. I'm forever reading the paper where some Nigerian did scored off the chart in terms of SATs and all of that. That means he know the European culture better than the Europeans. But then they brag about they go into an Ivy League school. They was accepted at all the Ivy League schools. They should be smacked. <laughs> because you're not going to benefit Africa now. You go into these Ivy League schools, and obviously this information isn't going back to Nigeria to help develop a very corrupt country. All right, so we have to begin to think now. We got to stamp, approve our young people. And the European Jews are using our model. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. This is not their model. They're using our model. If there's more than six families, they have to open up a synagogue. If they have a synagogue, they have to open up a school. Not only that, the people who go to this have to be able to walk there. So that means it's in your community. If it's in your community, you have to control the stores in your community, and you only shop there. Do y'all see what's happening? Now, do we call that racism? No, they call it smart business. When you try to do it, it's racism. You faulty thinking, people. We're upside down, inside out, and backwards. We have to begin to look. We don't have neighborhoods, I mean communities. We got neighborhoods. You don't even know the next door neighbor. In some cases, you don't want to know, okay? So we have to begin the word community, black unity. Kim unity, the word Kim, black, black unity. And we are moving far away from that. So the more information we have, the better off we'll be and the better we'll be able to control. So people, I do have a couple of decks here. I think I only brought four with me. It's the beginning alphabet on teaching yourself the Badu Netcha, our ancient classical language. Okay, we sell them at 35 today. They are 30. Uh, so like I said, I only have four decks with me. Uh, but... And I teach it from symptomatic thinking. Symptomatic means it is what it is. It's, if a black cat crosses right now, what are you thinking? Huh? You're thinking good luck. You're thinking, no, it means the black cat's going somewhere. We automatically assign all these other things. <clears throat> That's from mythology and superstition. African people are the most mythological and superstitious people on the planet. Wow. As long as we continue to think like that, we will continue to be controlled. Right. No, the black cat probably going home. He's going to get something to eat. He's going somewhere. Has nothing to do with no luck. Has nothing to do with no witchcraft, no nothing. You see how we've been programmed. That's symbolic thought versus symptomatic. Let me say this. All religions are based upon symbolic thought. I don't even have to prove they exist. Just believe. I can't find nobody's bi body in the Bible. Not their bones, not their grave site. But when I talk about ancient Kemet, we can go tomorrow. I can show you their bones, their grave site, their temples, their works, their writings. That's symptomatic thought. That means it is what it is. It's, I don't mythologize about it. And let me make another such statement. There's some, let me clear up this thing about rituals. Even most rituals, even the word ritual is a mythology. <laughs> Symptomal. For example, I saw the sister saging the room. Now, some people say that's a ritual. I say, no, it's not. That's a sim symptomal attitude about cleansing the air, about keeping good vibrations. Scientific proof shows that when sage is in the air, all harmful bacteria is destroyed. In fact, in that room, a week later, they still will not appear. It's a scientific study showing you. So it's symptom. That's not some. So we're doing some good things, and we call them rituals. The brother poured libation here. They said, oh, that's a ritual. No, that's a symptomal act of honoring our ancestors. Take that word out. We can't take the European's word and redefine it. I know we've done that. Oh, yeah, that's my nigga. You know, you're yeah. trying to make it sweet. No! <laughs> mm -hmm. 
the word is what it is. Keep it in its proper context. Okay. So um, with that done, I also bought only two copies, but I bought the book Stolen Legacy because I'll be making reference to this. Uh, George G.M. James did a magnificent job. His job was done so well, he was killed as a result of this because he let secrets out from his order that wasn't supposed to necessarily come out. But his attitude is like mine. This is about educating the people. It's about empowering the people. So that's the step he made. He, the price of knowledge sometimes is death. Okay, and he was willing to take that. So George M. James, he basically takes every so-called Greek philosopher and tell you where they studied. They studied all in Africa at the, set, at the feet of the temples and then went back and became the first teachers in Europe. So I'm going to, with that, I'm going to start. Before I go, though, is there any questions on what I covered last week? The four golden ages. The four golden ages of ancient Kemet. And let me just talk about the European Egyptologists break Egypt into 31 dynasties, done by Manatho, who was supposed to be a high priest of ancient of Amun Temple during the time of the Ptolemies. Because the Ptolemies were Greeks and Macedonians who were ruling Egypt, and they wanted to know the history of the people they were ruling. And so Manatho had access to all the books, and he was supposed to break down Kemet's history into family groupings. So a dynasty it's not like a decade, not 10 years, not like a century, 100 years, not like a millennium, 1,000 years. A dynasty is a family rule. So it could be 28 years, 57 years, 150 years. A family rule or the same ideology. For example, like Herrenhal wasn't connected to the royal family, but he was keeping the same ideology of reinforcing Amen. Okay, so therefore that dynasty stays the same. Okay, I'm guilty here, y'all. Let me turn this off. Okay, hold on, let me just pull this back up and then I'll answer the question. Okay, yes, sir. The ancient Greeks, without question, the beginning of Western civilization, but the first civilization in the Grecian history was the Pelagians. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race, just simply saying the black race. Ancient Greece is without question the beginning of Western civilization, but the first civilization in Grecian history was the Pelagians. The Pelagian civilization sprang up its roots around 2500 BCE. The Pelagians are a satellite coming from ancient Egypt who were colonizing or moving in the whole Mediterranean area. The oldest race of mankind is the Hermetic or the black race. The Hermetic people were civilized civilization builders. They spread out into uh, every culture in the world. <clears throat> when you look at the most remote civilizations of Asia and Europe, you will find these Hamites, or these small black people. They were the founders of civilization in Europe. Blacks branched out from North America and spread across the Mediterranean and in Southern Europe, and then left its mark on the entire European continent. The Pelagians were undoubtedly members of the Hermetic race. Five of the main Greek cities, states, was said to be founded by the descendants of these Chemites. Corinthia was by the Phoenicians, Thebes, Cambus, and the, uh, also uh, Cambus from the Phoenicians. Uh, Laconia, these are the, Sparta, um, these are the main places, Athens, all of these, Argon, these were all the major cities in Greece were all founded by these black Pythagians. The Pythagians were made of various tribes, including the Carians, the Legions, the Camnodians, and the Gormelians. And all of these tribes actually come from ancient Kush.
So I'm just trying to give you just a little background there. As previously noted, the Greek city-states were founded and developed by maritime colonizers from Phoenicia and Kemet. Who are the Phoenicians? They got you thinking those are the white people. Those were the ancient blacks who traveled the seas. They had the first great navies, okay, the Phoenicians, and they were great traders and commerce. In fact, when we think of ancient Egypt, you think of the pyramids, you think of all of these temples, but you don't think of the greatest economy the world has ever seen. Let me say it again. You're looking at the greatest economy that the world has ever seen, where you can feed 5,000 workers, their family, their housing, taking care of everything that they do, build the greatest monuments and temples, and everyone is taken care of. There is no inflation in the land. There is a bartering system, and there's a system that makes sure everyone is taken care of. No such thing as homelessness. No such thing as a senior citizen home. No such thing as an orphanage. Every child belongs to the state and is taken care of by families. Okay, so all of that's in ancient Kemet. We don't talk about that. Uh, uh, if I have time, I'll give you 10 great points about the pyramid. They've been lying to you about the pyramid. The pyramid is not a tool. Okay, I'm going to talk about all these other things that the pyramid does. But let me move on here. We are also told that they built canals, uh, subterranean waterworks, dams, walls of, astron of uh, astounding strength and most excellent constructions. Five years of the um, theosophy, theosophy edited by George Robert, that's the name of the book, me. Uh, London Reeves, this, these are a couple of books, I'm trying to give you some references that you can go to. The deities of the Pelagians were predominantly the same as the ancient Kemeta'u, the ancient Kemet. Uh, and, and I give a book here that you can find all of that. So these, all of the Greek gods and goddesses their origin comes from Kemet. Zeus was at the high of the list. Zeus comes from Ethiopia and has to go back every year to get charged. Did they tell you that? No, I got some pictures here to show y'all. All right, the Pelagians were eventually subjugated by the Hellenites and later assimilated into the Indo-European Hellenic population. But when we speak of Greece, as the origin of Western civilization, let us not forget that it was the Pelagians, the black people, who were the original inhabitants and who were the bearers of civilization in that era. So all that we think of when we think of Greece, the Parthenon and all of that, was set up by the ancient blacks that were there. Just like in Rome, it was the Acrusians, the Acrusians, or the same as the Pelagians who come from ancient Kemet. Uh, and Acrusians, they said, now this is mythology, they said that when more whites filtered into the area, they knew that life was going to be over. All the blacks got in boats and left. That's in ancient Rome. That's not in Troy. I mean, that's pretty deep. I mean, it's not like they know something we don't know. Uh, the Greek cities, oh, I already mentioned this, Greek city-states. All right, now let me just show you some pictures. These are what the ancient Pelagians look like. So you get an idea of what's here. Look, this is Greece in 550. Greece just starts. It's all black, all black, all black. The Mimians and the Pelagians were the original black inhabitants of Greece. And here you see uh, they, the warrior here, all in black. <coughs> Note Herodotus in his book, the Persian Wars in 440 BCE. This is all still pre-Alexander. Remember, he's 332. Identifies the Spartans not as white, but as a combination of Phoenician and Mimyad, who along with the Pelagians were original black inhabitants of Greece. See Herodotus' text below. So I just, again, you can quote, even the Europeans are saying that, European Scot that these original people were all black. This is a silver, a silver coin done in 550 to 470. Black faces as the rulers and leaders of Greece. How many people got this in your history books when you were studying ancient Greece? Zero. That's about what I thought. Greek attics, att uh, attic, 
a black figure, a vase of the Hopalites leaving home. This is 510 BCE. All warriors leaving their homes in Greece. And to the right is Zeus and the Eagle Oracle, 460. Zeus is black. And so the oracle, the highest oracle in ancient Greece is black from Ethiopia. So I'm trying to show you this. This is not like a feel good. I'm not trying to damn nobody. I'm just trying to let you know the origin of where this comes from. Again, the uh, Naxon in Sicily, you see that they were black. In fact, even today, you see a lot of people from Sicily, uh, when they came to America, they were classified as black folks <laughs> and were treated just like black people. In fact, Italians only in the 1900s became officially white people. Bef they made them honorary white people. Uh, the Irish and the Italians were called niggas and, con and treated just like black people and they weren't considered white. But as the white population was dwindling, they needed some more numbers, so they made them honorary white folks. But if you were to go to Sicily, you would see a lot of folks speaking Italian looking like y'all in this room. And here you see uh, pictures 430 to 420. This is still prior to Alexander. Uh, here in Macedonia, uh, to the right, you see the warriors here, 490 BCE. This is Hercules. Hercules, now, I know y'all seen the white version of Hercules. Hercules was a black man. And here he is depicted here slaying um, some kind of creature, mythological creature. But Hercules, again, the whole legend was an African. And all the ancient pictures of Hercules is an African. What an Afro. When they showed the movie, he got long, stringy, blonde hair and, and, and melanin deficient. The ancient name of the country is Hellos, or Hellas, or Elada. That's the Greek. Uh, when we say Greece, that's the Roman rendering of it. And so we're actually talking, we're using the English name based upon what the Romans said. And so when we say Greece, or Greece, Latin is called Gracia, as used by the Romans, and literally means the land of the Greeks. Okay, um, so here just talking about Rhodes, Crete, Cyprus, all the shores here were all originally inhabited by African people. Uh, where did Darians come from? Darian people of ancient Greece, they, their name is mythologically derived from Doris, the son of Helen. Y'all know the story of Helen and Troy? Yeah. They stole Helen, she came back, the husband went to war, okay. So the people who are the descendants of that are, are called this. These new divisions soon began fighting. Although the Greek culture had spread throughout much of the world, it was politically divided. The period of ancient Greece after Alexander the Greek is called Hellenic. Now Hellenic, let me just give you a little background. I just explained that the original people were black. Rome, uh, Italy, and Greece. And Iona, all that area around there, was colonized by the ancient Greeks, I mean ancient Kemet They set up temples there. They left temples where they would educate, watch this, and they would try to bring these savages who came from the north out of a barbaric state. <coughs> In fact, Thales, T-H-A-L-E-S, the first Greek philosopher, is not Greek, he's from Iona. He went to a Kemetic temple in Iona, got a scholarship to go to Kemet. Sound familiar? We get these scholarships. Scholarships to go back to Kemet, studied in Kemet for 22 years, and came back and set up the first school of philosophy and thought and mathematics in all of Europe by a non-black. So I'm just trying to give you just a little background here so that you, you'll uh, be able to appreciate who we are. So when we say Hellenic, this is the Asian, this is the Eurasians, and I say Eurasians because Europe is not a continent. Europe is just Western Asia. There's only six continents in the world, and Europe is not one. It's just the Western part of Asia. So we'll put it together and say Eurasia. Yes, sir. The story of the Iliad and the Odyssey, I'm kind of confused about that. Yeah, that happens around 1200 BCE. 
This is the, again, uh, the people, indigenous people who, uh, who were there mixed with other people, and then you got the northerners coming down. And so there's a battle for possession in that. Uh, Homer writes about this. Now Homer, I know the Greeks try to claim Homer. Homer said he was Egyptian. And if you look at the old, Homer describes himself as having swarthy skin and kinky hair. And then they show you a, a Wazungu, a European, on the cover. So that means that they, they figure, you don't know what you're reading. Look at this image. You know an advertising uh, image, uh, image is 10 times more important than the spoken word. So even though he tells you who he is, they just adopt him and we don't even question him. Okay, by 146 BCE, the Romans had conquered the Greeks and the city-states. So now let me explain. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to have to backtrack to talk about the Ptolemies because the Macedonians conquered Greeks and they are ruling Greece. But now <coughs> many of these leaders are in Egypt. Now, and I call it Egypt now because it's Egypt now. It's not Kemet. Ptolemy is a title. It's a Macedonian Greek league king. Cleopatra is a title. It's the so-called queen of the Macedonians and kings. So they had names. You had Ptolemy Philadelphus, the city of Philadelphia is named after him. Uh, you had Cleopatra Bernice, up to Cleopatra the seventh. There were seven Cleopatras and 14 Ptolemies. I think I mentioned last week that the Cleopatras was wearing the Ptolemies out. Okay. Okay, so now everybody kind of, I kind of got you where we are now. So now the power is in Egypt under the Ptolemies. But now while the Ptolemies is eating grapes and enjoying this, you know, the beauty of ancient Kemet, the Romans are gaining power. When they defeat them, they had just come from the Pyrenees Wars. You know, that's against Hannibal and the Carthaginians. And Hannibal in 200 and something, go into, into, he goes across into Spain, across the Alps, France, and then comes back into Italy. He confronts the Roman army seven times. He's outnumbered 20 to one. And he defeats them all seven times. He whoops them so bad, you can read about it. <laughs> If you go to places like West Point and all of that, they talk about the strategy of Hannibal. The Romans were rigid and they, you know, in the row and they lined up. And, but what they don't talk about is the genius. Now Hannibal left Carthage with all black warriors and elephants. He got into Spain and he didn't get the weather report. As, <laughs> as he went across the Alps in the winter, almost all his elephants died. Only one or two actually made it the other side. But he lost many troops in the, in the bitter winter. But he was such a great organizer and such a powerful leader that he enacts troops on his way. Because guess what? Rome had created so many enemies, terrorizing everybody, making everybody pay taxes, that almost anybody was willing to fight against Rome to bring them down. So Hannibal was able to feed on this. And he was annexing all these, like the ghouls, the ghouls are what we call the French today. Hannibal talks about they were naked savages throwing rocks at them from the mountains. <laughs> Needless to say, he whooped that tail and annexed them. And they fought with them against the, uh, the, the, the Greek, the Romans. He came into Rome backwards. They, they, they thought he would come, you know, the waterway. But he came in towards the land. Now they claim that Hannibal was not victorious. But see, they didn't understand Hamlet's plan. No, he did not sack Rome. He could have, but he did not. He wanted Rome to sign some type of treaty that they would leave Carthaginians alone and they would have peace. So he whooped their tail, like I say, seven times. He was actually within 100 miles of the Roman city and did not come in and destroy Rome when Rome was actually almost defenseless. Rome sent 100,000 soldiers against 20,000 and the 20,000 decimated the 100,000 
and three hours in an area about the size of Central Park. Now that's some fighting, y'all. That's some serious fight. And Hannibal wasn't no place pushing buttons telling people to go. He was leading the charge, slicing folks up like Swiss cheese. Okay, all right, so you got to understand this is the tenacious warrior. Uh, he eventually trying to come to some type of agreement with Rome, and the Romans were so scared of Hannibal that even a hundred years after Hannibal dead, died, they would use Hannibal's name to put fear in Roman's heart. If kids act up, they would say, if you don't, act, if you don't get right, Hannibal's going to get you. Oh. You know, like that was, that was, that was like, you know, you must straighten up because I don't want Hannibal coming. Okay, all right. So that was, they would use that name. Hannibal goes back and he's betrayed when he goes back to Carthage, his own brother, and so other people sell out and they sell him out. Eventually he just dies. Uh, and, but they're defeated and there's a treaty with the Second Pyrenees War and Rome takes control of all of North Africa. So I'm trying to get you up to date there. So Rome takes, so Carthage was the last stronghold there. Remember, Kemet was already controlled by the Macedonians and Greeks. <coughs> so now, here's a timeline of Greece. So let's put it in the proper spatial perspective. In 776, that's the traditional date of the first Olympic game. And almost everybody in that first Olympic game were blacks. In fact, there's no such thing as Greco-Roman wrestling. That's Nubian Kushite wrestling. And all you have to do is just check the records and you'll see. Okay? And they're still doing it today. Okay? So that's 776. That kind of starts Rome. All these cities that the Pelagians had started up now competed each other in an Olympic game. <coughs> in 750, Greek cities planting colonies on the Mediterranean coast adopted the Phoenician alphabet. So in 750, before 750, the Greeks didn't even write. Now you have to understand, we've already had four golden ages, 3,500 years in ancient Kemet of writing, sculpturing, plotting the stars and the heavens, and in 750 BCE, they just getting the alphabet from us. So I'm just trying to put things in their proper perspective. In fact, when Thales was studying in 640, they said, your people are like children. Each generation you have to start over. You don't even have a record of your ancient history. Okay, so that's Africans talking to these Europeans. Okay, in 595, we have Solon gives um, Athens a new construction. This is the start of the rise of democracy in Greece. Uh, Solon is the one that says, he's the one that tells you about Athens. That's how we, I mean, uh, Atlantis. The word Atlantis we get from Solon. Solon studied with the ancient Kemet U, and they told him about great civilizations before the flood. And so we, everything that you think you know about Athens comes from what Solon said. That would be like following rabbits who studied with the fox on what rabbit said. Okay, I don't know if you follow me there. The Persian Wars, Athens and Sparta, led by Greeks in defending their own land and invasion. So in 490, <coughs> the Persians were controlling Egypt. In 447, works begin on the Parthenon. 447, Greece was still predominantly African people, so the architects and engineers from Kemet came to build the Parthenon as well as building many of the cathedrals in, ancient, in Europe. Um, okay, Athens philosopher Socrates uh, is condemned to death. In fact, all, let me say it, all of the so-called Greek philosophers were kicked out of Greece, all of them, for teaching foreign thought. What's the foreign thought? African philosophy, African spirituality. Today, they're glorifying these people because after they came out of the Dark Ages, they realized how powerful these people were. But the Greek people, the Europeans, the Hellenics, who occupied Greece, who displaced the Pelagians, the blacks, didn't want to hear nothing about black stuff. 
So when these new philosophers who had studied in ancient Kemet came back talking about triangles and pyramids and the sun and the moon, they were like, get out of here. Stoned them, kicked them out. In fact, I just want to put this footnote. Europeans know about Greek philosophers from the Moors. When the Moors came into, Moors, the, the Arabs under Islam sacked Egypt in 640 CE, the Common Era. That's the beginning of the Moors. So they move across North Africa, which was the territory of the Romans. And like I said, Roman tyranny was so vicious that they just welcomed the Muslims in. So all of North Africa became Muslim. And then they moved into Spain in 711 CE in the Common Era. In 711, Europe was in their dark ages. Why was Europe in the dark age? Because Rome had fell. Rome was their connection to the Western world, to the Asian world, to Africa. When Rome fell by the Vandals and, and these northern Germanic tribes and just tore it up, Europe fell into their dark ages because they were disconnected from the source of information, of knowledge in the world. The Moors came in, built universities, taught algebra. Moors didn't create algebra, they're using the Arabic word. So they got this from Africa, they called it algebra, that comes from them. Uh, algorithms, all of this comes from the Moors. Uh, they set up the first public baths because they were really funky and they had to do something about that. So the first bath, public baths were set up, uh, all of that. In fact, seven major universities the Moors set up. Later they were converted when they kicked the Moors out in 1492. So they were there over 700 years. Some of those castles and temples are still there today. Many of them have been converted to uh, Catholic, uh, buildings, worship churches, uh, a few uh, museums, but almost all those buildings that they built <coughs> almost a thousand years ago are still standing. 1492, the war is over, and we're talking about the Crusades. Europe is trying to rebuild. You have to understand, Europe is financially poor, people poor, food poor in the 1400s. They just had a devastating war that's, and plagues that's damaged almost their whole population. And now this is when they go to the seas. This is the exploring. And what they're not telling you, they're going looking for food. They're looking for food, y'all. They ain't going to trade nobody. It's like the Vikings. They're trying to make the Vikings now great explorers and traders. When you're exploring and trading, that means I got some stuff on my boat that I'm gonna trade when I get there. The only thing they had in their boat was machetes and axes and arrows. And they wasn't in the weapon business. They was going to destroy. And so even other Europeans were afraid of the Vikings. Okay, so I'm just trying to put things in a proper perspective. So in 1492, the queen gave a session saying all Moors have to be out and all Jews have to be out. So the Moors and Jews, but this is what they said. On April 1st, I want you to go down to the river, go to the ocean, and we'll have boats waiting for you with food and water so that you can make your journey. So the Jews sold all the stuff they had. The Moors got all that stuff together. They got down to the boat and the army was waiting on them. April fools. <laughs> and decimated them. So today, you're running around here selling April Fool Day, not understanding that it was created on the decimation of African people. So the real fool is on you. All right, so let's, let me get you back here where I'm at. Hold on. We're like about three quarters through, y'all. I'm just about finished with Greece. I'm going into the, the Ptolemies, and then we'll end up with Rome, even though I just kind of gave you a precept to Rome. Right. Castles, the first castles were built, not even in Egypt. The first castles were built in Kosh, in the Sudan. There's pictures on my uh, of, of a presentation I do on Kemet-Kosh relationships. 
the fighting that you see, the weapons you see, the Romans using those big things and climbing up castle walls, they got that from the Nubians. The Nubians and the Kemeta U were building trade castles <clears throat> 3000 BCE. Did you hear me? 3000 BCE. Even the castles in Ireland were built by African people. The original inhabitants of Ireland are black people. Who do you think them little green people were? The leprechauns. They were black folks. And white folks was trying to kill them and take their gold. Ain't no gold in Ireland. So listen to their folklore. They're telling you who they are. We'll kill you. Listen, for African people, in order for you to be our enemy, you got to do something to us. You got to do something to us or our family. Now you cross the line, you are enemy. For Europeans, you got to have something they want to be their enemy. You got land, they came to Jamaica, saw the white beaches, oh, we taking this. They came to Australia, Tasmania, saw these beaches, and oh, we taking this, y'all our enemy. Came across America, Native Americans, all this land, we taking this, you our enemy. Anybody that has something of value is the enemy of Eurasians. So I know that's different for African people because y'all thinking, dog, you know, what did we do to them? You know, to get this type of whooping. No, you got stuff they want. So I'm trying to break this down to the lowest common denominator. I'm trying to get back into my uh, folder. Uh, I'm going to need some help. I need to get back in. Uh, which one? I need to get back into the USB drive. There it is. Okay, it was on the knee. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, people, uh, so let me. Okay, so now let me, I had talked about that the original inhabitants, people were of uh, African descent. But what I wanted to tell you, the area where Greece is today is a very mountainous area with a lot of waterways and swamp areas. It wasn't conducive of farming. So that's why the Greek civilization had to go to the water to trade with other people. They couldn't produce enough food to feed their populations. And so they became a trade state. And with the help of the Phoenicians and the ancient Kemetu, they got into the shipping buildings early from the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians learned them, taught them that. And, that, and no one talks about how powerful the Kemetic Navy was. There's a, look it up, there's the legend of the Sea People. And the Sea People, these Asians who had the boats like the Vikings coming around terrorizing everybody. The Hittites, who had a famous battle with the ancient Kemet U. Um, the Sea People came and destroyed all of that, all around the Mediterranean. They came towards Kemet, Kemet got in their boats, came out and met them and decimated the Sea People and they were obliviated from history. Okay, so I'm just trying to show you the power behind the navy of ancient Kemet. Their major crop in Kemet, I mean in Greece, was olives. Olives. And olive, the olive crop was started by the ancient Kemet U, who had been using that as a colony. Olives are unedible when they come, when you shake them from the tree. You gotta take the olive, they're a little hard like mar marbles, you got to soak them in oil for a year before you can pick them and use them. So in other words, so when you pick this year's crop, it, it's, it's not good to next year. So you're harvesting last year's crop and picking this year's crop, and you have to keep it going like that. And then they're exporting it all around the world. And that became one, and they used that to get food, rations, and other things uh, from the more agriculture. But I wanted to say this, the dams that were built there were all built by the Africans 
throughout Rome and Greece, they inherited a structure, just like here in New York City. Some of the major buildings and dams and stuff that were here in New York City were built here by the Moors. So the Europeans came and inherited that. And you think that they built everything. No, they didn't. A lot of those dams and built. I was in um, Detroit looking across into Canada on the island. And there was um, a giant structure there on the island and everything. And so European guy asked the guy, he says, um, it was a Native American guy. He says, did your people build this? He said, no, these mounds and these great structures were done by blacks before we got here. This is the Native American, the red man, talking about what was going on here in America before they got here. So they just inherited it. So people think that the red man is responsible for the mound. They're not the mound builders. The mound builders are the indigenous Africans who came here first. Very many Greek city-states were located by the sea, almost many of them confined as they were by steep hills and mountains or by the sea itself if they were, if they were on islands. Suffering from a shortage of agricultural land from an early stage in their history, therefore many Greeks looked to the sea for their livelihood for a period of about 150 years after 750 BCE. Many city-states sent out groups of their citizens to found colonies in distant shores of the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. These established strong trading ties with their mother city. Greek traders soon dominated maritime trade for the Mediterranean, edging out the Phoenicians who had preceded them and adopted a mental coinage, uh, much uh, to receive. So the, mental, the coins that we see today were kind of mapped out. This is an Athens coin. Okay, uh, okay, I don't have that part of Okay. All right, people, I'm about three quarters. I only have about a half an hour left. We're gonna take a break, and then I'll finish up here with the Ptolemies and the Romans. So at this point, we'll take a break. Is there any questions on what I did first, first hand? Come on, I wasn't that good. You gotta have one or two questions, no? Okay. All right, so I'll, con I'll continue wh where we are. Let's move into art and architecture. Greek architecture is known for its grace and simplicity. The finest buildings the Greeks erected were their temples, and the most famous of these is the Parthenon in Athens. I already explained that Athens was, create was founded by African people. The center of each temple was space known as the cella, here you are located the statues of the god. In front of the cellar was the porch, and both porch and cellar were surrounded by a colonnade of columns. <coughs> Each column was topped by a capital and carved blocks of stone, and the top of rested, <coughs> um, but then rested the roof, and these elements went together to form a simple yet gracious building. And I'll give you an example of that. Religion among the Greeks. The Greeks worship a pantheon of gods and goddesses headed by the chief of the god Zeus. Other gods included Hera, Zeus' wife, Athena, <coughs> goddess of wisdom and learning, Apollo, the god of music and culture, Aphrodite, goddess of love, Dionysus, the god of wine, Hades, the god of underworld, and Diana, goddess of the hunt. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. I think I mentioned this before. I'll say that again. Greek religion placed little emphasis on ethical conduct. Stories about the gods portrayed them as lying, cheating, being unfaithful, getting drunk, and so on. As many traditional religions as Greek gods and goddesses has seen more a potential source of help rather than a source of devotion. So you kind of ask these guys to help you on your journey, but it had nothing to do with trying to be a good person, a moral person, and having values. That's something that African people introduced to that whole concept.
very patient, brother. Mm-hmm. He sat there listening to you. <laughs> Patiently, but we're about to go in. The brother laid the groundwork. He's about to go heavy into it. You know, I'm not going to, I don't even know what he's going to do. I'm going to learn right now from with him. Brother Infudishi is going to yeah. break down magical chemistry. E.M. Hotel. E.M. Hotel. Uh, before I start, I'd like to ask permission for my elders who are here. Speak. Start, my brother. Thank you, sir. Speak. Um, I'm going to pass something around. This is a sacred blue lotus. This is what was taken by the ancients before they entered the temple. If the idea was to alter your consciousness so that all the outside world would be left outside and you were ready to join the ancestors that exist within you. And so your consciousness rose. That was the reason for the incense and, and the sacred oils and stuff. And so we get ready to take a magical journey. I just want you to take bit and roll it on your wrist and rub your wrist together. Because it's going to be, every once in a while when I go in real deep, I'm going to say take a sniff. <laughs> so rub it on your wrist and pass it around. Okay. I'll let you know how hard he's going to put it on you. Iem Hotep. Uncle Ja Seneb Neb. We are divine spiritual beings having a divine human experience. And most of us leave the word divine out. We have to regroup. Brother Kaba began to break down who we really are. Some of us don't even know it. Even those of us who are African historians, even those of us who think we're up on it, we don't really know who we are. Look at we are the essence of the cosmic universe. We are the black plasmic matter that exists, exists within our blood. Your blood is liquid crystal. You are a dynamic human being capable of things beyond your comprehension. When they look at the smallest particle in the universe, a quark, it appears and vanishes, appears and vanishes. And it vanishes and appears based upon the observer to let you know that the creator is observing itself through you. That's how powerful you are. Mm. And we're ready at this time, 2012, we were talking with uh, Reverend Clemson, and he was saying we have to pay attention to this number Mm -hmm. because so many people have made reference to it. But brothers and sisters, 2012 is here now. You can see things happening. The magnetic poles are changing and shifting. You see volcanoes, tsunamis. You see earthquakes. You see things moving at an accelerated rate. The weather's going crazy. Things are happening. Some of this is not just based on the Wazungu, the European Caucasians who are trying to survive in the 21st century when their time is up. A lot of this is mother nature, mother father nature regrouping itself for the next millennia. Put it on. This Aquarian age. And so brothers and sisters, you need to be prepared. Don't get caught with your pants down. You heard Brother Kava saying a lot of y'all showing your pants because your elders show their pants. Pull your pants up because if your pants is down, you ain't going to be able to get away. Be prepared for the worst. If it doesn't happen, then you are just set in prison. But if it does, you are prepared. Get to a place where you can go at least 90 feet above sea level. Make sure you can get there with your family and have supplies of water and food. Because things are ready. Start preparing yourself with silver and gold and copper. Because you're going to have to barter for things. Food. Remember, we built the pyramids with no money. The greatest human resource, economic resource you have is your spirit, your human energy. And collectively, we represent an infinite reservoir of richness. And so we have to begin to uh, harness that energy so that you can be able to use it when time is necessary. Magical Kemet, you noticed uh, me and Professor Small were talking one day, and he was saying, you know, as we travel all around the world, everybody's fascinated with ancient Kemet, which we call Egypt today. But Nobody's more fascinated with it than Africans in America. Come on. Africans on the continent are not that fascinated about Kemet. 
they've almost been programmed that this is somebody else. But Africans in America, we know this is us. And so me and Professor Small were, we were building. And as we began to analyze African movement on the continent, we noticed that around the time that Africans were kidnapped from the continent and brought to the Caribbeans and dispersed throughout the diaspora to America, that that was the same time that we had this invasion of Eastern Africa. And these Africans had to flight for their life. We know that some of our chiefs and generals in their indigenous cultures sold some of our people, bartered our people off. But they didn't barter necessarily the people in their immediate village. What they did is they went out and got people who were just migrating, who were just passing through, who were just coming. We were coming from the valley, coming from the Hopi Valley. We got caught in this transatlantic trade, slave trade. And so many of the Africans that are dispersed throughout the diaspora are people of African descent who actually come from the Hopi Valley. And so we got the Neturu in our blood. We are the Neturu. I have conversations with people. They don't know the Madu Netra, but they can feel it. They identify with the Neturu. They have dreams that they were the divine beings in other lifetimes. Your sister raising her hand. Amen. I get to testify witness. A lot of us feel that. And we have a young brothers, hip hoppers and stuff. They got all these symbols tattooed on their body. They don't even know what it means. But they got the angst and wings of Ma'at all tattooed all over because they feel this energy. We are these divine beings, the greatest civilization in the modern world. And I say the modern world is anything after 10,000 uh, 10, years ago, the last ice age. The last ice age put an end to several golden ages that existed on the planet Earth. Planet Earth goes through these cycles. Uh, Brother Kaba broke down, for example, in the pyramid text, they talk about how they have been taught plotting three sun years. A sun year is approximately 26,000 years, the whole procession of the equinox. And so if we plotted three sun years, more than 75,000 years, we had to be into the science long before that to create the math to plot it. We created the first star charts. We created star charts of the heavens before most people were born on any other planets, on any other continents. So I need to be real clear. We were doing agriculture. We were smelting iron. See, one of the things you don't know about ancient Kush, that it was the first world smelting of iron industry in the world. And so those people who smelted iron were called Shimsu Haru, followers of Haru. And they were the blacksmiths. And we don't get a chance to talk about this. In Dr. Van Sertiver's books, Blacks in Science, he talks about an uh, iron smelting machine approximately in the area of Kenya, Tanzania, that was smelting iron at temperatures where you can create steel, which wasn't created for Europeans until about 150, 200 years ago. We were doing it before or parallel to ancient Kim. Come on. You, I'm going to show you some slides and some pictures of some stones that are almost as hard as diamond, diorite, that's perfectly carved. And they told you that the ancient Egyptians only had copper and tin tools. You can't, you need diamond cutters to cut this. So I'm trying to tell you, ancient Kemet started out almost at its height. It started out where America won't reach into another 500 to 1,000 years. That's how dynamic we are. And ancient Kemet began to decline each generation. Uh, one of my former teachers, uh, Dr. Asa Hilliard, broke down that we have to redefine our story. And so he broke it down to the first golden age, the second golden age, the third golden age, and the fourth golden age. And so dynasties were created uh, by our uh, European Caucasians during the Greek era, when Manetho was explaining our story to the Greeks. They broke everything up into family groups, so a dynasty is just a family group, okay? And uh, so it's not 10 years, like a decade or a century, like, you know, it's just, it could be eight, a dynasty could be eight years, a dynasty could be 100 years, a dynasty could be 200 years. It's that family rule, okay? So those are fictitious. They have nothing to do with ancient Kemet. Teach. So I need to make that clear. 
They have nothing to do. Uh, Akhenaten didn't know he was the 15th in the suit of the 18th dynasty. <laughs> okay, I need to make that clear. All right? So it's clear. Uh, what we have is the reunification of ancient Kemet approximately the date around 4240 ST, which is equal to the year 1, uh, no, 4240 BCE. 4240 BCE is equal to the year 1 ST, Semitawi. That's the beginning if you are darting, uh, charting things from the civilization of ancient Kemet. But year one is the reunification of Kemet because that's the golden, so that's the first golden age in the modern era. But we can see heirlooms, heirlooms of other golden ages that came before. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, Taneta uh, Anu, who was an African ruler that ruled about 7,500. BCE. And this is still 3,000 years before Kemet to let you know we were still ruling this golden ages, but they don't have the records as they still unearth things. They're, they're going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole, you know, to see exactly just how old we are, or just how old our civilization. But they can't tell you all of this because the great question comes up is where were they? Get it. Right, you know? So they have to begin to talk about, well, were the Germans here? Were the French here? Were the British? No! Not even on the planet. <clears throat> and so, therefore, they're not going to put a lot of that information out. They might just say it's pre-dynastic. Like some of these bowls that were carved out of diorite that's a 9.0 on the hardness scale. Go back to the a golden age that preceded the last great flood. And I need to tell people, you need to study topography and geography if you want to even have an inkling of understanding history. I know today they don't even teach geography anymore. They throw it in with social studies. And that's to keep you ignorant. They don't want you to know anything about the planet Earth. You are the planet Earth. You are the essence of this planet. You are a carbon-based unit based on copper and iron. That's in your blood. European Caucasians are ammonia-based people. And you will know that if you ever got caught in the elevator with them. Okay. So now, I want to drop some things down. My divine brother Kabo talked about language. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. Um, talked about language. How a language is the expression of a culture. Your culture is not to teach you just to survive, but it teaches you how to flourish. So when you're out of your culture, you are out of your living mind. And it's very dangerous when somebody else defines your thought pattern. Dr. Amos Wilson used to tell us that our colonizer has given us their desires. Mm. Thank you, Tom. So even the most Afrocentric of us mm -hmm are recovering addicts of white male domination. Mm. Now you know if you're an alcoholic and you haven't had a drink in 10 years, you're still a what? Alcoholic. You're just a recovering alcoholic and haven't drank. I'm saying that anybody in this room, if you've been educated by Europeans, been indoctrinated in any of their uh, religious institutions, if you've been to their, if you are a movie addict, a television addict, radio addict, if you are in love with English, if you, and, 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 if, and if this is the only language you know, then you're an addict of white male domination. Put it on. You might be at a suicidal state. You might be responsible for the destruction of your family and everybody around you. Call it how you see it. And you're afraid to destroy your enemy because you're so much like your enemy, you're afraid to destroy yourself. It is what it is. And that's where we are. And so we have to change our paradigm, change the way we look at things. Think about it. Even your definition of success is defined by your enemy. Your parents told you, get a good what? Job. You don't want a job. You'll be just over broke your whole life. And whose education are you getting? 
You can't get a good education in these universities. And I know, I, mix, I was in them, I got two PhDs and three masters. And what I'm teaching you today, none of it came from their institutions. <laughs> it came from outside studies and books and, 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 and traveling. Brothers and sisters, your best education is to go to the source. Go to the source. So hopefully some of y'all will come with us on May 1st to Boston to look in some of our heirlooms that are locked up in lockdown. All right? Some of y'all can travel to Kemet with us and travel to other places in Africa. But before you travel, you got to get your spatial perspective correct. You're correct. Not your orientation. If somebody's getting ready to orientate you, they're getting ready to bamboozle you. Uh -oh. So when you go to your job and they say you got to go to orientation, you're getting ready to get bamboozled. <laughs> you go to a new school, you got to go to orientation, you're getting ready to get bamboozled. Okay? You need sp proper spatial perspective. So now let me run this on you real quick. Brother Kabul gave you some uh, pictures of the earth, pictures of the Africa. I'm going to change the world just a little bit. I want to change it. Peterson projection is good, but it's not good enough. Not good enough. If you buy the book in Peterson projection, inside of that same book, he has a map like this. And he says, maybe the Australians are not wrong. Maybe they're not down under. Maybe we're upside down. But he can't sell this to the schools or he'll be broke. So he doesn't sell this. He just lets you know that this is probably the proper spatial perspective of the world. See, he's trying to make money. He, he has to send his kids to school. Okay. But this is a proper spatial. So this is how the Africans left the continent. So you begin to see. So up here, I drew Africa. So no, I didn't draw it upside down. You've been upside down. <laughs> the Hopi River, which they call the Nile, does not flow up north. It flows down north. Europe is not above Africa, like they've been telling you your whole life. It's below <laughs> Africa. <coughs> the whole continent, Africa is the only continent between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cor Cancer with the equator almost dividing it directly in half. No other continent has that. That means that you're a tropical and subtropical people. And it doesn't matter that you were born in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago. Within your veins, your DNA, you are still a tropical and subtropical person. So you should be eating like that. Your stomach culture is still that. So I need to just make sure that cool. This word, mahet, means north, but it also means down. This word, the word uh, sut, or sutin, or suti, or rashi, means south, but it also means up. This word, amenti, means west, but it also means right. This word, yabit, means east, but it also means left. We had this plotted before the Europeans knew there was direct directions. Come on. Before the Asiatics came out of their caves and were civilized by us. And so we set up directions. And in order for your west to be on the right side, you have to be facing like this, facing up to the land of where your ancestors come from. But the Kaaba showed you that in this region, in Central Africa, is the origins of where all of us come from. And from there, we migrated to the continents. So you need to be real clear on our migration. And we stayed, when we migrated into Asia and into Australia, we stayed along the coast here. And so all the people along the coast here are people that have melanin. And all out, if you've ever been to Papua New Guinea, you would think you were in the Congo. Same culture, everything, just a different language. Go to Australia, you would still think you're in East Africa or Madagascar. Same people. In Madagascar, there are also people with uh, black skin, with sandy blonde red hair. Just like that. But look where, look where Australia is and look where Madagascar. They're on the same parallel. Same meridian. Y'all understand what's going on? There's a science here that our ancestors laid down. So not only did they plot the stars, they plotted the earth 
The grids ran right through where the pyramids are. Sacred grids. There are three major points we call mountains of the moon. Kilimanjaro means mountain of the moon in Kiswahili. Mount Wanzuri is mountain of the moon in one of the languages in Uganda. And Mount Choka, mountain of the moon in Ethiopia. All of them feed into the Nile, which was in ancient time was called Hapi. Not happy, I know you happy for the information, but it was happy, okay? So, uh, a twisted rope, flat, which also symbolizes your DNA. I'm gonna really get into this Madhu Netcha, if y'all give me a minute, because this is your classical language. Thank you. Think about it. The Madhu Netcha was ancient before the first Greek got to Greece. So you know Greek can't be your classical language. So you have to be really clear. We are the original inhabitants of the area they call Greece. That used to be all water and, and canals, and we drained the land and started civilization as a colony there. And the Wazungu coming out of the rainforest got tired of eating each other, and they began to migrate around us. And then they became the first ones with Macedonia and then into Egypt. I mean, excuse me, into the land we call Greek today. Okay. Um, so this is the word hoppy. The twisted flax said it's your DNA. So our lifespan is connected to the Hopi River. There is the hand. This is a receiving information, receiving knowledge, receiving life. There is the mat in which everything rests. If you know in Africa, you, you sleep on the mat, you eat on the mat, you rest on the mat, you have confidence on the mat. And when it gets deep, you roll up your mat and take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the canal. The canal, myrrh. And even the same word for love is myrrh. But this canal, you, if you don't have no water, you ain't got no love. Look where there's no water. There's no love. Okay. And so they built canals to go out in to make sure that the love was every place they were. And then you see the three waves of energy, which is also the word for water, mu. And then happy, uh, there's a little um, uh, amorphodite at the end. It's a man, beard, he has a breast, he's pregnant. He has a phallus, he got it all. <laughs> what is trying to show you that it can give life by itself, just very nature, harnesses life. Okay, so Hopi, this is our lifeline. It goes from Central Africa, it's over 4,160 miles long, the longest river in the world. That's not an accident. So we have to understand this lifeline. It's a cultural highway. Not only did the information come from in, inside of Africa, traveling down the Hopi River, the culture flowed that way, the language flowed that way, and trade. So it became a cultural highway, a com economic commercial highway, and all of that. And trade took place in Africa, all the way to South Africa, in for tens, for literally hundreds of thousands of years before we left the continent. But when we left the continent, brothers and sisters, we were intact already. We set up the first dynasty in China, the Shang dynasty, actually the first two dynasties mm -hmm. in China. We taught them the language of reading. That's why their writing is down like ours, goes from right to left and top down, just like ours. But like Brother Kabul talked about, they got words in there that's not indicative to their culture. And so somebody came in and helped them set this up, took their language and stuff. They, Every word that re makes reference to astrology, astronomy, or the sky is an African word. Come on. You need to be clear about that. Very okay, clear. I, I'm what, a lot of places all along here are imitations of actually what's going on here that's left in this world. Because you have to understand, at the last flood, all of this area went under. Africa is a plateau, the whole continent. The whole continent is a plateau. And so when Europe was totally submerged with water, well, ice first and then water, Africa was still a valuable place. This is why they don't want you to know geography. But how many people saw the movie 2012? When the water finally receded and the rest of the world was destroyed, where were they at? Africa. Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this information is there. Uh, a lot of people, my more brothers, I'm a more, a lot of people, you know, no, civilization was here in North America first. No, I need to tell you, during the Ice Age, North America all the way to, to Florida was under ice. 
where there was a flourishing civilization here, this was under ice. People don't know geography. Some of the brothers was like, no, when the continents move, you know, we move with it. Like they were surfing the continents as they was moving. No. When the continents moved, <laughs> there was no people here. All right, so I need to be real clear about that. They talk about, what, 65 million years ago was the last disaster. They got footprints and stuff like that of human beings older than that. But we won't go that deep yet. Don't want to go that deep. Right. Now, now that we got our spatial perspective correct, you're not getting orientated here. You got your proper spatial perspective together. And you'll understand. In the Hopi River, we buried our dead on the western bank of the Nile where the sun sets. Okay? The sun rose on the east and sets in the west. We face most of our temples orientated like this or south in the direction of our ancestors. Okay? Not north. So you need to be very, very clear about this. So now that we got our spatial perspective right, we have a little direction of what's going on in the interior. I want to talk about some of these places. Ancient Kemet could not come into existence without places like this first. This is called, let me erase some of this so that you can see what's going on. Take your time. This first one is called Ta Seti. Ta Seti is one of the ancient names of Kush or Kash or what you call Sudan in present day. It means the land of the bow. We were the greatest archers in the world. How many people saw the movie Hero? Right, with Jet Li and all of right? Yeah. Remember the archers and the bow? They took that from ancient Kush. The Chinese do us in that deep with the arrow until we introduced it to them. So that was a scene coming out of ancient Kush where your arrow, when we attacked our opponent, and there were so many archers that the sky turned black. Okay, so I need you to clearly understand. Taseti, another name for ancient Kush. We also call that area Kosh. I know today we use Kush. That's just a European veneration. If you learn them to do nature, it's Kosh. And that's why you'll see Kashite, Kashata, uh, Kushata. You know, all those are venerations of Kosh. So Kush is a modern rendition of the ancient name Kosh. Okay. When you see mountains at the end, it just meant that this was a foreign land outside of ancient Kemet. So when ancient, because I'm writing it the way the ancient Quebec de Oum wrote the name of these countries. When they wrote their name, they probably wouldn't have had foreign mountains there. Okay? But if you understand the Hopi Valley, everything outside of Kemet, you got to go to the mountains. And so that's why when they talk about foreign countries, this is a determinative that means this is outside of the borders of Kemet. So, Taseti Kai. Also, they call it Tanahesi. Tanahesi, the land of the Hesi bird, the guinea fowl. Okay? Um, where the Nechanit is, who is the archer. Okay, and I'm going to go into some of the Nechanit in a minute. This is the, one of the most affectionate names of Kemet, and it's written like this. Kemet, the black community. This is the determinative for community, city, or town. Not the black land, like the European Egypt. See, the European Egyptologists didn't even want you to know it meant black anything. But then we start reading them and do Nechanit, and they would say, oh, okay, South Africa, maybe South Box. Okay, all right, y'all got the black part down. But it's black land. Because the Nile overflow will leave everything black. So I had never went to Egypt at the time. So I said, okay, that, that sounds pretty good. Fertile land, black land. But then I, I start doing my reading, and the people were called the Kemetic U, the black people. I said, did the Nile overflow on them too? <laughs> no, this black means something else. This is talking about melanin. All right. All right. Dr. Ben liked to use this. This is one of their most affectionate names. Ta Mary. It means the beloved land. That's the affection they had for the land, the beloved land. And it was righteous all year round. This is the symbol for year. And so their community was beloved all year round. Ooh. And they got a snake by that name. Okay, all right. Yeah. And this is called, this is the third name of ancient Kemet. So Kemet had three major names now. The other one is Sima Tawi, the united two lands. This is the heart with the trachealer veins so the oxygen can get in there, because if there's no oxygen going to the heart, that's all, folks. All right? So that's unity. Shows unity here. So Sima Tawi, the united two lands. So that's what ancient Kemet. This is the mother, the parents of ancient Kemet. And now this is Kemet. 
So this is why it's so important for you. This land, this is three dots there represent the, uh, the uh, mineral carbon. This land, when the ancient Kemet Um talk about eternity, they do something like this. Watch this. That's one of the ways they write eternity, right? As long as energy exists within your DNA and the light of Ra shines, you shall exist. Mm -hmm. This is why they don't want you to know your language. I'm going to break it down. Okay. They also make forever and eternity like this. The cobra symbolizing, symbolizing your spine of your kundalini. As long as there's energy in your mind, you should be able to nourish yourself on the land. As long as the land exists, you will have nourishment, you will have energy, then you shall exist. You see how important this language is. So it speaks to us. It talks about who we are and how we are to flourish off of Ra and the land. Okay, so you need to stand. There's three major domains on this planet. Each planet different and within the solar system. You have the mineral domain, which is based upon carbon, which is black. You have the plant, the plant domain, which is based on chlorophyll, which is green. And then you have the animal domain, which is based on melanin, which is black. So only black and green are sources of light. That's why Asar, we, we picked it green and called the great black. Chlorophyll is to plants as melanin is to human beings, as carbon is to the land. Right? So hopefully that will resonate on you. Okay. So again, this importance of jumping into the Purdue Netcher. And you notice when we wrote the family, the black family, we have the child, the woman, and the man. Not two brothers. Or my two sisters up there. Okay. That's representing eternity. Okay, all right. So we're jumping in here. All right. So is everybody comfortable with what I got up there? You understand what's going on? You understand why it's so important for us to understand the Madhu Detra. Now, ancient Kemet, most of us are mesmerized by the, the pictures, the gold, the jewelry, and all those things. But what's really so dynamic about Kemet is the mathematics. It's their ability to understand so above, so below. Even a town, these districts in ancient Kemet were written like, uh, okay, everybody got this down. You, have, okay. you understand that you've been on your head your whole life? Okay, I can move the board. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, they're moving to the modern era. Okay, all right. Um, I wanted people to know that, for example, This word, pet, means heaven. Heaven. This is like the skyline of the earth. And the creator rests and is known through the cosmos. Heaven. Sky. The districts in ancient Kemet, there were 42, were called Sapet. Pet. And this is Sapet. Or if in the plural, Sapetu or Sahut. This means to cause to be like heaven. Mm. So every district was trying to imitate a cosmological phenomena that existed in the sky. Which means that you already, before you had Kemet, before you broke the 42 districts down, you already had to plot the sky. You already understood the zoomorphic energy in the sky representing certain energies. So, in ancient Kemet, every sepet, the cause like, had to have a zoomorphic image in the sky. Like your school had to have a mascot. Every state has to have a flag. So, every sepet had a flag, had a zoomorphic energy, 
It had a bird, a stone, a crystal, a oil. And so today, each state in the United States, because you had 53 of the 56 people who signed a Declaration of Independence were all Freemasons, they were studying this. So every state got a flag, they got a flower, got a bird. They, they didn't get that from Europe. That's all Africa. Right? So I need you to clearly understand that, where that phenomena comes from. We took this really serious. Like we plotted the heavens, and we took that information and duplicated it on Earth. All right? So, Madhu Neche. Why is this so divine? Why is it you got classical language? It's divine words of the creator. Madhu represent words. But what kind of words? This is a walking stick of an elder. So it's just not any words. It's wise words of an elder. A wise word of an elder who's connected to divinity. And so that was the spoken language and the written language. Um, I'm going to pass this around. This is so-called how they were supposed to um, break the code of how to read the Badu Neche. This is called the Rosetta Stone. This is a duplicate of the Rosetta Stone. I know we talked about it, but uh, like Brother Kaba, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm a touchy-feely guy. You know, I want you to touch it, feel it. <laughs> Just don't sit on it. Okay, pass that, <laughs> pass that around. So you can see the three different types of languages that they help. What they didn't tell you is that Rosetta, that Chapelion, best friend, had taught him Coptic. And Coptic is the last version of the Madhu Neche. They didn't tell you that. My sister had a question over there. What? Well, it's divine words, but I was letting you know that the words represent words of an elder. So it's divine words of our elders expressed through the Creator. Mostly, we're going to have a question and answer period, you know, so uh, here we go. So, Netsha. Now, some of our brothers who don't speak the language are regurgitating what the Europeans say, so they break this down and they just use NTR. And they say Netsha. But I want you to know, in the old period, the first golden age, and in the second golden age, they used the word nature, and they spelt it like this. So that's why we have to know the glyphs. This word is T-C-H. So this is N, T-C-H, R, the nature. It's where the word nature comes from. If you put your vowels in, you get the word nature. What does nature mean to you? Huh? Come on, give me some definitions of nature. Life. Air. Life. Wind. Air. Fire. Energy. Energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the way we look at the creator. It was divine, a divine nature. That's everything. Don't substitute this word for God. All of the Egyptologists and even our own African scholars just substitute nature for God. God is a Gothic word and it doesn't mean this. Because when I say the nature, I'm talking about the heartbeat, the beat in between the heart. That which cannot be seen, that which is still coming into being. My shoes. <laughs> yeah, the nature is all that exists. There's nothing outside of the nature. I don't think when you're in church, I don't think they kind of say God is like that. You know, God ain't no bug. You know, they're not thinking that. But you know, no, we're thinking that, oh no, that but God is expressed in that thing. And therefore, I don't need to be smashing it. Just pick it up and put it outside. It was probably there before you were. Okay, all right. Nature, everything is divine. And so therefore, we look at nature differently. Everybody who came to ancient Kush or Kemet in Africa said, these are the most divine spiritual people we have ever seen. In fact, they are fanatical about it. We were only fanatical about it because they were absent of it. What's being fanatical about giving homage and life to all living beings? How many of y'all in your biology class or something had organic and inorganic? Mm -hmm. Some things had life and some things didn't. That don't even make no sense. Everything has life. Energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed from one state to another. Only the creator creates. All we do is reorganize the nature's creation. Mm, break it down. Y'all understand that? Yes. Don't let them bamboozle you there. 
you know, in a class called chemistry. Chem, the black science. How many people understood that when they got in their chemistry class that you were studying the black science? Nobody. Okay, that means you've been bamboozled. Okay. All right. So, are we clear on this word, this language, madu netcha, what it means, and why we need to understand the language? Because it went from there to netcha. See, the Egyptologists will put a, a line under the T, and that means that's TCH, right? Tetch. But after a while, the line just vanished, and people just said netcha. And now people, and then people add S on here talking about the netters. I don't know what they're talking about. Okay? When you want to make it plural, it becomes the netteru. Now, I need to stay here because here we go. The gods and goddesses of Egypt. No way do you work. No, brothers and sisters. No gods and goddesses of Egypt. The divine principles and laws of ancient Egypt. Each one of y'all, see, once you know, you got a responsibility. Before y'all were ignorant. Everybody take a sniff. Go in. Oh. Once you know, you have a responsibility. <laughs> Somebody can't get the sniff? They, 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 they're missing the oil? Okay. Well, right. missing the <laughs> okay, the Rosetta Stone. So, let me just take a minute now and go through the natural rules since we are right there. The divine principles and laws. And people, everybody in this room, I don't care if you're a Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, you haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> the divine principles and laws don't care. Everybody in here is familiar with gravity? Do you think gravity cares if you like it or not? Do you think gravity cares who you are, whether it's going to respond to you? No, gravity gets us all. It's a principle. It's a law. It's set up by the divine creator. And it acts on all of us unless you become creator-like. And only when you become creator-like can you mind melt with that energy and alter its state. That's what alchemy and stuff is all about. Transferring the energy and the vibration because everything in the universe is energy. So that means the only way you can defy a law or a principle is you become the law or principle and you redefine it within your own paradigm. Some of y'all will get that in the morning. Okay, now. Haru in Maketi. How many of y'all want to call this something else? Come on, level with me. You want to call it the what? The Sphinx, y'all. Yeah? Come on out with it. The Sphinx, a mythological creature that comes from Europe that has wings that will kill you if you don't know the riddle. Has nothing to do with Haru in Maketi. To master your animal domain, which is like the lion, to rise to your highest spiritual nature, which is the high priest. So now, if your son says, I want to be a Sphinx, or if he says, I want to be Haru in Akhet, which one would you send to? Right, he says, Dad or Mom, I want to protect our family and our culture from sunrise to sunset, and I want to be like Haru, the champion of the people. You see, that's why we can't let other people define our stuff. Haru im Aketi. Let me hear y'all say it. Haru im Aketi. All right. I can feel the vibration go up. All right. Washington, D.C. How many people have been there? You've seen the Washington Monument? Some of y'all think it came from Washington. No? This is imitation. This is the Tekken. How many people saw our video of the Tekken? All right, I'd like to see that uh, after all this. Yeah, give yourself something. Support yourself. Okay. The second is of our spiritual energy representing the masculine phallic symbol, which has to interconnect with the female symbol in order to create life. But it's symbolic of our resurrection, our rebirth, our renewal. There were usually two of these set on both sides of all the temples in Kemet to represent the father and the son, Asar and Aset. The ruling king was Haru. When he died, he became Asar, to resurrect, to be reborn, to live over and over and over again. And we bear witness because we are their children. And we, they live through us. Let me make this statement, y'all. You are the ancestor. The ancestor is not somebody you just pour like <laughs> Because I, I embody the natural root. I embody their energy. That's what you got to do when you're fighting this enemy here. See, let me tell you this. Remember I said we were covering addicts of white male domination? If you're thinking 
Like they're thinking, just with a little Afrocentric flavor. That's what we're doing. So come on, we still on the Dutch TV. You still them with a little African flavor. <laughs> just put a little African flavor in there. You know, you know, you put a little vanilla, you know, a little chocolate. No, you just put a little African and set and some European Caucasian flavor. So they know what you're gonna do before you do it. <clears throat> Cause you're trying to imitate them to get free. When you speak their name, Marcus, when you speak their names. They resonate within you. Okay? That gives you your energy, your responsibility. When you say Harriet Tubman, you're leading the Underground Railroad. Even if it's just your neighborhood, help somebody. What? Harriet said she could have helped hundreds of thousands more if we only knew we were slaves. If you only knew you was upside down, you'd be able to get yourself straight. So it's your job to help to be like Harriet Tubman. So when you mention these names, so that's the first way. You speak their name. Number two, you deify their complete works. These are their complete works. They laid down the principles, the laws of the universe. They charted the stars. They set up the zodiac, the zoomorphic energy of the sky that exists within us. The combination of all the animals in the world exists within you. You ever seen a fetus going through its various stages? It goes through the, uh, the, what, uh, the water stage, the amphibian stage, to the mammal stage. You are a combination of all the animals that exist on Earth. They exist within you, but you're taking it to a higher conscious because you can act like the creator. You can take the thought and create it to anything you want. So we are nature-like. So when I open up and say we are divine spiritual beings, having a divine human experience, look at yourself as a divine being. How many people have seen this? You bump into something and go, oh, I'm so clumsy. You know, no. That's called negative self-talk. That permeates in your water. Your body is 75% water. Water holds more memory than any molecule on the planet Earth. So when you speak to your water, your water reflects that energy back. So that's why positive affirmation is so powerful because when you speak to yourself, that resonates in your water and your water says, yeah, yeah. So you don't get in the mirror talking about, oh, it's a bad hair day. I can't get it together. No. Then you think your hair bad? It's really going to get funky. Okay? No. <laughs> speak what you want. Don't talk about how broke you are. Talk about how your funds is getting ready to come in. They're a little low now. You got that disease called my funds is low. Okay, but you, but you, you're getting ready. To, it's coming. You can flow it. Can you feel it, brother? It's coming in. All right, all right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's coming. Speak what you want. That's why in all the sacred books it says, "In the beginning was the what? Word. And the word was what? With God. With God. And the word was With God. Where do you think they got that from? Amen. 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 Okay. All right. Amen. Amen. Let me go here. Sabek. They don't usually tell you about this. Come on and break them down. Sabek is the comedic word for time. The Sabek has 60 teeth, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 vertebrae going down his back, 60 minutes in an hour. <laughs> this goes on. Sabek is amphibious, but yet it's mammal. It lays eggs like a bird, but yet it's a mammal. It has to lay its eggs outside of the water. And so when the Nile was getting ready to overflow, Sabek knew just how high the Nile would flow, plant his eggs at that level, and the people knew where to start moving their things to. Because that's how in tune Sebek was with the flow of the Nile and, and the energy that exists within Buddhism. We have that ability, we just kind of lost ours. Okay? But Sebek, symbolic of time. Sebek is another energy of, of Setesh. Okay? Sebek, the crocodile, will only bother you if you are confused and don't know what you're doing. <laughs> when the Nile, when the Hopi River was low, Hopi, the Sebek would come on land looking for some food. Now, if the Hopi River is low, you know you ain't supposed to be hanging down there, taking a nap on the beach. <laughs> then you was going to be a snack, okay? <laughs> and then you want to be mad at Sebek. He's doing what he was doing. You were not doing what you were supposed to be doing. Controller of time. You can't control time. Control your energy within time because time is only a concept of consciousness. Our ancestors were able to travel through time because they bent it based upon their consciousness. So you didn't take you a thousand years to go to another planet. You can get here like that. 
they talk about we come from Sebet, uh, Spadet. If you were on a spaceship like we have today, it would be a thousand years to get there. They got there like that. It was a bit of time because time is only relevant to your level of consciousness. This brother, this happens to be Usur Ma'at Ra, Setepin Ra, the person they call Ramses II. He's wearing a caprice crown, the blue crown. If you see little curls, little knots up on top of here, it represents a hairstyle. In my book, I showed about it. The Watusi, the Zulu, all of them wore this hairstyle during the second golden age when it came to an end and we got invaded by the Hyksos and Asiatic foreigners who ruled Kemet for maybe 100 plus years. When they were kicked out, the brothers from the south, up south, where's my map? No, no, oh, I saw it here. That's all right. <laughs> I got a backup. <laughs> the brothers from the, you see, we have to manufacture our own stuff. That just goes in here. I don't depend upon the Wazugo information. We got our own stuff because we are the creators of all this stuff. We have to go back and producing our own books, producing our own tapes, producing our own works, producing our own houses. Most of our houses are backwards and set up for Wazungu. We need to change it. Why do you want the energy from Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? Mm. Mm. Let me say that again. Why do you plug into Khan Ed when you got Ra, the sun? You see how we're depending upon our former enslavers? We need to come together. And we need to make it happen. Ra's still waiting on us. <coughs> All right, man. So, our brothers who came from up south wore this hairstyle as they kicked the enemy, the Hyksos, butt all the way back into Asia. The ancient Kemet de Oud was so, uh, so thankful and so appreciative of this that they developed a crown, a war crown, it's called the war crown, that whenever they went into battle, and it didn't have to be physical battle, it could be a spiritual battle. Whenever they were having large meetings to organize the community, then the suit put this crown on. So this is from the third golden age on, that's the so-called 18th dynasty. So from that dynasty on is the only time you see this crown. So if you see somebody with this crown, they try to say that was the old period or the first period. Eh, wrong, okay? You know your story. Third golden age on, 18th dynasty on, okay? I set. I have to put a set with a saw. We have saw the great black. I set. Let me write her name down so that y'all see this connection between the two. This is the right angle that the Masons and everybody get all excited about. Okay. Um, you stand on your square, brother. You know, okay. But in here, <laughs> there would be a, the Simatawi, and they would have the a lotus plant and the papyrus plant tied with a knot showing the unification of upper and lower Kemet. Okay? And it's on the square. This is the throne. This is how you write Aset's name. Aset. She is the throne maker. No ruler in Kemet can sit on the throne until they come through her, through the woman. And so, brothers, when you think you're ruling the house, you rule through your woman. Okay? She is the throne. When they want to write Asar's name, you got the throne there, right? But, His name, Wasar or Asar, is like that because he is the I behind the throne. Er also is an action verb that means to make, to do, to bring things, to make things happen. And so he takes the energy from the feminine energy and makes it happen. He is the I that protects the throne. That's why he has the cobra and the uraeus on top of his head. That represents upper and lower Kemet, the two ladies. The two women, that's called Nepti. So you have Nepti. You have uh, on this side, you have the vulture. And on this side, you have the coat. Wajet and Nekabet. All right? And so when the king has these two symbols on his crown, that represents that he is a protector of the two energies. And 
You'll see this on all of the masseuse. Usually the woman only has the cobra on her head, but everybody is seeing this. You've seen the bust uh, on my table. I got a bust of, uh, I guess you see the cobra. That represents the Nebji. The two ladies, women, in ancient Kemet, they constantly showed you just how important you are, how powerful you were, that we exist through you. Our very nature is to protect you and to keep you because you are a divine essence of all life on this planet. So brothers, can y'all give these sisters a hand? Right now. Show them an appreciation for them. Stand up and get them a standing ovation. Stand up, brothers. why we do what we do. We ain't doing this for the other brother, like Alexander and his Greek army. <laughs> now you know, Alexander was gay, even though know, he was undefeated in battle. He would always put, he would divide the lovers up and have them fight from both sides. And so the lovers, and they would put the enemy in between. So the lovers was fighting to get through the enemy to get to their lover on the other side. So they were tenacious warriors. <laughs> Okay, all right, so we're not going there. <laughs> so, you understand this feminine nature. So, Asar became the eye, the maker, the doer, Aset. She is the feminine energy, the mut, the womb. On top of her head, she has the cow, because she was also depicted as the great cow, like in Het Haru, that's what's up here. Het Haru, Aset, Neverhead, sometimes they would be all intertwined, because they represent the mut the mother energy. And the mother energy would be depicted by the vulture. Now I know I was teaching them to do nature class, and his sister said, oh, so y'all the great falcon, and we got to be a buzzer. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, sister, no, you went real left, you were real European on me. <laughs> you got to alter your state of consciousness. See, you only came like that because you was upside down. What you should have asked me was, well, what does this buzzer just represent? And you'll realize, that it's one of the greatest nurturing mothers on the universe. Right. It will eat off its own leg, chew it up, and feed it to its children when there's no food. That's right. it, it, the, the female vulture doesn't need a male to get pregnant. It faces the eastern wind, and the wind impregnates. Shoot. We call it shoot. The cosmic, the cosmic winds of the universe. Not only that, she has such a powerful stomach acid she can devour a, a caucus that has maggots and everything on it that would make any other animal sick. She can digest it and then regurgitate it and feed it to her young and it would be nurturing food. So what she did, she took all the caucuses and all the things that would cause disease and cleaned it up. And so, come on, brothers and sisters, you know, like, when stuff get real funky, you call the woman up in there. You know, you got the little baby until something happened, then go back to mommy. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. And she's the one that cleans up the filth, you know, and everything, you know. Uh, you throw up, you know, like, oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> all right. So mut, that's that mothering energy. And we can go on and on and on. So that's why you have to know these things in nature. Because I'm sure, just raise your hand if you had a negative idea of the vulture. Raise your hand. Look at that. That's because you are upside down, on your head, taking your information from your enemy. And you're starting to see why we need to change our paradigm. 2012 is here. You're going to die with your enemy unless you change. You understand where we're coming from? Brother Kaba made it real clear that the Japanese had a chance to change at the end of World War II. They were the leading industry of solar energy, but they chose nuclear energy instead. They wanted to follow the Europeans. They want to out-European the Europeans. And now they've almost dug their own grave. Okay, y'all? All right, y'all see what I'm talking about. The Chinese people are only able to get themselves together when they chased their enemy out and had a cultural revolution. When they opened up them doors, they knew who they were. Say it again, I don't get that. <laughs> a cultural revolution. Malcolm made it clear. Made it real clear. Okay? He showed a picture of a a, a 10 year old girl blowing her father's brains out because he was an Uncle Tom Chinaman. When that girl grew up to be a full grown woman, there were almost no more Toms in China. Think about it in America. Toms is on the, the cover of Life magazine. Com, 
Times is on the cover of that comic book, Ebony and Jet. Times, Times is old. Times is everywhere. You actually look up the Times. Son, I want you to go off and be like that time. I mean, uh, Dr. So-and-so, okay? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Times get Nobel Peace Prizes when there's no peace. Now, if the wolf gives the sheep a peace prize, and the wolf is fat and the sheep is skinny, there's a problem there. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't see it. And we like, yes, yeah, son. Yeah, daughter, you grow up and you might get one of those too. No, you don't want one of those. <laughs> okay, all right, let's jump back in here. Right. <laughs> the first family, the first trinity, Hassar, Arset, and Haru. I hope I don't, I know we got some Jesus folks up in here. They're sneaking everywhere. <laughs> oh, I got some, some born-again Kometa U people in here. You know, like Ray Higgins. He was, the first time he heard the word Haru in a meeting, he wanted to fight. No, oh, Jesus ain't got nothing to do with no Haru. You know, he wanted to beat them. He's supposed to be a Christian minister. He's ready to fight, beat somebody up, because they confused Jesus with Haru. But just give him the tape. Look at this. Read this book, 18 Crucified Saviors Before J.C. And they all did exactly the same thing that J.C. did prior to him. So J.C. just had a, he had a map, right? If you want to, that energy, somebody followed that energy that was already laid out, and all he did was do everything everybody else did. Okay. You had the father, the son, and Haru. The son is Haru. The word hero comes from the word Haru, because Haru is just H-R-U. If I put an E there, and the O and the O sound the same, the word hero, which means champion of the people. Peru fights against Isfet. Right. Peru is your consciousness. A lot of the, in the Sufi, 50, the rulers, would have the falcon on the back of their head because they represent higher consciousness. Higher consciousness. Okay? And so that means that you got to be in battle every day. I love this example of ancient Kenya. It's not like you can mess up all week and go to church on Sunday and it's okay. Or do Sabbath on Saturday. And, and you'd be forgiven for your sin. Or just confess to Father. Father, I raped a whole lot of people and did some messed up stuff this week, but I know you're going to forgive me. No. Haru says, you have to be a champion every day. How would you feel, let's say it's 90 degrees today, that means Rob was really, really cooking, right? Rob was out there, y'all was just, you know, oh, yeah. And then Ross said, well, look, I was so good today, I think I'm just not going to come out for a couple days. What would happen? Yeah. If Ra act like Negroes, <laughs> 2012 would have been here yesterday. <laughs> okay, all right? So Ra is consistent every single day. The universe is consistent every single day. The cosmos is consistent every single day. Energy is flowing every second of every single day. Negroes take breaks every single day. <laughs> People, you got to kill the Negro inside of you. You got to resurrect. You got to be reborn. You got to be Haru. I want to hear some born again Haru energy up in here. Okay? <laughs> That's what you need. Every day, and I don't care how bad you were yesterday. I don't care if you gave a smoking lecture, you did a whole bunch of stuff, and so today you're just gonna get high and hang out. No! <laughs> you gotta come back today and you gotta be on it also. You know? So you will never see him from DC at Smitty's Bar having barbecue and hanging out with the boys, talking stuff. Because <laughs> then it will contradict everything that we're about. Do y'all understand? You gotta be Haru all the time. You gotta be a champion of the people. If you tell your children, just do what I say, not what I do, what's gonna happen? We already know what's gonna happen. What's happening now? Pass down. Right, okay, all right. All right, so Haru is the champion of the people. He's the champion because he does battle with Isfet. Isfet is that energy that wants to pull you out of balance, wants to pull you out of harmony. You say, okay, bean sprouts, chocolate chips. We had bean sprouts yesterday. So. <laughs> Set, right? that, you lost. Listen, the ancient Kemetra'u makes it real clear. Everything is either life-giving 
or life-threatening. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. Life-giving or life-threatening. When you get ready to eat, life-giving, life-threatening. You have a mate, life-giving, life-threatening. I'm not talking about how hot she is or how tough or buff she is. Life-giving or life-threatening. You getting ready to go out that evening. Is it a life-giving experience or a life-threatening experience? If you're at Smitty's Bar having barbecue with the boys with a cold one, I think that's a life-threatening situation. Okay. So even if you don't even, if you don't do what everybody around you was doing, you get caught in it. Listen, I was one of the priests that they brought in for the uh, vigilance for the World Trade Center for all those blacks who died in the World Trade Center. But one of the things I made sure as we talked about their souls being resurrected and the death. When you eat with Stormy, you die with Stormy. If you wallow in the mud, you get dead. If you're playing in the funk, you got to get funky. Brothers and sisters, you need to get the European mindset out of your consciousness. You need to get them off your back, your clothes. You need to get them out of your diet. You need to get them out of your bed. You need to get them out of your total consciousness so that you can go back to being the creators that you rise waiting on you, ready to give you all the energy you need. All the energy you need. I tell you, I don't have no bad days. Every day is a great, magnificent day. Because you determine how dynamic you're going to be. You determine how much money you want to make. You determine where you want to go. I wanted to go to Kevin. 1981, I went with Dr. Ben. You know, I gave him this thesis, this paper and everything. He said, okay, listen, I'll let you go for half price, but you're going to be my aide. I said, oh, bet. I'm down with that. What you want me to do? Okay. That was 1981. I've been to Kemet over 25 times, and I've never paid again. You will. You don't need no money. You need your mind. Some of you think you never left anything in Africa. No, you left your mind there. You need to reconnect. Reconnect. Reconnect to the whole continent. Reconnect. Yes, we are the indigenous people here, but you need to go where they came from here. You need to keep that going. Um, so Haru, the father, the son, the, the mother, the father, and the son, the holy trinity. And so you can see where the Christian, now let me just say this. Mary, I mean, I said other name is Mary, the beloved one. That's why Jesus' mother had to be Mary. Mary means the beloved one. So she had the same mother that Jesus had because he's the imitation of her. At 30, he went to do, to go, well, at 13, he went to do his father's work. Haru went to go train with his uncle, Haru Ur, in the temples at 13. At 30, he came back to do battle with Seth. Jesus came back to do his, his teaching at 30. The 12 disciples are the 12 zodiac. It had nothing to do with no people. The book is a book of astrology and astronomy. How many people look at their horoscope every day or every other day? Come on, raise your hand. It's not a horoscope. Hora is the word for haru. Scope is what you look at, so it's haru's vision. You're checking out haru's vision. We created this so that we can see where we were going before we got there. And when you get a, a view from the height, you get a sky view. So your Haru vision, your horoscope, is a vision of your future and where you've been so that you, if it was good, you can get there again. If it wasn't, you know how not to go there. Right. Okay? And it kind of gave you a peek into where you were headed. It was a, what is it called? Uh, what's that system? The PG, uh, the, the, the car that helped you get there? What is that? GPS. Yeah. GP, what is it? Global positioning. GPS. The GPS system. But Haru, your consciousness, you got that inside. Your cell phone is imitating what you were able to do by sending energy out there. Okay. So we got the Holy Trinity now. Let me come over here. Second, the daughter of Ra. The daughter of Ra. Sekhmet. I see a couple of Sekhmet people hiding over there. Okay, all right. <laughs> when things were going wrong and people got confused, Ra sent his daughter down to straighten stuff up. So Sekhmet went down, and Sekhmet's job was only to mess with folks who weren't together. But Sekmo, Sekhmet found so many people that weren't together, she started devouring everybody. So the Netcharu 
came up and said, Rob, you got to do something about Sekhmet. She just doing everybody in. She just fell in love with blood. She just drinking blood. She just killing everybody. <laughs> None of the other natural roots said, oh, no, I ain't messing with that sister. And y'all know, brothers, I don't care how bad a brother is. You ain't seen a real fight. You see some sisters. <laughs> Brothers, we just trying to be outdo each other. You know, we trying to get all pretty, knock them out, and yeah. You know, I'm like, sisters, we trying to kill each other. Ah, ah, pull their hair out. Ah, you can get a hold of them. Ah, kill them. I ain't never seen a brothers fight like that. <laughs> so, second man was doing everybody in. So none of the other natural said, no, uh, uh-uh, uh, I ain't touching that. Uh, uh-uh, uh, bro, you gotta do. You send Jabuti down there. So Jabuti. Articulate mind, thought, articulate writing, articulate speech, articulate action. So Jabuti came and obsessed the situation. He said, oh, okay. She just fell in love with blood. So I'm just going to use some black magic on her. Jabuti turned the Nile Hopi River red. And told Sekhmet, you don't have to kill nobody else. Let's go to the Nile and have a drink. Mm-hmm. Second, saw all the blood. Oh, wow. Just dove in. The... But it was wine. <laughs> she got all drunk. <laughs> and when she got almost ready to pass out, Haru, I mean, Jehuti, just put a spell on her and said, when you awaken, you will be Basel. You will no longer be a ferocious lioness. You will be a gentle, beautiful, purring black. And you will adorn people, and you will dance, and make music, and you will just be love. And so today, sisters, if you get a little sectation, sectmetic, get some red wine, call it a day, (laughs) put on some black, and just get sexy for your man. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And Jehuti, again, represent articulate thought. Jehuti is not some god outside. Remember, Jehuti exists inside of your mind. Everybody has Jehuti in there. When you're using reasoning, when you're using consciousness, that's your Jehuti thought. Don't give up. Your, the word thought comes from thought. Jehuti, to think. Some of us are not doing that. Okay? So when you're thinking, that's, you're doing your Jehuti. Jehuti is the tongue of Pata, the creative spark of the universe. The creative energy, the architect of the universe, the engineer of life. Jehuti is his tongue. Ra, the creative energy that exists and permeates all things on this planet. Jehuti is his voice. Aman, the unseen energy that permeates every cell and every entity of life throughout the cosmos, is the mind. Jehuti is his mind. So Jehuti, that means that all that is, exists within you. And that's why to educate really means to bring out. The Western world, they stuffing stuff in that you memorize and protect. No, it's to bring out. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. The reason why you're going like, yeah, is because you're resonating on that. That was inside of you. And all I did was bring it to the surface. That's Jehuti. And so he is in there. So y'all got to use your Jehuti. Don't be afraid to put these on your altar and in your house. You ain't bringing some gods and stuff in there. You're bringing divine principles that's going to help you on your mission. And each of these principles can resonate with a Haru vision. They can resonate on your organs that plays the music for your temple. They can resonate on you getting your program together. Maybe you need a little segment in your life. Maybe you need, maybe you've been procrastinating, so you need your hootie on your altar, looking at you in your face every day, so you can do what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. And, and if they don't get it, you get it for them and put the jihuti out there. <laughs> Unpool. A lot of us wear black at funerals. No, you should probably be able to wear white to reflect, to come back so that you can get the energy. Now, European saw that Enpu, Anpu, was black and, and all his priests wore the black that they were preparing the body. So, because they didn't bury their dead. You understand that, right? 
the ancient Asiatics and the, and the ancient Europeans didn't bury your dead. When you're in the cave, ain't no place to bury them. When, when Uncle Raheem dies, you just put him over on the side. You ate him. When you run out of bowls, you just get his head and kind of wash it out. And you drink it out of his skull. Oh, yeah. Right, you know, okay. And that's why they got all these horror pictures, the night of the living dead and all that. Because they were living with the dead people. They were in the cave with them. Look, if you're rocked in an ice glacier that's a mile high, and you can't get out, only certain people can. That means that some people never saw the sun in their whole lifetime. So you're in a cave, you never saw the sun. Uncle Raheem died, you just put him over on the side. You break a mortar set up, he's standing up. Ooh, come out of here, okay? So that's in your subconscious. That's in your subconscious mind. So you got people walking around, you know, half eaten up. You know, come on, Frankenstein, all that. That comes out of the European mind. We created theater, y'all, and we didn't have no horror. That's from the Greek ethic. They created horror. They got the, the fan face and, the, and, the, and the, the sad one and the happy face, you know. No, we just had some happy faces. You know, we had some mystery and stuff like that, but, you know, we were trying to make it real, but the horror stuff, no, we didn't. No, that, that wasn't our cup of tea. Okay? All right? So I need you to understand that. So Anpu was just preparer of the body for the next journey. He has a whole bunch of different names, you know? The one who was the head of the mountain, the one who was leader of the way, the guardian, the transformer, <coughs> you know, all those different names. Each of the Netrahu has many different nicknames. And in my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healing, I break down all the Netrahu, I give you the various different names and their energy, you know? And, and I break down little concepts, like for example, when we say that every living king was Shimsu Haru. Now you say, come on, bro. The king is a bird. <laughs> a pigeon. What's up with that? Uh, there's a person who doesn't understand nature. I said, no, man. The hawk, the hawk, the falcon, and the eagle, they're in the same family. They fly higher than any bird. They got an extra layer of skin that goes over their eye, and they can see directly in the sun. No other creature can do that. They have no rivalry in the sky. Their vision is so keen, they can spot a mouse under a leaf from a mile, hovering a mile in the sky, and they're 99% accurate. Air pilots are imitating falcons. They can calculate the speed in the bend of light as they, a fish is going this way. He's going this way, 70 miles an hour. Dives down, turns in under the water, and comes up 98 times, 99% of the time with the fish. People, they're still trying to calculate that. And so now, if you understand this, this power that the falcon, the eagle has, he has no rivalry in the sky. He perches and has his nest on the highest mountain or the highest tree. Now, so if you understand that because you live in the country and you understand that, and a brother came up to you and said, I'm a mighty falcon. You'd be like, yeah, you got it. <laughs> Especially if you've been acting like a chicken. <laughs> and chicken for breakfast, you know, yeah, you got this. You know, you ain't trying to get away because you ain't no place to go. Ain't no place to hide. Mm. So that's the way the rulers in ancient Kemet, they were Shimsu Haru. They were mighty falcons. So you have to understand nature. But watch this, and I, I teach that everything in nature has at least three levels. You see, this is where the magic is. Watch this. Come on, magical chemist. This is Kepper. Now, I know I'm teaching this in class. This is, oh, you know, you're going to study bugs now. <laughs> no, sister, rise up, rise up. Alternate, you upside down, turn around. Kepper, a dung beetle. So we understand. The first level is the concrete, the physical. What it is? What does the dung beetle do? The dung beetle recycles the filth. In the Serengeti plains in Tanzania, hundreds of uh, elephants, giraffes, zebras, water buffalo, all out grazing. So if you're grazing, if something goes in, it has to what? Come out. So you know it has the potentiality to get very funky. Y'all bear with it. Can I get an amen on that? Amen, amen for the funk. Okay. Now, Kepra cleans up all of the funk. An elephant turd is like this big. Mm -hmm. When it comes down, within two hours, you can't find it. Thousands 
hundreds of thousands of these dung beetles, birds on it. They dig a hole in the ground. That's called irrigation. Then they roll the dung into a perfect sphere. No other creature on the planet can do that. They lay their eggs inside of it and then bury the inside of the ground. So when they put the dung in the ground, that's called what? Fertilization. Irrigation, fertilization. So you see what a Serengeti, the largest grassland in the world is the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. There are more animals there per square mile than any place else on the planet Earth, the home of cattle. In the south, up south. Y'all understand? Y'all with me? Take another sniff, y'all. All right, we're going in. <laughs> okay, that's the physical level. That's the physical level. So we understand that it recycles. It takes filth and cleans it up. In the morning, when you step out in the Tanzania plain and take fresh air. No dung. Right now, they got to they got to import dung beetles to Texas because all the cows is pooping all over every place. The underground water is all polluted and, and, and it's messing up the whole water shift, the whole water shed, and everything like that because they messed up the ecology because they don't know nothing about nature. They kill all of the natural pesticides and in insects with their uh, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. So now, we have a concrete level. Number two is what does it do? It recycles, it comes into being in every day. Because if they took a day off of not collecting the poop, y'all understand what would happen, right? Thousand zebra, thousand wildebeest, thousand and some elephants. All you need is a day off. <laughs> <laughs> y'all got the picture? Everybody got, you got the picture? See, the visualization is happening here. You got the picture. So he's coming into being and he's coming forth every day. You all remember what it was like in New York when the garbage people took uh, one on, on strike, right? It got real funky, literally, in New York, right? Okay, so that's the way nature would be. So nature doesn't take no days off. Only fools and Negroes. Okay, so two coming into being, coming forth. That's the second level. The third level is the spiritual level. Now you get the Egyptology books on hieroglyphics, and they don't even deal with this because they don't understand that. Their pineal gland is like a raisin. It's all dried up. Your pineal gland is like a grape. It's all juicy and stuff, a little big black grape, and you, you're seeing visions and colors on many dimensions, and they don't even know what you're talking about. You be like, Mm -hmm. they got, you know, uh, what, you, what you listening to? They think you got some earplugs in. You ain't got no earplugs in. You just vibing, you know, okay? Because you are everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They can't even understand that. They can't, they can't even phantom that. They outside of that. The average European Caucasian, by the time they're 13 going through puberty, their pineal gland is calcified. Go check me out. So the spiritual level is that Kepra means that spiritually I'm coming into evolving into my mission. And so when Kepra is placed like watch here. When a person dies they put a big Kepra and they put gold around. This is what the nobles do. Yeah, if you were a poor farmer, you didn't get the gold, but you could still get the kepper, okay? Gold intensifies. If we deal with metals, uh, copper conducts electricity, silver metabolizes and keeps things in harmony, vibrating on the pitch it's supposed to be, and gold intensifies. So that's why the thugs is all gold down because it intensifies your thugism. So you ain't a real fella. You got 20 pieces of gold around your neck. You a real thug now, okay? Because it's going to intensify what you're doing, okay? They don't want no silver. They don't want to be metabolized. They don't want to be harmonizing and stuff like that, you know? You know? And they definitely ain't putting no copper on, you know, because, uh, you know. So, but that's what you need to be into. You have to understand. Gold intensifies. Silver metabolizes and keeps harmonic energy, like my eye. And then copper boosts your electric charge, your electrical charge. If you add magnetic to it, and iron, 
then that also helps your flow of energy. So you just gotta do watch out, make sure you got a pacemaker or nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alright. So three levels. The concrete, the abstract, but what it does, and then the spiritual level. So every word in the Madhu Netra is done like that. To come forth, don't mean just to come towards me. To come forth means to come with the flow of energy. Flow the way the universe is flowing. That doesn't mean that. Look, watch this here. And cheer. Cheer is cheer. I don't care if you got three PhDs. It don't get no deeper than that. Y'all understand that? In ancient Kemet, the Nastu. got as deep as you are. Not only was it a sacred divine stool that everyone needs to sit, but the king ruled through the stool. It's like the Ashanti people, the Sri Tishman, the Well, the Nasut will say, I am the Nasut of the Nasut. I am ruler of the sacred stools. Come on. If somebody told you they was the king of the, uh, the chair, you'd be trying to get away from it. Yeah, okay. You got that. Because the chi has a chi in English. This language is limited. In ancient Kemet, it had many divine levels to it. So everything was on at least three levels. There would be more levels, but that, you only learn that through initiation. Okay? So uh, that's what I'm at. And this is how I got into crystallology here, y'all. The crystals we got outside. If you look at here, look. Lapis lazuli, carnelian, turquoise, the gold, the silver, Blue lace agate, emerald. All of these are the stones, and they are consistent with representing the energies in your body. Now, let's just uh, come into Kemet. All this, I was just setting up Kemet. Uh, now, I just want to talk about what is it is in ancient Kemet. First of all, y'all been told the wrong thing again. Every time y'all talk about kings and queens, let me say this. In Kemet, in the Hopi Valley, we had no kings and queens. That's a concept outside of our paradigm. The ruler in ancient Kemet was called the Nasut. And then when he ruled both lands, <coughs> he was called the Nasut Biti. Not Pharaoh. Pharaoh was some Greek word. It comes from the word per-ah. Brother Kava broke down how the word Egypt was a misnomer of Hikapata. Well, Pharaoh comes from the word per-ah, the great house. You don't call the ruler. Obama is the president of the United States. When he comes in, you don't go, oh, they go to White House. No, you said that's President Obama, Barack Obama. Okay? You don't call him the White House. No one called the ruler in ancient Kemet the per ah, the, the, the great house. You called them by their name. They were the Nasut Bitti. Every ruler had at least five names. He had a birthing name. He had a Haru name. He had a golden Haru name. Then he had a Nasubiti name, and then he had a Sa-Ra name. Sa. Ra. So these two names will be put inside of a shin. A shin is an elliptical orbit that shows that the ruler ruled every place that the sun shone. That the sun was shining and it rose and set. How many people call this a cartouche? That's French. It means a cartridge, a bullet. Because that's what it looked like when the French saw it. Don't call those sacred symbols a cartouche, a French name. It's a shin. S H N. Or you can put a little D in there if you can't pronounce it. A shin. So, the Sara and the Nasupiti will be placed inside of a shin. The Sara is the son of the sun. Everybody who went to the temples in ancient Kemet regarded, that's why all the 
the early Hebrews, early Christians, they got that halo around them. That meant they went to the temples in ancient Kemet. It had nothing to do with those theological stuff. No, it meant that they studied in Kemet at the sacred temples, and they were sons and daughters of the sun. Take that mysticism out of it. Okay. Sons and daughters of the sun. So the, the ruler recognized that one of his names is he was the son of the sun. His other name is Nasut Bitti. Remember we talked about the cobra and the vulture, Nekabet and Wajet? Well, Nasut, the south, Bitti, the north. The north is where the grapes and the wine and all of that was. So that's where the bee was. Want to make a tap, of course, transatlantic production. Give him a round of applause. He, he, gives the, he, gives the, he, the, he got the world's largest, largest archives in all of our history. Give him a round of applause. He can come for him. Come on, clap for transatlantic tap. Give him a clap, give him a clap, give him a clap, give him a clap. That's right, give him a clap. That's right, don't play, don't play. Give the brother a clap. Show him some love. I want everybody to stand up for my brother, man. Stand up for one of the elders in our community that's been doing it well. Give a round of applause to Ed Felicia. Give a round of applause. Ian Hotel, Uncle Jason Evnet, Do Arlington. Peace and harmony to everyone. Everyone came here to get their mind expanded. Everybody came here because we're all on a mission. We're at a time period where the whole earth is changing. Atmosphere is changing. Your consciousness is changing. If you're not ready to change, you're ready to die. And then you're going to change anyway. So you just want to change in a positive light. Be controlled and control of your change. One of the things we try to tell everybody is you need to be captain of your own ship. Don't be in the baggage room down on the third floor underneath your ship and have no idea where it's going. Have no idea where it's going to dock. Have no idea of who's on your ship. You got to come upstairs and take the helm. That means you got to take control of your consciousness. And you take control of your consciousness by directing how you flow the life-giving air. The air. Shoot. Boundless space. You are made of the same thing that the stars are made of. Everything has a purpose. Do you understand your purpose? What is your mission? We studied the comedic legacy so that we understand the black print that was laid down to us by our sacred ancestors on how to live in a state of divinity. You heard it state before that we are divine beings, divine spiritual beings, having a divine human experience. Most of us leave the word divine out. Because you don't think that you are a divine being. You don't think that you're godlike. You don't think that you are made of the special entity here on a mission for change. Once you understand how dynamic you are, see most of us are not afraid of what we don't know. We're afraid of how much power we possess. And then there's a responsibility to that, and we don't want that responsibility of being this omnipowerful spiritual entity that has the ability to inflict change through their presence. And that's what you do. Anything that you get involved with, you have the ability to inflict total change. You do it in sports. Now, if you could just do it in sports, that's why they don't want you in the corporate arena, because you do it there. They don't want you next to the computers because you do it there. You make some programs that they can't even comprehend. They don't want you to do in a computer programming room what you've done on the basketball court. They don't want you to be able to do in the corporate lodge what you do on the track field. I want you to go and check every running record is held by an African in the Olympics. Every running record from the marathon, from 26 miles, to steeplechase, to the 100 meters, to the mile, to the every world record is held by an African. Now that should tell you something. Everybody knows who you are except for you. There is 
not a spiritual book from any ethnic area around the globe where they haven't gotten their information from your ancestors. In fact, when you think of spirituality, you have to think of an African melanated human being. You are the essence of what a quintessential human is. And so, one of the things that we want to talk about here, I want to give just a little teaching lesson here because we have to take control of our own definition. Last night we had what they call a martial art demonstration. I want to change that. I want you to stop as Africans, as melanated beings, I want you to stop using the word martial. Martial is a Greek god of war that's responsible for destruction. And he's partnered with another clown called Mentor, which means kill anybody in order to get where you need to go. So you kill your father so that you can become queen. Daughters kill their mother so they can have their father. That was the Greek best Mentor and Martial. Before the Greeks came on the planet, we had control of what we call the combat arts. And they were dedicated to a figure depicted as a giant falcon. And he was called Menchu. And some people say, and, and in Coptic, it's Mantu. And so it is the Mantu system is what we practice, not martial arts. It's Mantu. Or, or Minchu. If anybody remember the name of Minchu Hotel? Minchu Hotel is the founder of the Second Golden Age, so called 11th Dynasty. He was a Magi warrior of the Minchu arts. So is Narmer, the first Mesupiti of the reunification of Kevin, was a Magi warrior. Aha! was a Magi warrior. They don't, even European Egyptologists don't tell you that. If you look up Magi, they will mention that these were elite warriors from Kush. And then that's about all you get. There wouldn't have been no second golden age if it had not been for the Magi. The Magi issued in the third golden age that you call the 17th and 18th dynasty. They're extremely important. And so, again, I'm giving you a word. It's the Mantu system. That's what we, as Africans, practice. Because the Mantu system is based upon Ma'at. You go to war for Ma'at. You don't go to war to take somebody's land. You don't go to war to take people's property. You go to war to protect Ma'at. Truth, justice, righteous, harmonious balance, reciprocity. That's why we learn the combat arts of war to protect our personal self, our, the divine temple that you possess, the divine temple which your family is housed in, the divine temple of your community, the divine temple of your nation. That's why you learn the Manchu or Manchu arts. And so again, I want to just do this reversal so that we are putting things in its proper perspective. We are not martial arts anymore. We are Manchu. We practice a Manchu system of Ma'at, of the combat of arts of protection. And so hopefully this will resonate. I know sometimes you get, it takes a little time for it to vibrate. But we're here to think. Intelligent. There is nothing we can't do. Think of them, think of them, think of them, think of them. What we can do as a people is unlimited if you think that way. A poem is the naked advice of the heart. Malcolm was a poem, Tucson was a poem, Zinga was a poem, Garvey was a poem, and each one of you are poems. If only you would think intelligent, there is nothing you can't do. Think of them, think of them, think of them, think of them. What we can do as a people is unlimited if you think that way. Manchu, Manchu Hotel was a poem. You see, we are scuffling against logic, trying to use logic, but logic does not exist. Trying to survive in a money world with money is irrelevant. The most powerful economic resources that you possess is your consciousness. Rise with your consciousness like a room. And there's nothing you can't do. My brother said you don't need a job being just over broke. You need to rise your consciousness. That's your job. Brothers and sisters, even Stevie Wonder can see that all the sages and the prophets were trying to tell us was to think. Intelligent. 
There is nothing we can't do. Think unlimited, think unlimited, think unlimited. And that's why we are here to raise our level of consciousness. Now, brothers and sisters, health is almost a bad word in the black community. We used to be the most long-lived of people. All the legends are of these melanin-dominated people who live for hundreds of years. And now the black man in America in an urban city has the shortest lifespan of anybody on the planet Earth. And they shrink too. <sighs> Excuse me if I gather myself together. Do you hear what I'm saying? The people who are the giants of the universe now have the shortest lifespan. And we are killing ourselves because we have incorporated somebody else's lifestyle. We've incorporated somebody else's mind, state of thinking. The enemy exists in here. This is why meditation, breathing postures, the yoga, and all these in the, in the mantra system is so important because it allows you to get the enemy out of your mind. And it's one of the only things that can. Religion can. Almost all religions on the planet were developed by your enemy to control your thought, to keep you in a box. Spirituality allows you to come out of the box. Spirituality says even the earth is not just your domain. That you come from beyond this. That the cosmos is yours. When they look at your DNA and they only understand 3% and the other 97% they call junk DNA because they don't know is because you have the keys of the cosmos locked in your DNA. And right now, one of the latest research is being done in Europe that they've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that more than 65% of all Europeans, their DNA is not necessarily linked to us but to Neanderthal. <laughs> That's the latest thing. I've been saying this for over 30 years. Yeah. But now they got proof because they never could have break down the bones of the Neanderthal man. But now they've been able to do it with the sophisticated uh, uh, machinery they have. And that most Europeans are the descendants of Neanderthal, not the Black Eve that they try to show you. Right. Which means that they're not even trying, my app is not even in their program. But I know y'all want to think everybody's light and the same. So I'll let you continue your insanity. <laughs> but it's my job just to put it out to you. This is what they're telling you. That no, we are not you. And we are, just think y'all, if the sun is the source of light and energy on the planet and you're allergic to the sun, there's a problem here. <laughs> I got crystals on my table, and all those crystals were formulated through the energy and the synthesis of the sun. There are no more powerful energies than that. Gold, silver, all of them are formulated through the energy of the sun. So now if you got somebody or some creatures that's allergic to the sun, that's hiding from the sun, and you want to be like them, I rest my case. <laughs> The breath I talked about last night, brothers and sisters, if we put three things on a scale that you absolutely need, and that is food, fuel, life, in order to sustain the body. You can go 90 days without food, and the body can still sustain itself if you're in good shape. You need water. The body can go 30 days without water if you're in good shape, but you can sustain yourself. Air. I guarantee that you probably can't go three minutes without it. So if I put good food, good water, and air, and I say, which one do you need to take care of first? What are you gonna say? Did I hear somebody say fried chicken? Uh, so we're clear about that. Air. So if air is so important, why does 97% of the people don't know how to breathe? Because you have been enslaved by your ignorance. What does the scripture say? People perish from a lack of what? 
We are divine spiritual beings. We have to embrace Shu, the breath, the energy. It is important that we understand the breath. The breath is the seat of how you will utilize your consciousness. And you are your consciousness, not your body. Your body is just a temple. You are your consciousness. So you have to know how to use that consciousness. And so the capture was e Egyptian yoga, and I think we only put that down because if I had said my Akuma Ankh, probably about three of y'all would have showed up. My Akuma Ankh is where yoga comes from. What does yoga mean? Somebody. Yoga, to center yourself. To become one with yourself, to develop a synergy with yourself. Like most of us are hooked on the Sanskrit of the chakras, which is circle. You need to be able to use your language, Madhu uh, Those people who know me know I'm a component of learning Madhu That is our classical language. Obviously, if the Madhu is more than 10,000 years before the first Greek came on the scene, that Greek and Latin can't be our classical language. Classical, everybody got a classical language. Classical language is where the best of your culture is recorded. So obviously the best of our culture was recorded before there was even Greeks who sat at our feet. Right, so Madhu Neche. And the reason why they don't want you to learn this is because all the keys to the cosmos and specifically to this planet Earth as we observe astrology and astronomy. Okay. It's locked in the Madhu nature. The symbolism that is there. The symbolism there is this on four levels. When I teach the Ma'at Akuba Ankh, the internal system, we use two languages. If you come to a class, everything is done in Kiswahili or Madhu nature. Anything that is done to the right side, is our communication side, is done in Kiswahili. Anything that's done on the left side, which is the heart side, which is the spiritual side, is done in Madhu nature. So even when you're counting, when you're doing a, a drill, it's mojo, mbili, tattoo. When you move to the left side, it's wa, sunu, shemut, fudu, diu. You're learning to use your right and left brain the way our ancestors began to do it. We didn't have such thing as right-handed versus left-handed people. Everybody had to have a balance and a harmony. You couldn't be a priest unless you wrote with the right hand, then you wrote with the left hand. On this side of the wall, you wrote left to right. On this side of the wall, you wrote right to left. You didn't have a right-handed team and a left-handed team. All the priests had to know how to do it. When I teach my people, even the alphabet, you write the letters going this way, and then you turn around and you write the letters going the opposite direction. So you're developing right and left brain at the same time. Your breathing has to be the same thing. Every exercise you do on one side, you gotta have harmony as you come back and do it on the other side. Every exercise. You're learning to harness the breath. Ooh. One of our initiates, let me just show you how powerful the breath is. In order to be a grandmaster in our system, one of the, I'll give you two, three tests that we have to do that most people wouldn't even fancy. Number one, you had to swim across the Nile at Aswan. Control of your breath and body control. In the current, you get sucked under into your chest. And don't get retested. <laughs> Number two, you have to walk 25 meters on hot coals. And you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Fail tests. Number three, you sleep in a coffin. And the lid is closed. And you're there for eight hours, and it's approximately five hours worth of air in it. So if you have not learned to control your breathing, that's all, folks. You do not get retested. The coffin is yours. Now, I need to say this. You don't get, you don't get this test unless they think you can pass it. You know, it's not like, yo, you know, I've been studying in New York, you know, and uh, I'm ready to take this test. <laughs> all right. Control of the mind. It's a very serious thing, y'all. This hasn't changed over 10,000 years since the reunification of ancient Kemet. I need to talk about, there was a golden age before the Great Flood. After the Great Flood, 
most of the population on the planet was destroyed. You had pockets here and there in the highlands. The people who carried the knowledge on the African continent held it there. Because now, we have a small group that survived. They had to condition a group who was prepared to take this knowledge to the next level. There was no Madunetra on the ancient temples in the last golden age before the reunification. Because they were all doing Ma'ad Akuba Amr. They were all in touch as a Hati rule, a test tube, the magical mushroom. They were all in touch with the various herbs so that almost everybody in the society was operating on this what? High vibration level. They understood they were spiritual beings, divine, having a human experience. If they wanted to teach this lesson today, we would all just sit around and meditate for about five minutes and go home. And there would no, be no words spoken and we would all have the lesson. Or all I would have to do was to come and to touch you. And our communication would be delivered. Some of the only groups that can do this today, there's still some people in the Congo. There's still some people in uh, Australia, among the Aborigines who haven't been contaminated by the Western world, who can still do it. Just through meditation. You would be out hunting, and your mate would say, bring home some potatoes too. And when you came home, you had the potatoes. And there was no cell phone involved. The cell phone is only imitating what you have the ability to do naturally. And we created the cell phone, but anyhow, we won't go there. People, we have to go back and gather our strength, our power. It is through the breath. Now, after the Great Flood, these priests didn't want this to happen again. And so they took the language of nature and created it and put it on the walls. So that when the next, next catastrophe happens, it is going to happen. Right now, us walking around with our pants and looking like our enemy is a catastrophe. You just don't know it. It's a catastrophe that equals the last flood. You just don't know it. Because you're walking, you're the walking murder. Not the walking dead, the walking murder. Okay. But once you tap into your breath and you begin to understand, you begin to see things from the way they really are. And so the key here, again, they wrote on the walls in the Madhu Nature so that the legacy of eons of information would still be left for you. You heard the expression, the writing is on the wall? Yeah. It's still on the wall, waiting for you. You're not going to get it by reading Arabic. You're not going to get it by reading even Swahili or any of those other African languages. And I want you to continue to learn them. But that's not the root. You have to learn the Madhu Nature. Because those are the symbols of nature. If you learn Swahili and Arabic, beautiful languages, you just be crazy in Swahili and crazy in Arabic. It won't ever, it won't evolve your consciousness. The Madhu Nature will take your consciousness to a different level. Before I go into the postures, let me show you. Some of us are afraid of this symbol. We don't even want it in our house. But well, I need to tell you, you need it right at the door. This is Set. Some people call it Setesh. This is where later Typhon came from, and later they developed the devil from the system. Uh, in ancient Kemet, Set sits at the helm of the boat of Ra, and he slays Ra's enemies every day. And in the scriptures it says, I am the only one who can do that. Set represents your Muntu spiritual system inside of every human being. You call it an immune system. Your immune system don't take notes. Your immune system, when an enemy comes in, don't sing, we shall overcome. <laughs> your immune system don't debate, is this a good germ or a bad germ? That looked like the germ that destroyed grandma. You think we should let it in? No! 
sick takes care of business. It's no debate. And you're afraid of set. Only your enemy would have you afraid of set. So that they can come in and take over your mind. And your immune system invites them in. Are we all made of light? Yes. Set. A very powerful energy. And it is part, it was sent here, because this is divine energy, to help you live your life. Without set, you can't live. Without your immune system, you wouldn't even make it home from here tonight. And you're afraid of set. Set needs to be right on your altar. Now what you need to do is have a relationship with set. So that when your enemies come and you can't even recognize them, set knows who it is, because set can feel it. It has nothing to do with what somebody looks like. It's about their energy. And so Seth needs to be one of your best friends. We know from the legacy that Seth fights Haru. Now let me just explain. We know this is Haru from the double crown on top. But Manchu or Muntu is also the great falcon. If you looked at the Waset, the ancient city of Waset, where I think Luxor and Thebes is today. That was called Waset, the patron war balancer that kept Ma'at there was Muntu, or Muntu, the great falcon. And later Haru just replaced that energy, that's all. Put the double crown on for the unification. And people say, well, come on, that was with the bird. Those people who study nature, the falcon, or the eagle, depends on what domain have no rivalry in the sky. No bird can challenge them. They're the only bird that has an extra eye that can look directly into Ra, into the sun. They, can, they have the keenest eyesight of any creature on the planet. They can spot a mouse under a leaf hovering a mile in the sky. That's all right, brother. I felt that. While hovering a quarter of a mile in the sky can spot the fish in the water. He's traveling this way, the fish is traveling this way. He dives down, calculates the speed of light, the current of the water, and is 99.9% .9 accurate, and he'll go up to 20 meters under the water and come up with a fish in his tie lines. Bombers and jet pilots practice following Haru, the Falcon. The word hero comes from Haru. So now if you knew anything about nature, and somebody said, man, I'll be on you like a mighty falcon. They'd be like, oh, you know. You know you can't even hide. All right? So this is, the Madunetra is full of symbols like this. So that you understand, it's about nature. It's putting you in contact with nature. The word nature, principle, divinity, order, law, is all around you, and we're ignorant of it. And remember, people, what? They perish for lack of what? Knowledge. And now, brothers and sisters, the reason why I brought Set and Haru up here, see, it's not even about just having the knowledge. Because all y'all, y'all got the DVDs, y'all got the books, y'all come to the lectures, but is it raising your level of consciousness? Are you taking this to heart? You, are you turning this knowledge into wisdom? The use, the proper use of knowledge. And the key to that is the breath. I wanted to be able to give people a few exercises today. And remember this name. Ma'at Akuba Ankh. Let me hear you say, Ma'at Aku. Ba Anka. Ma'at is a harmonious balance. Aku is spirit, it's divine spirit. Ka is the spiritual soul. Ba is the soul. And that's for alignment. The alignment of your spirit and your soul for life. I think that's a little deeper than just yoga. Alright, are y'all with me? 
I don't want to stop you from doing yoga. That's the start. And I need to say this, the cultural context of which you are trying to elevate yourself is as important as the material. Mm. Yeah. So if you're using somebody else's cultural paradigm to elevate your black, it's not going to happen. And I have to admit, doing something is better than nothing. But the reason why the Chinese push their culture when I was a national champion, I won this uh, national championship, and I got a free trip to China, and I had this 19-year-old carry me around the different provinces. At 19-year-old, he was a master. He had his red sash in the front, and even the elders kneeled down when he came. Not because he could beat everybody up. In fact, I spanked him every day, but that wasn't it. It was because he was a keeper of their culture. Now you put on your kung fu outfit and walk through the projects and see what happens. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Put on your Japanese gi and walk through the projects. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, all right. <laughs> a keeper of your culture. And so, yes, the art is good, but is it housed in their culture? When they're doing their thing, they're promoting their culture. So when I'm there, I'm at the, Shaolin, the famous Shaolin Temple, and I'm looking, and I said, listen, wait a minute. Like, at least one third of these people are all black. They're African. And I says, yes, we don't, we don't deny this. I said, we don't see that in no Kung Fu movies. Well, that's your job. That's what they told me. That's your job. Our job is to promote the Chinese culture. Y'all right, understand it? Okay, so don't get mad at them. You need to be able to step up to the bar. You know? And let's give it to Dr. Shaka Zulu, because that's what he was trying to do the other night. He was trying to step it up to the bar. But we have to be in control of our, of our art. So listen, people. First exercise, very simple. I'm only going to give you three. And then I'm just demonstrate just a small form. The first one, my students will know. We call it Olam Wingo. Yeah, I see my students there getting their hands up. You're sitting like you're sitting in a high chair. You don't need to be all the way down here like they show you in the temple. You need to be about right there. So like, like you're sitting in a chair, somebody moved the chair. Back is straight. Arms are up like you're holding the world. Circular. Not stiff and not limp. Your hand has mine. Elbows up. The elbows cannot go below the heart. The whole time. Now, you take one spot. And this is a meditation. This is called standing meditation. Meditation is done lying, sitting, and standing. Meditation can also be done in flotation, in water. All those are, are excellent forms of more, uh, where more, uh, meditation can take place. This is standing because I'm a component of the Muntu arts. And this will strengthen the entire body. You start out at five minutes. So let me have some brave souls who want to come up and do five minutes with me. Come on up. <coughs> I got one, come on. Come on. <coughs> come on out. <coughs> Stand next to me. We'll get into your posture. Come on. <laughs> Bend those knees. Y'all check, check them out. Make sure they're down low as I am. Toes straight ahead. Now. Sometimes this is the hardest part. I want you to pick a spot in the wall straight ahead. And I want you to only look at that spot. You don't look up, down, left, right. You don't wipe sweat off your face. You don't fix your pants. You don't fix your makeup. You don't tighten up your hair. <clears throat> you only look at that one spot. That means you're developing focus, discipline, endurance, 
and you are becoming captain of your own ship. Now, I'm going to add the third component is that it's breathing with it. Close your mouth, roll your tongue to the bridge of your mouth. Inhale through the nose and exhale through the nose, not out your mouth. I know some of y'all took the Asian arts and y'all want to breathe in through the nose and blow out through the mouth. No. If you were in the desert and you did that, you would perish. You would dehydrate yourself. So your tongue is rolled on the bridge of your mouth to recirculate the slava and the moisture. So you inhale through the nose, stomach expands, exhale through the nose. Stomach retracts using your diaphragm. I believe we must have about two minutes. We got three minutes to go. Somebody give me a time. So give me, make it three and a half minutes. We got warriors up here. You're looking at that spot. All beginner students start here. At five minutes, to tell me who you are. If you start feeling it in your back, that means your stomach is weak. Start spilling, spilling, your shoulders getting heavy, you gotta build up the shoulders. Your arms start feeling like lead pipes, you gotta build up the arms. Your legs start wobbling, you gotta get out and do some road work. <laughs> One spot, this stops the chatter. If you're looking at the one spot, you can't be thinking about what you're doing for dinner. You can't be thinking about this hot date tomorrow. All your focus is one spot. This will help you accomplish anything that you want to do in life. Now we got three minutes down, two to go, y'all. Everybody get down just a little lower. This, like I said, this strengthens the entire body. If you can't do no other exercise, you do this for five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, you will sleep well. And your body will love you. At 65, at 75, at 85. My brothers and sisters, I'm a, they call me a baby elder, and I'm in my mid 60s. <coughs> One more minute. Another minute, y'all, just low, keep your spot. Looking straight ahead. <coughs> a beginning student who has done his exercises well, at the end of at least three months, should be able to hold this for 10 minutes. Intermediate student, 15 minutes. Advanced students, 20 to 25 minutes. You cannot be an instructor in the comedic AHA system unless you can do this for at least one half an hour. If you can do it for a half an hour and still be as fresh as I am right now, that means you can hold it for an hour or two hours. I, I never went past three because I had other stuff to do, <coughs> not because I got tired. <laughs> that's your discipline, that's your focus. So I know some of y'all want to just run to the gym and give them your money. You can do this at home in the closet and keep your money. says time up, I don't want y'all to just stop. I want y'all to make a ball with your hand. So when he says time, just listen to my instructions. Time. All right, now take your hands and form a ball. Don't, don't touch. Right. Circular, turn the ball around three times. Breathe still. You should feel some energy in the center of your hands. That energy is the same energy that can stop a person's heart or it can heal a person. Now take one hand, take your hands and wash your face with that energy. Don't touch it. You should feel the heat coming from your hand. Take your right hand and put it over your head, circular. Take your left hand and go the opposite direction. 
Ah, now reverse it. Take that energy now, bring it down, and put it in your navel. Touch. Push it down your thighs and straighten your legs up. Now retract. Get back in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's How'd you feel, Bubba? Yeah, yeah, All right, thank you. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. So, if you only got time for one thing, one art to help practice your breathing and get your whole body in shape, now you can see the sweat is coming down from my face. This is not from doing a whole. Yeah! It's not from all this. You know, because we could do that. That's not a problem, but that one drill harnesses your breath, puts you in control of your body. I had Tiger Joe Spooner, was one of my students, three-time Mr. America, Mr. Olympia. He can do curls for 300 pounds. He couldn't hold that posture for five minutes. After three minutes, he... <laughs> he was a student of mine for six months, after that, he can touch his palms to the floor. He went on and took two more titles, and he can hold that position for a half an hour. Six months training. That was all. The next one I want to do, that was a stationary. Now, if someone is in a wheelchair, they can sit down and do that. Okay, they, at least they can build the upper part of their body, get in, get in control. Because what's important is to focus, y'all. The commercials have three and five second sound bites. Why do you think? Because that's the average person's concentration. Three to five seconds, that's, a, that's sad. <laughs> you know, so this is to go beyond that. In fact, after this, you don't want to watch television no more. The color of your box should be black, like you. Okay. Y'all, some of y'all get that in the morning. Okay. Uh, <laughs> simple exercise. I'm going to show you how simple this is. This is uh, uh, along the Nile, the wave that pulsates along the shore. Uh, the priest would practice this pulsation because that was like the rhythm of the heart, right? So they would stand in various postures. I, this just happens to be a cross of a, a, a bow stance, right? But they would just practice this. And the idea was to be like a wave. And you would just, but your breath had to be with this. Inhale, exhale. So when I exhale, that's out. Because that would represent the strike. My opponent comes in. <gasps> okay, so, so every time my hand goes out, that's the exhale. The inhale. I'm waving, I'm, I'm, I'm moving. So I would do that for three or four minutes on this side, come back and do the same thing on that side. So in, out, up, down. Y'all seen this other one on uh, the Karate Kid or whatever? Oh yeah. Wax on, wax off. Okay, before the Chinese was born, we were doing this. Okay. In fact, half of the Shaolin, remember the Shaolin, Shaolin, wait, let me take this. You have the Muntu arts travel after it left the Nile Valley into Southern Asia. Yeah. So you have the oldest arts in Asia in places like India, Burma, Thailand. The Panjad Salat. Right, Salat, all those, yes. So you have it there before it's in China or Japan. Then you move along, you got the Muay Thai boxes and all that. That's just like straight out of the Congo. They're doing. They're going into dance, they have their spiritual thing. You would think you're in Africa. Okay, and they will tell you quick that they're Manchu, that they, you know, they are practicing an African-based art. Okay, then you have to understand when Buddha Hama traveled across the Himalayas into China, he was a 26 disciple. 20 disciples from Kush. And that's why they call it the Indus Kush Valley, coming out of the Kushite Valley with the Magi and stuff, oh, oh, okay, so, so, and he introduced this science to the Chinese. 
the Japanese is still hadn't even gotten to the seven islands of Japan yet. That, that, remember, that's only less than 2,000 years old. And the original people there are the Anu people, who are black people. Then the Chinese to the Koreans, then the Koreans then to the Japanese. And that's just yesterday. Just yesterday. So I need y'all to be really clear when we put things in a timeline. That's why I like to show people like when you're doing this. So when I'm doing this exercise and I say, oh, that looks like Kung Fu. No, Kung Fu looks like this. <laughs> they, all right, y'all understand? You know, uh, my brother broke down the first Shogun of Japan as a black man from Kunch. In fact, Kimmy, you can't be a, a samurai warrior unless you got black blood. And if you don't have any, you got to prick hands like the, the whole thing went up somebody who is black in order to be a samurai. Okay, so I want to get just one more exercise here. Okay, so we got, we got Olin Wingo, you got Hapi. This is the flowing water of Hapi. In, out, pulsing it of Thai to, to both sides, okay? And next we're just going to do uh, what we just call a step. Uh, this particular one is, is simply done. It's like called holding the ball. So this is really for your focus, holding the ball. So you have your ball, you circular. The ball can be rolled. And you're, what you're doing is just getting in tune with the body, the flow. Don't squash your ball up. I see people, I say, come on, you got a frisk? You want a ball? <laughs> so your cognitive of space and time and energy, you know, and you're utilizing this ball now. So you're utilizing, you learn how to use this energy. And if you want to do it in terms of isometric, then you can push the hands together. And remember, everything you do on one side, there's the dexterity. The brother last night did a demonstration almost using isometric with his exercise bar, where you can do this same type of isometrics with no tools, no instruments. Just your own pressure, push it up against the wall, push it up to your hand. Remember y'all, you could be a grand master with no other tools other than yourself. You are an instrument. And when you're dealing with weaponry, it's not necessarily the sword, the knife. Your weapon is your mind. And when you think of weaponry, think of your environment. People leave that out. The wall, the desk, the chair, everything is a weapon to be used against your opponent. A blade of grass, everything is a weapon. So, you know, and anybody that's teaching you a weapon will tell you the first thing is that whatever your weapon is, it's an extension of your what, warriors? Your body, that's all. So after you learn how to breathe and use your body, after you know that you're in total control of your body, then a weapon is only an extension. It's only an extension. Only an extension. Now, last but not least, I'm going to do a small little form, and then I just want to end up talking about the breath and connection of the animal systems. Almost every animal that exists on the planet is part of you. And that's why when you look in the womb, you go through the fish stage, the amphibious stage, the mammal stage, all of that. So you have all those weapons in your, all those weapons of the various animals in your consciousness. In your consciousness. Something that you can do early in the morning, and if, I don't care if you ate, to aid. Simple exercise. And remember what I said. I know some of us take Tai Chi and I say that beats a blank. Continue to take it if you have no, if you don't have access to your own because we taught them that anyway. Okay. 
The only thing about it is they're utilizing their culture. So let me say this. No matter how good you get at it, you're promoting their culture. And they benefit from it as collectively and collectively we don't. <coughs> I hope that hit home with some people. Utilize what's, what you got available until you can get to your own. Once you can get to your own, that's where you need to be. Because if you don't perpetuate yourself, who will? That's right. Who will? So, 
Uh, the beginner looks, I kind of did last night. It's kind of like. This, some people say, come on, Infodici, what's this here? <laughs> Can I just get a demonstration? Can somebody just come up? Demonstrate. So, you know, you know, we got these little cute hand motions, and people are like, please, brother, I've been taking Japanese Kung Fu karate, we break boards. What's this? It look like some butterfly stuff. All this is, is coordination of the body. So, if my opponent throws like a punch towards me. That's a snap arm, okay? But in slow motion, all I did was, he throws the other hand. Look, his wrists, I'm out. <laughs> just, so if you do that a hundred times, so if the person just really snaps, or they got come get a tip of their contact, they're coming to him. You, he's there. That means he's. So within the snap, his wrist is broke. His, his ankle is broke. His kneecap is broke. But I just wanted to show you. All I did was just a little simple move to there. So when you're doing the drill, it's mind over matter. It's mind connected to matter. So it's not an abstract move, even though it looks really simple. And remember, all strikes are to pressure points and joints. As his, as his, his punch is coming, all strikes, he's striking towards my face. So as I grab his wrist, that's a joint. Snap! That arm is no longer any good for him. Now his shoulder is no longer any good. I can feel his Now his shoulder. throat is no longer any good. <laughs> and all it was, that's what I practice. Now, unfortunately, some of us, we, I can tell when a person is utilizing the Chinese Kung Fu group. When they're doing the... No, I, I if they got this silly grin on their face while they're doing Tai Chi, I know that the master did not teach them <laughs> what that means. Because you shouldn't have that silly grin on your face when you're doing these motions. And Dragon Whip's tail. We got to be able to relate this to our culture. Okay, so I just want to show you. But like I said, if you only have access to that, <laughs> 